And then you would not have to take an examination at the end. So this would be convenient for you and not only for me. It goes without saying that the paper by itself would not be sufficient. Attendance here and preferably participation in class discussion would also be considered in grading. If this is acceptable to you, I would say that there should be two students who would hand in a paper next time, say of roughly seven typewritten double-spaced pages, on the first book of the ethics. Is there anyone among you who is willing to take that jump? I see here some of my students from Chicago, I don't know from there, my practice, and they endured it and lived happily ever after. So prove that this is feasible. But they are not registered here, and therefore I cannot punish them by imposing this. What about two grandmothers? You? What's your name? Odelina. Will you write a paper on the first book of the ethics and hand it in next Monday? Thank you. That's very good. And who else? What about Mr. Weathergreen, who, who is one of the few students I know? Oh, yes. What about you? Very good. So now let us turn to more pleasant, to greener pastures. Now, I sketched to you last time two broad, comprehensive considerations, which we must never lose sight of when engaging in a rather detailed study of at least some sections of Aristotle's ethics. Such considerations are needed to counteract a danger that is perhaps particularly great in our age of ever-increasing specialization, namely the danger being that we exclude from sight from consideration, very important matters, in the vain hope that George will take care of them. George being another specialist, maybe a sociologist, psychologist, analytical philosopher, or what have you. The classic formulation for this passing of the buck was coined about 150 years ago by Comte, Auguste Comte, one of the greatest heirs and in some way the classic interpreter of modern science, namely of that science which is definitely non-philosophic. You remember what I said last time about the philosophic character of science in the old scheme and the separation of philosophy of science which has taking place in modern times. Now, he called his position positive philosophy, philosophy positive. And in other words, it was still philosophy. No question about that. But the peculiarity was it is positive. And therefore, the, since that time, the word positivism has become common general use. And the main thesis is this, that the way towards the truth is that of modern science. Modern science is an approach to all theoretical and practical questions. It was preceded by radically different approaches. The first was the theological one, where all things were traced to so-called personal powers or personal power. And the second stage that he called metaphysical, and that is represented, say, by Plato and Aristotle in classical antiquity and by the great system builders of the 17th century modern times. Now, both approaches, the theological and metaphysical, are bankrupt. And the only one which is theoretically feasible and at the same time offers some hope for human practice is a positive approach, approach peculiar to modern science. Now, what is the peculiarity of science in context of positive science, in 
got a distinction to theology and metaphysics. The chief answer is this. Theology and metaphysics try to answer the question of why. This question is abandoned by science in favor of the question of the how. Why do bodies fall? What is the secret of gravitation, the mysterious force? This is theological or metaphysical, according to Kant. Whereas the question, with what speed do bodies fall, the how of falling, that is a scientific and reasonable question. Now, there is this difficulty here. It may be true that men cannot answer the questions of the why, and therefore one acts prudently by limiting oneself to the question of the how, yet the questions of the why remain. They are not meaningless questions. They are only perhaps unanswerable questions. They continue to bother man, despite or because of all progresses of science. So much so that the, even an infinite progress of science in the future we offers no hope of ever giving us an answer to the question of the why, of ever solving the enigmas with which man is confronted. We have no right to assume, in addition, that man has infinite time at his disposal for progressing even granting that in infinite, in infinite progress all riddles would be solved, we don't know whether there will be an infinite time at our disposal. And not only because of the atomic bomb, but also because of a certain perhaps built-in limitation of the duration of human life on Earth. Hence, the unsolved and insoluble questions of the why threaten the whole edifice of science they deprive it of its ultimate importance. For example, if science can teach us a lot regarding means or any ends that we might choose, but cannot tell us what ends to choose, and on this, the ends, everything depends, and therefore the dignity of the science is gravely threatened by the fact that it cannot answer the question of the why. And this has led to a popularly known phenomenon in which was called by a sociologist the flight from scientific reason. And I think the author meant by it that people were fundamentally dissatisfied because their deepest and most serious questions were beyond the ken of science. It is a question which I am in no position to answer, but which has often been raised. How far this fact is essential limitation of science and the dissatisfaction with what science can do contributes to the unrest on some campuses. So we try to counteract the narrowness of specialization by engaging in broad and comprehensive consideration. And we do this for good or evident reasons. However poor our achievement may be, our pursuit in itself is sensible. I believe I have shown that it is sensible. In doing so, I have shown that there is a rational end, clarity about the fundamental issue. A rational end, a rational ought, for we cannot help, if we understand something as evidently necessary, to do it unless we are prevented from doing so by some uh, an accidental fact. It is impossible to say whether my theoretical reflection of last time and my moralizing, my exhortation, my preaching begins, where the one stops and the other begins. They are inseparable, where I made the inevitable, but the allegedly vicious transition 
from factual questions to wider questions. To that extent, I hope I helped you somewhat to understand Aristotle's ethics, and to look at things from Aristotle's point of view, from a point of view which does not permit the fact-value distinction as it is now accepted. I would like to make a remark in passing. The fact-value distinction must not be taken too seriously or literally. It cannot be maintained in any long run, in any broad and not merely technical or academic consideration. For instance, I read in yesterday's Los Angeles Times the following sentence. We have failed to understand the implications of the new vision of man, which is accepted by an ever-growing number of social scientists, that so soon as sufficient food, clothing, and shelter are available, man is forced by profound psychological pressures to drive toward self-actualization. Individuals who are deprived of the opportunity to strive to achieve their full potential will drift into personal disorientation or drift into violence. Here we see a reference to the new vision of man. And let us assume that the crime to the other that it is new. Man is happy and gentle provided his comfortable self-preservation is guaranteed. That is the new vision. Man is not by nature good, for by nature he does not have the means of comfortable self-preservation, and in particular uh, yeah, self-preservation. But after man has conquered nature, as he has done now, he can make himself happy, and gentle. He uses much more highfalutin expressions, but to, I try to translate them into simple uh, language. It is, of course, presupposed here that to be happy and gentle is good, and to be unhappy and violent is bad. Well, I think we can grant this without uh, being petty and, uh, and accept it. At first glance, at any rate. To be at peace with one's Self, to know what one wants, one can also say, and at peace with one's fellow men seems to be preferable to the alternative. But even on the most superficial level, a difficulty arises. Are food, clothing, and shelter the only ends of man? And does the non-availability of these three items alone make men unhappy and or violent? I think we do not have recourse to our private experiences. If we have read a few novels, we will know that there is a thing called unhappy love and also unhappy marriages, and this has nothing to do with food, clothing, shelter, per se. The practical conclusion, therefore, drawn by quite a few of our contemporaries is that you must have, of course, a solution of the food and shelter problem, either by the utilitarian or in the Marxist spirit, but you must also have a solution to the problem of unhappy law, and that means psychoanalysis. So Marxism or, or utilitarianism and psychoanalysis together have a very great power, open or concealed, in present-day social science. But without any disrespect to hunger and sex, are there no other ends or good things which a true vision of man, in contradistinction to the new vision of man, would have to consider? What about premature violent death, for example. What about death itself? Are this not important considerations? Whatever one may say against Aristotle's ethics, he does not make the mistake of taking such a narrow view 
of the human ends or goods as a new vision of man does. This is another simple consideration why we should pay some attention to Arista. Now, to return to the chief subject of today's lecture, I have asserted last time that we must start from the broadest possible consideration, and I sketched two such considerations. The first I indi indicated by the terms Machiavellianism and, and anti-Machiavellianism, and which I then replaced by the opposition of materialism and idealism. This seems to be the most fundamental alternative, the most comprehensive alternative. An alternative for evil, if not with man, surely with philosophy. An eternal alternative, as we may provisionally say. The second consideration I considered was that of the quarrel between the ancients and the moderns. The fundamental difference between antiquity and modernity, between ancient materialism and modern materialism, and between ancient idealism and modern idealism. This alternative is not eternal, but would have to be called historical, because surely the modern alternative did not, was not available in classical times. It is not easy to say which of these two fundamental alternatives is more fundamental than the other or even whether this question makes sense. Let us then leave this question open. I illustrated the quarrel between the ancients and moderns by contrasting the Aristotelian division of philosophy and the one that prevails now. I suggested that the difference between modern and ancient philosophy has something to do with the difference between the attempt at human mastery of the whole and the denial of the possibility of, or desirability of such mastery. Accordingly, the ancient thinkers held that the good life is a life according to nature. Nature, as it were, establishes the norm, the end for our life. The end is, does not have its root in, you, in man's establishing or setting. In contradistinctions, the depreciation of nature in modern times, the strive for liberation from nature's apron strength, and thus the Kantian formula, and thus to make man sovereign, replacing nature by reason and eventually by history. Now I will fill up my sketch by speaking more particularly on the quarrel between ancient and moderns within political philosophy or political science. For I say or political philosophy or political science because that was in pre-modern times, political philosophy and political science were the same thing. Now we have the separation. And it is for us, it should at least be for us a question, which of the two alternatives is sound, the identification or the separation. I have to say, therefore, a few words about the general character of classical political thought. If we contrast, say, Plato or Aristotle, with what is going what is being done in political science now. What strikes us most, I think, is that in ancient times political science, political philosophy, had a direct relation to political life, which does no longer exist. The questions which political philosophy or political science raised were the same as those raised in the political arena. And that shows itself in the fact that in Plato's and Aristotle's political science or political philosophy, there is hardly any term which did not stem from the political arena, but was hatched in academies. The political philosopher or political scientist looked 
in the same direction as the citizen or statesman. He does not look at political life from without, like the observer of microbes, stars, or what have you. But he takes his stand within it. And this has radically changed in modern times. I think I will draw a picture. So, good. Oh, I could have it here. So, if this is the standpoint of the citizen or statesman, he looks at political things in this perspective. There are two, no, the political philosopher or scientist of ancient times stands also here and looks here. There is an alternative way of looking at it, namely to stand here and to look at it from the outside. Is this clear? Now, the difference between the political philosopher or a political scientist and the citizen or statesman, according to the older view, is merely this, that the political philosopher looks in the same direction but further afield. In other words, this other will go on. It will be continued beyond the point beyond which it was continued by the citizen. And with this is connected is the fact that the political philosopher is supposed to have a function which no one else could fulfill, a very high function. I mean, in the first place, to be the arbiter par excellence. Political life means political conflict, conflict of various groups, the most well-known in ancient and modern times were the rich and the poor. But sensible men do not want conflict, but harmony and peace. And how to establish peace? Answer, you have an impartial arbiter. This happens all the time in political life. But to do this on the highest level, and regarding the, the permanent questions of political life, that would seem to be the function of the arbiter per excellence. And that was meant to be the political philosopher. For the same reason, I cannot now elaborate it with the necessary clarity. For the same reason, the political philosopher was regarded as the teacher of the political men of the highest order. The political men of the highest order is a legislator, not in the sense in which the word is now used, where we have uh, many, many legislators, as you know, but the man who elaborates a code which should last for quite some time, and not a, a thing which could be revised every, every second day. So. Now, the legislator is concerned only with giving the best laws, if he's a, a reasonable man, for his community. But in order he cannot know, truly know, what the best laws for his community are, if he doesn't know what the best laws simply are. And therefore there must be men who raise the question of what the best laws simply are. That is a teacher of literature. More precisely, as Plato and Aristotle teach, and some other their followers have taught, Laws are not the fundamental political phenomenon. What laws are and are not possible in a given society depends on the politeia, as they said, P-O-L-I-T-E-I-A, which I translate by regime. The common translation is constitution. What it means primarily is the factual distribution of power within the society. And therefore the question arises, the ultimate question is not what are the best laws, but what is the best regime. And of this best regime they say that it must be possible. In other words, it, it must be possible without assuming an miraculous or non-miraculous change of human beings. Human beings, as they are by nature, 
rights to it, visions, kind, and so on and so on. No change in the system. But a, such an arrangement that the more desirable people have more to say. This is, according to their view, the best regime. So it must be possible. But it, the possibility has, does not mean that it will be, there is any probability, both Plato and Aristotle say very emphatically, that it is improbable that the best regime will become actual or was ever actual. Neither Plato nor Aristotle found any example of what they regarded as the best regime anywhere at any time. This did not bother the, them at all for the following reason. I use now again a word alien to Plato and Aristotle, but easily intelligible to you. The best regime is an ideal, and not an ideal among many, but the ideal. Now, an ideal does not cease to be an ideal by never being actual. This way of thinking, I think, is very well known to all of you. For you need, at any rate, a standard of judgment of the actor, a standard for the diagnosis of the actor, in what way it is good, in what way it is bad. And therefore, you must have a complete picture of the perfectly good society, of the perfectly good regime, and regardless of whether it's actual. Whether it will be actual or not depends on chance. As Plato puts in the Republic, it depends on coincidence, on the coincidence of philosophy and political power, on philosophy and political power coinciding. Now, this much about the classical approach. We see the origins of the modern approach by turning to Machiavelli, especially the Prince, chapter 15. And now remains to see what should be the ways and conduct of a prince in dealing with his subjects and his friends. And because I know that many have written on this topic, I fear that when I too write, I shall be thought presumptuous because in discussing it, I break away completely from the principles laid down by my predecessors. But since it is my purpose to write something useful to an attentive reader, I think it more effective to go back to the practical truths of the subject than to depend on fancies, imaginations about it. And many have imagined republics and principalities that never have been seen or known to exist in reality. Plato and Aristotle are obvious examples of that. For there is such a difference between the way men live and the way they ought to live that anybody who abandons what is for what ought to be we learn something that will ruin rather than preserve him. Because anyone who determines to act in all circumstances, the part of a good man must come to ruin among so many who are not good. Now this is one of the most important passages ever written. The ancients took their bearings by how men should live, by how men ought to live, and therefore they arrived at imaginary principalities. Incidentally, when he speaks of imagined principalities, he thinks not only of Plato and Aristotle, but of the Bible as well. The kingdom of God would have the same characteristics as the kingdom of the philosophers in, in Plato. So what Machiavelli tries to do is to use, again, a convenient slogan, to make politics a realistic science, to take men as they are. Thus, the chances of actualization of the desirable order increase enormously. If you make these high demands, which Plato and Aristotle made, then no chance 
no practical term. But if you want to put the law of the goal lower, as Machiavelli did, and still it is still a goal, still a kind of ideal, but lower, then the chances of actualization will increase. In other words, by lowering the goal, you enable yourself to conquer chance. And that is precisely what Machiavelli says in the same verse, chapter 25. Chance, fortuna, is a woman who can be forced by the right kind of man. There is, according to the older view, chance is elusive and cannot be conquered by anyone. The ancient philosophers spoke of virtue as the most important consideration. Machiavelli uses the Italian equivalent of virtue, virtue, but gives it a very new meaning. It has nothing to do with moral virtue. It has something to do with, with uh, patriotism or political virtue, uh, but even that is quite dubious. Who can be forced by the right kind of man. There is, according to the older view, chance is elusive and cannot be conquered by anyone. I'll read to you another passage. The ancient philosophers spoke of virtue as the most important consideration. Machiavelli uses the Italian equivalent of virtue, virtue, but gives it a very new meaning has nothing to do with moral virtue. It has something to do with patriotism or political virtue, uh, but even that is quite dubious. Now, I'll read to you another passage in so that we get some better understanding. The true history of political philosophy is not, cannot be written on the basis of explicit quotations alone. One has to do some thinking. If my memory doesn't deceive me, Thomas Hobbes never mentions Machiavelli. He surely never mentions him with any emphasis. And yet, without Machiavelli, no Thomas Hobbes. Now, Hobbes says in the epistle dedicatory to his elements of law, natural and quality, the following thing. To reduce the doctrine of justice in policy to the rules and infallibility of reason, there is no way but first to put such principles down for a foundation as passion, not mistrusting, may not seek to displace. In other words, we have to start from foundations agreeable to passion. Nay, as Hobbes makes clear in, his, in the execution of his work, we have to find the principle of political life in a passion. And that passion he finds in the fear of death. Something very low, but very common, and therefore something trusted. Low but solid. That was a notion guiding such men like Hobbes, but also Locke and Rousseau. Thomas Aquinas, in his discussion of natural law, had made a distinction between three natural inclinations of man. One toward self-preservation, one toward preservation of the species, as shown in particular by generation of offspring, and one toward knowledge, and in particular knowledge of God. What Hobbes does is to erase the two higher inclinations, to abstract from them, and because that would lead to all kinds of complications, and to stick to the lowest but strongest most of the time, namely the fear of death or in other words, the desire for self-preservation. Now, this foundation was taken over, obviously, by Locke and Rousseau, and although with not unimportant modification, but the principle remains the same. Hobbes already, but more explicitly Locke, puts the emphasis on 
compatible surface energy. Meaning, sure, if you have, if you arrive at the stake immediately, you are threatened by a potential killer. Then you are perfectly pleased if you can just preserve yourself. But apart from such harsh situations, you would like to preserve yourself comfortably. To have not only a bed, but a comfortable bed. And to have not only food, but tasty food, and so on. At any rate, in connection with this modern movement, starting in a way from Machiavelli, but more visibly from Hobbes, you have an enormous increment in the importance of economics. Economics in the way we use the word today did not exist. Um, economics meant management of the household. That there were revenues and uh, uh, ex expenditures of the city was, of course, always known. But there was no discipline, there's really no academic discipline dealing with that. That was done by the practitioners. But now a science of this kind of thing emerged, and under the name the first name, it's, it's, it's later on so strong baby head, was political arithmetic, reckoning on political matters. <coughs> and, and that was the work of a man called Sir William Petty, incidentally. Yeah, the name is funny. He was a friend of Hobbes, younger friend of Hobbes. This is the true genealogy, I believe, of this. Kind of soup. Now, I mention not merely because it's so funny, the following fact. Sir William Petty went so far to figure out the worth of a human being in hard cash, and he, he went about it in a very simple way. He said, What does a man fetch in the slave market in Algiers? And so I forgot now what the precise sum of so many guineas. That is the value of a human being. And then a wiser man, and a shrewder man, Montesquieu, the next century, said, no, Sir William is mistaken. This may be the value of an Englishman, <laughs> but the value of a human being may be, is, as a rule, much lower. And it may approach zero, and it may even be less than zero. He was thinking, I suppose, of overpopulation and famine. And so, but this kind of reflections, which you do not find in classical political philosophy, are an important ingredient of modern. It is understandable that some noble minds revolted against this low but solid political science of the 17th and 18th century. And uh, such men like Shaftesbury, Locke was a kind of tutor of Shaftesbury, but Shaftesbury didn't like Locke at all. Rousseau, Kant. And one could say that this reaction to 17th century political philosophy led to a restoration of the moral level and dignity of classical political philosophy. That is possible. I mean, that surely needs a very thorough investigation. But one thing remains changed, despite that protest, that revolt of these noble minds against the two practical minds of whom I've spoken before. And that is this, the concern with the actualization of the right political order remains unchanged. In other words, it's simple view that an ideal, we, might, we need an ideal, the, the ideal, in order to see clearly as to what we regard as good and noble. And independently of whether there is a prospect that this ideal in its fullness will ever become realized, this is, is not restored. I read to you another passage. From Kant, Kant being one of the sternest moralists that ever were, but he also had this very practical side, connecting him with Sir William Petty and uh, other people. People uh, were in the habit of saying that the establishment of the right social order 
requires a nation of angels, constant, hard as it may sound, the problem of establishing the just social order is soluble even for a nation of devils, provided they have sense, meaning provided they are shrewd enough that it is more profitable to them to be law-abiding citizens than to be criminals. The fundamental political problem is simply one of a good organization of the state of which man is indeed capable. In other words, if you arrange things in such a manner that crime doesn't pay, and you don't have to be a very, very noble soul for wishing that and for doing that, then you have solved the problem. Now, is this concern with the actualization of the right political order shows itself in a different way in Hegel's notion of the reasonableness of the historical process. Uh, there is a convergence, we can say, of the ideal and the actual, and that is a necessary convergence, because the reasonable is actual, and the actual is reasonable. So there is the necessity of the actualization, and according to Hegel's view, this is now, has now been achieved. The historical process is now completed. This view of Hegel was, of course, seemed very implausible to people after him, and today there is hardly anyone who is a Hegelian in this sense of the word. Today it is generally taken for granted that the historical process is unfinishable, that man is always in the midst of it and never at its end, this leads to great difficulties of its own, into which I cannot now go. Perhaps we find a better, another occasion for this. Today I limit myself to the most massive difficulty, visible in the view that now prevails, and that is a view based on the distinction between facts and values as an unbridgeable gulf. Because this view implies that all values are equal before the tribunal of reason. Of course, not for the valuator. The man who values freedom will not regard the values going with tyranny or connected with tyranny as high, but goes without saying. But the scientist, the social scientist, is not supposed to be an evaluator in his capacity as a political scientist. And as such, the values are equal for him. And now we observe here a phenomenon known from economics, the Gresham's laws. The bad values drive out the good ones. The unbelievable vulgarization of which we are witnesses. A few examples. Culture meant originally the cultivation of the mind and especially of the highest powers of the mind. And this word culture could be used only in the plural culture. Because there is the human mind being of one fundamental character, there can only be one culture. Today, everyone speaks of cultures, and the understanding is that they are all equal. When the term cultures came out in the plural, people made still a distinction between what they called high cultures and low cultures. And that, for example, Spengler and such people. But today that is completely abandoned. All men have cultures. All men are cultured. Now, there something rebels in us because when you say a man is cultured, you mean something slightly different from saying that he belongs to a culture. The culture may be one of juvenile delinquents, for example, and you would not, are not likely to call them cultured uh, human beings. Um, one may say the question which, to my knowledge, has not yet been taken up by social science is whether lunatics can have culture. 
But I think so. Should be so. I really value free. They should take up the discussion very soon. Please. Maybe they can study a little bit and learn things from more or less unacculturated people. Unacculturated. Although if they all live together and learn things from the asylum and get along with each other, then they're acculturated and soon be asylum. Oh, I see. Well, this is what I would expect. And I would see, and see, that must be regarded as a culture as high. Yeah, but so I'm glad that uh, I am in contact with this movement. <laughs> one of our leading political scientists did a study on the political interchange uh, among uh, inmates of a oh, mental see. institution. This is regarded as quite valuable. Uh, Professor Riesman? Pardon? Professor Riesman, by the way? I don't believe it was Riesman. I, oh. I can't remember who it was. Huh? Oh, yes. That is also not too surprised. I'm sorry that I made this slip. Now, another a term at which, we can, uh, at which we can see what is happening before our eyes is that of personality. That was originally a very high term. There is a verse by, John, by Goethe, the highest blessing of the children of the earth is the personality. And that implies that very few people are in fact personality. Now, this is still recognized. For example, I believe that Dinah Shore is a TV personality. And here, and a garbage collector is not a personality. Uh, here, personality, however, approaches almost the meaning of celebrity, which was not its original meaning. But, but according to the original meaning, you could be a personality without being a celebrity, and you could be a celebrity without being a personality. And yet, today, although a personality still has this value, value meaning, every man is said to be, to have a personality structure, and it is hard to see uh, how he can um, have such a personality structure without being a personality. So this difficulty illustrates again what is happening in that complete collapse, after the complete collapse of the difference between the ideal and the actor. Now this much to conclude my general introduction. Last time we began uh, our reading of the ethics. And we have seen that Aristotle stresses in this first page which we read, the multiplicity of human ends. And yet, he made clear, there is not a mere confusion and discord because there is a hierarchy of the arts. I trust you remember this section of our discussion. And now let us read again. No, we don't have to read that. The section we read last time, 1094A, 14 to 16. This was the, when he spoke of the architectonic arts, of the ends of architectonic arts. You remember that. What he says here is this. There is this infinite, a seemingly infinite variety of ends. But there are also, is, we observe also kinds of pyramids of the subordination of some arts to others, and therefore of the ends pursued by one kind of art to the ends pursued by another. The difficulty, however, is this. There is a kind of pyramid, as I has said more, and whether these pyramids will fit into a single unitary harmonistic scheme so that there is only one pyramid, that is a question. To leave it as the examples which Aristotle gave, it is easy to see that the art of shipbuilding or shipbuilding is in the service of sailing, of using the ship, and therefore subordinate. But health seems to be something choiceworthy for its own sake. And according, at least according to many, wealth is also something choiceworthy for its own sake. Do health and wealth both come together and form a part of a whole so that 
the conflict, the possible conflict between them is resolved, we have not yet had an answer from Aristotle to this effect. And now let us continue. But in fairness to you, do you have any difficulty or question regarding what I stated in my exposition? Now is the time. Yes. Uh, you use the word lowering or to say lowering of goals or to yeah. um, describe what Machiavelli did. But from Machiavelli's own point of view, was it a lowering of the goals in a public spirited sense or was it simply that there were no other goals but the goals of Machiavelli? Yeah, no, that is true. From Machiavelli's point of view, uh, Machiavelli's point of view, one would have to say he rejected fantastic goals, apparently high and established in, in their place rational, sensible goals, which apparently are low. With this correction, Mr. Fiedler. You spoke of bad values driving out the good. I wonder whether this isn't always a condition of human activity, one which would vary with the character of the one which is in certain sense the same. Yes, but the question is, that may be so, but the question is, whether the teaching on this subject is in order if it has this function. You see, let us assume, for example, in the Middle Ages, the medieval universities with their scholasticism and so on, they surely had frequently the effect of mere routine rigidity and otherwise. But still, what they said about good and bad was of a high order. Only they were not able properly to transmit it. <coughs> in the time of decay of scholasticism. But here we have a science which is flourishing and uh, more prosperous from every worldly point of view, and yet has this function. I think that is a deeper uh, effect than mere inefficient, ineffective. Yes? Uh, you uh, spoke at the time saying that uh, if, if rational, even a society of devils can reach the good, have we ever run across a society that is rational? No. That is correct. Do you, I mean, is it, is, uh, on your basis, do you feel that a rational society is possible? Yeah, that is a long question. But you asked me for my private... Well, you, were, you were saying the basis for the course we have this, or, or we'd be working on the basis of the, such a society as possible? No. We, we, we will investigate its possibility. And one question, for example, would be this. Is moral virtue, of which we will hear quite a bit from Aristotle, and a society in which the men of moral virtue are in control, is this a rational society. That depends very much on the status of moral virtue. And we have not yet advanced to this point. The point to which we advance is only this, as there is a, an almost infinite variety of human ends, but some hope for order shown by the fact of subordination and supraordination of the arts procuring those ends. And this fact of subordination and subordination you see all the time. Mostly we don't observe it, but uh, it was only very late, recently that I observed that there are two kinds of waitresses. Ones, the ones who merely clean the table and the others who bring the food. And it is quite reasonable. I checked this by asking the chairman of this department, who knows more about that. That it is quite reasonable because the one activity is higher than the other. The other is a purely preparatory, a negative one to clean the table, and the other is the one which leads to the fulfillment of your desire for which you go there. Yes. Now, yes. Is it perhaps unfair that way the speech of the Republic and of speech by the ideals? Yes, that is true. 
very sensible assertion. The word ideal is not a platonic word, and therefore one should avoid it in strict language. But in introductory presentation, one may take some free liberty. But the question, the more important point which you made, is that if we are easygoing and say, let's call it, speak of ideal, the modern ideals are radically different from the Platonic Aristotelian ideal. That is the key point. That is one major part, perhaps the most important part, of the quarrel between the ancients and modern. And a sign of this difference is that in the classical scheme, political economy plays no role. Somehow not seriously considered, not not even the historian to theorists, so much admired because of his realism, says much to speak of about the connection between the Peloponnesian War and trade. That simply was not interesting. In modern times, it is regarded as very interesting. Some people regard it as most. So that has something to do with the status of food in the widest sense of the term. Or in, ra- or rather in a rather wide sense of the term, with comfortable self-preservation. Now, I will ask Mr. Veregrin to be re- begin at A16, if you can find that. It doesn't make any difference, he says, you know, whether the activities themselves... It does not matter whether the ends are operations themselves or something other than the operations... As something a- at the side of the what I'm saying, yeah. At the side, yeah. Yes. As in the skills mentioned above. Yes, let us stop here. Now, also states now explicitly that the hierarchic order exists both regarding the activities which have ends apart from the activities. Say, subtle making is not for its own sake, but for the production of something apart from the activity, at the side of the activity. And of those activities which have no ends apart from the activities, say, riding. But there is a complication here. Bodily exercise, of which riding is a part, does not produce a verb as shoemaking produces shoes. Yet bodily exercise is subservient to the medical art, which has a work outside of the practice of medicine, that work being health. This is a point made by Thomas Aquinas. But let us go on and uh, read further. Yes? If our actions have an end that we wish for itself, and if we wish other things for that end, and not each thing on account of another, for this to involve us in an infinite process, making our desire useless and in vain, then obviously that will be not only a good end, but a supreme end. So this will be the good and the best. And good, i.e., it will be the best. Now what is here important is that this sentence begins with an if. And we must not forget that. You know, let us hear firstly, there must be ends chosen for their own sake. As it says here, desire cannot be empty and useless altogether, because desire, at least many of our desires, are natural. And what is natural is not empty and useless. That is Aristotle's assumption, which he doesn't speak about here. But, of course, even granting that there must be ends chosen for their own sake, this doesn't prove that there must be a single such end. I refer to, the, to health and wealth before. It is not sufficient to say that health is a greater good than wealth. For a poor man, the breadwinner of a large family, it may be better to earn money than to get medical care for which he cannot pay. An example which Plato uses in the Republic, the fourth book, where he contrasts the posture of the sensible craftsman artisan who says, I will rather be dead than be a burden on my family, 
with the rich valetudinarian who invests all his efforts and all his money in living as long a time as possible. Now let us here at this moment step back and look at the argument as a whole. The simple basis of Aristotle's pursuit in this book is the simple beginning of the, of the ethics. It's a bewildering variety of ends. Aristotle views that variety from the point of view of the variety of the art, the, of the rational endeavor to achieve or procure those ends. Now, the arts show a hierarchy, and therefore also a hier there is a hierarchy of the ends. But is this sufficient? There are arts directed toward health and wealth, for example. But what about arts productive of honor and pleasure? Would they not also have to be considered? Why does Aristotle not speak of that here? Perhaps we can say honor is given, if it is rightly given, for services. And there is an order of rank of the services too. And so would this not, uh, would this not always come back to the point that there is a variety of ends, but also a hierarchy. As for pleasures, some of you have read Plato's Gorgias and know a distinction made there by Socrates. The distinction between arts and flattery, for example, cosmetics. Medicine is an art, makes a man healthy within the limits of the cosmos. But cosmetics creates only the appearance of health, and is therefore swindle, and so that is called the flattery. So this kind of consideration would also have to come in. But let us now continue. A knowledge of this, therefore, would be a great help in human living, for like archers keeping their eye on the target, we will more likely attain our objective. This being the case, we must try to determine the general characteristics of this end, and to which of the sciences or skills its study pertains. Yeah, that is sufficient. Aristotle, it is really a question in the original. Others, would it not be eminently helpful also with regard to life, i.e., in contradistinction to mere knowledge, to have a single end, a single target, so that we can decide in all cases which of the many ends has a priority, which is not be wonderful. But for this purpose, we would have to know first what that target is, and the best, superior to all other good things. And second, which kind of human knowledge or faculty is competent to know it? Because if we don't have such a faculty or knowledge, and then the existence of uh, this end will always remain dubious. Let us assume, for argument's sake, that this best is known only to women's intuition. Prior to investigation, we cannot exclude that. And then it would be very hard for the male part of the human race, and gynecocracy would be established, but it would be in a difficulty because a woman's intuition implies that the lady cannot give a reason, and therefore that could be. Uh, we, we, Aristotle has not in any way decided the question, but he prepares now a decision by what he says. Yes? It's doubtly to belong to the most truly architectonic science. This, to all appearances, is political science. Yeah. So Aristotle has given us an answer, whether it is a satisfactory or not, we do not yet know, to this question how we can know this best thing. Aristotle answers, as you see here, not the question of what the best thing is, but the question what knowledge or faculty is competent to know the best thing. 
Here again, he starts from the side not of the goods or ends, but from the side of the arts or knowledges. He qualifies his statement, as you have seen. It, it seems, it could seem to be that it is a matter for the most lordly and the most architectonic art. And as such, the political art political faculty comes to sight finite. This word which you use, which I translate, comes to sight, tries to preserve the ambiguity of the Greek. It's not mere seeming. It may very well be the, the real real stuff it comes to sight as what it is. But there is a question also whether it is not mere appearance. Why is the political art the most lordly and the most architectonic of all the arts, that is read the secret. It has to become economy and rhetoric fall under political science. Political science, in fact, makes use of other practical science, sciences, even legislating what is to be done and what is not to be done. Its end, therefore, embraces the ends of the other practical sciences. For these reasons, then, this end will be the good Meaning the end of political science, the political art, the political ability is the human good and of no other art. No, no, that is to, to try to understand Aristotle's argument. Today, for example, what does it mean that all arts serve the political art? Today, physicists serving the government. Yeah, that's one example, a topical example. So I shall give two reasons. The political art determines which sciences ought to be or to exist in the city. That seems to be incompatible with academic freedom. But the question arises whether there is not under certain circumstances, the question doesn't arise, whether some arts or sciences are not dangerous to human society. Aristotle takes this for granted. And the second reason which he gives is that he takes the most respected of the arts. Uh, and these are, according to him, the art of the general, that of the manager of the household, and the art of public speech. Now, these are highly respected arts, as we learn here from Aristotle. And all three of their practitioners admit that they are subject to the political art, if only because they are subject to the law. And the law is a work of the political art. Or is there any difficulty here? So, in other words, it, it is thinkable that there might be arts or faculties which are not, according to their own confession, subject to the political art, but the most respected and respectable are subject. Let us assume for one moment that there is an art of sophistry, and this art would deny its being subject to the political art. Think of the sophist, sophist as they appear in Plato, well, well, but are they respected people? Not among the right kind of people, but the conversion. Yeah, but that is, a, such a, that is one of the deepest questions, perhaps the deepest question regarding the ethics. And it is of no use to give a dogmatic answer. Let us see what we do. But for the time being, we have learned merely this, that Aristotle asserts that the political art is the art which deals with the highest. Whether that is qualif unqualifiedly true or only what if I have it from Peter not yet? No. Now, what also, if we follow the drift of the argument, uh, does here is this, that there is an art in existence called the political art or science. The very existence of that 
thing as the most architectonic power of man proves in a manner the existence of a single highest end. You, you remember that you have on the one side the good things, and the other side the are. Now, if the one side is pyramidal, culminating in the highest art, it is plausible to expect that there will be a similar pyramidality on the side of the good. That is not a proof, but it is leading up towards some expectation. And then we must see later on whether Aristotle can make it stick, what he here only suggests. Now, let us read the sequence. Even though it could be the same for one man and for the whole state, it seems... The state means only all right. Yeah, go on. For the whole city. city. Yeah. It seems much better and more perfect to procure and preserve the good of the whole city. It is admirable, indeed, it is admirable, indeed, to preserve the good of the individual, but it is still, but it is better still and more divine to do this for a nation and for cities. With such a good as the object of our inquiry, we may call our study political science. Yeah, you know, that is not bad. Yeah, and the enterprise, the inquiry, strives for these things, goes after these things. And our enterprise is a kind of political science, grave qualification. Corresponding th this kind of criticism uh, to what Socrates does in the Gorgias somewhere, that he says that he alone is the true politician in Athens. Now, the true politician, that is, the same as not being a politician. Yeah. Uh, surely not an ordinary politician. And similarly, this political science which Aristotle exhibits in this book is in a sense it is political science, but only in one sense. In other sense it's not. Now what the difference is we must exactly <coughs> see. Now as for the word city here, Polish in Greek. Let us translate it by city all the time, and not by state, nor by city-state. And if someone is compelled to think of Wall Street or Threadneedle Street when he hears a city, then he must change his habits. That is not too much to other than that one. And uh, otherwise we will not really understand what else is talking about. There is no state there. State is a term which arises with Machiavelli or about that time. It didn't exist there. Uh, the Romans also didn't have a word for state. It's civitas, the collective of the citizens, which is fundamentally the same as politics. The point which we have to make is that the modern equivalent to what Aristotle or the Greeks altogether understood by polis is the country. And not the state, the country. I mean, I he not merely, uh, for example, also the emotional uh, implications which the word, especially the country, has. It will belong to the state. The state is, as Nietzsche said and President de Gaulle repeated, a cold monster. Only I think de Gaulle meant it as a compliment. But Nietzsche, <laughs> and what Nietzsche meant is, and then it's shocking. But the country is nothing cold. And that is a police. That the police has something to do with the state, there is no doubt about it. But we should nevertheless uh, uh, get some more precise understanding of this difference. Now, the single highest teller's end is the human good. But why should it be the object of the political art? That could be questioned. We have here already a, an indication. Is the good the best? The same for the individual and for the city? Perhaps that is not so. Then the highest art would not be called political art. 
Aristotle says they are identical, but there are so many qualifications that, uh, as you would see when, by reading the third and seventh book of the politics. Here, however, Aristotle assumes that the end of the two is the same. To achieve and to preserve the human good for a nation or a city is more noble and more divine than do it for one man alone. Now, when Aristotle speaks here, you must not forget when he says here a kind of politics. And previously he had spoken of politics. There is also another point to consider. Formerly, he's, in the first case, he spoke of the art procuring and preserving the highest good. And that was the political art. But Aristotle speaks now of his work, of his political uh, or moral teaching, whatever you call it. And that is not simply political. It is political in a sense. Do you understand this difference? The legislator it takes the highest case. He elaborates a code for a given political community. He is politically active to the highest degree. But the teacher of legislators, surrounded by 10 or 12 young people who give promise of becoming legislators, he is not, as a teacher, politically active. He is a man in the classroom, in the study. It therefore, in the Middle Ages, they made a distinction between the practical sciences proper, like politics, economics, and so on, and theoretical, theoretical practical sciences, the sciences which clarify the practical sciences, and therefore are at one remove away from the practical That is, I think, what I saw in mind. Now, he mentions here nation. Greek ethnos and polis. What is the relation or what is the order of rank of nation and polis? What would you say, according to Aristotle, from your knowledge to the extent to which you have that? Yes, I think that is correct. But it is very interesting that Thomas Aquinas, in his commentary on this passage, says the nation is higher because it contains many cities. I think that is one of the few interesting deviations of Aris, of Thomas from his teacher, uh, Thomas. Aristotle and not all other classical writers use frequently the expressions the cities and the nations, polarized correctly. Then in this connection, this means almost the same as the Greeks and the barbarians, because the polis was more frequent among Greeks and the barbarians. Most of the barbarians lived in tribes. Perhaps one should translate ethnos by tribe and not by nation, and not in order to avoid certain modern connotations. Yes. Now, I believe we have to leave it at this point. Is there anyone who has a question or objection which I can miss a feeling? I wonder whether I could ask about something you mentioned on Monday. Yes. When you spoke of... And that would be a gross misuse of authority if I would say what I discussed on Monday will be discussed in class only on Monday and on Monday. Yeah. Uh, insofar as you characterize modern science as being metaphysically neutral as compared with yeah. the ancient science. <laughs> Is it not the case that in a certain way it, it supports materialism rather than idealism? Yeah, this is a point, you see, this is they deny. And that was a, that is an interesting question because there was once a man called Lenin of whom he was the first. And he was a materialist. And he said so. And then there were people who were surely not spiritualistic or idealistic, but positivist. One very famous man among them was Ernst Mach, who wrote the history of mechanics. And this kind of people. And they said, and the school was called 
imperial criticism. Now they are called uh, positivists. And uh, Lenin wrote a fat book, as though he was very active, as you know, doing things different than, than writing books. Uh, and he wrote this very fat book, and uh, that was the point, that these people, these in modern positivists, interpreters of modern science, denied the materialistic character of modern science, and Lenin asserted it. And the, if you want to go back into the prehistory, one would have to study Kant's critique of pure reason, especially, in which it is shown that modern natural science is true only of the phenomenal world, not of the noumenal world, and therefore radically non-metaphysical. And the, the materialistic conclusions drawn from science are invalid. I, uh, it's, of course, a question whether Kant is right or not, but uh, this is, uh, the, one can say, the official view that modern science is metaphysically neutral. And some of the admirers of modern science and some of its critics assert that it is not metaphysically neutral. There are people, for example, who say modern science originated in scholasticism and 14th, 15th century, the main But insofar as materialism might be less than metaphysical in some cases. Yes, yeah, sure. And then if you take metaphysical in the older sense, then materialism is, of course, not metaphysical because it denies that there is anything beyond nature or behind nature. That would seem almost yeah, but today, time. Yeah, but today the meaning of metaphysics has somewhat changed. And metaphysical means then any assertion about the whole not supportable by scientific evidence. From this point of view, Democritus' doctrine of the atom is as metaphysical as the greatest fancies of Plato. You know, and this you have to consider. Yes. So you began by explaining that the meaning of subordination of several arts in the science means something very different today than, than it is for Aristotle. That for the physicist who serves the government today, it means uh, kind of something quite different from the, uh, the art of generalship or any other art serving, uh, serving political science or being under political science in Aristotle. Uh, you didn't exactly conclude the explanation. I hope you forgive me if I say I am a bit tired now. Will you make a note of your question and let me have it in writing at the beginning of the next month? Thank you. And then you would not have to take an examination at the end. So this would be convenient for you and not only for me. It goes without saying that the paper by itself would not be sufficient. A attendance here, and preferably participation in class discussion, would also be considered in grading. If this is acceptable to you, I would say that there should be two students who would hand in a paper next time, say of roughly seven typewritten double-spaced pages on the first book of the ethics. Is there anyone among you who is willing to take that jump? I see here some of my students from Chicago, I don't know from there, my practice, and they endured it and lived happily ever after. So prove that this is feasible. But they are not registered here, and therefore I cannot punish them by imposing it. What about two Remembers you. What's your name? Odelina. Will you write a paper on the first book of the ethics and hand it in next Monday? Thank you. That's very good. And who else? What about Mr. Weathergreen? Who, who is one of the few students I know? Oh, yes. Yeah. What about you? Very good. So now let us turn to more pleasant 
to go to greener pastures. Now, I sketched to you last time two broad, comprehensive considerations which we must never lose sight of when engaging in a rather detailed study of at least some sections of Aristotle's ethics. Such considerations are needed to counteract a danger that is perhaps particularly great in our age of ever-increasing specialization, namely the danger being that we exclude from sight, from consideration, very important matters in the vain hope that George will take care of them. George being another specialist, maybe a sociologist, psychologist, analytical philosopher, or whatever. The classic formulation for this passing of the buck was coined about 150 years ago by Comte, Auguste Comte, one of the greatest heirs and in some way the classic interpreter of modern science, namely of that science which is definitely non-philosophic. You remember what I said last time about the philosophic character of science in the old scheme and the separation of philosophy and science which has taken place in modern times. Now, he called his position positive philosophy philosophy positive. And in other words, it was still philosophy. No question about that. But the peculiarity was it is positive. And therefore, the, since that time, the word positivism has become common general use. And the main thesis is this, that the way toward the truth is that of modern science. Modern science is an approach to all theoretical and practical questions. It was preceded by radically different approaches. The first was the theological one, where all things were traced to so-called personal powers or personal power. And the second stage that he called metaphysical, and that is represented, say, by Plato and Aristotle in classical antiquity and by the great system builders of the 17th century modern times. Now, both approaches, the theological and metaphysical, are bankrupt. And the only one which is theoretically feasible and at the same time offers some hope for human practice is a positive approach, the approach peculiar to modern science. Now, what is the peculiarity of science in context of positive science, in contradistinction to theology and metaphysics? The chief answer is this. Theology and metaphysics try to answer the question of why. This question is abandoned by science in favor of the question of the how. Why do bodies fall? What is the secret of gravitation, that mysterious force? This is theological or metaphysical, according to Kant. Whereas the question, with what speed do bodies fall, the how of fall, that is a scientific and reasonable question. Now, there is this difficulty here. It may be true that men cannot answer the questions of the why. And therefore, one acts prudently by limiting oneself to the question of the how. Yet, the questions of the why remain. They are not meaningless questions. They are only perhaps unanswerable questions. They continue to bother man, despite or because of all progresses of science. So much so that the even an infinite progress of science in the future will offer us no hope of ever giving us an answer to the question of the why, of ever solving the enigmas with which man is confronted. 
We have no right to assume, in addition, that man has infinite time at his disposal for progressing. Even granting that an infinite, an infinite progress or riddles would be solved, we don't know whether there will be an infinite time at our disposal. And not only because of the atomic bomb, but also because of a certain perhaps built-in limitation of the duration of human life on Earth. Hence, the unsolved and insoluble questions of the why threaten the whole edifice of science. They deprive it of its ultimate importance. For example, if science can teach us a lot regarding means for any ends that we might choose, but cannot tell us what ends to choose, And on this, the ends, everything depends. And therefore, the dignity of the science is gravely threatened by the fact that it cannot answer the question of the right. And this has led to a popularly known phenomenon in which was called by a sociologist the flight from scientific reason. And I think the author meant by it that people were fundamentally dissatisfied because their deepest and most serious questions were beyond the ken of science. It is a question which I am in no position to answer, but which has often been raised. How far this fact is essential limitation of science and the dissatisfaction with what science can do contributes to the unrest on some campuses. So we tried to counteract the narrowness of specialization by engaging in broad and comprehensive consideration. And we do this for good or evident reasons. However poor our achievement may be, our pursuit in itself is sensible. I believe I have shown that it is sensible. In doing so, I have shown that there is a rational end, clarity about the fundamental issue, a rational end, a rational ought, for we cannot help if we understand something as evidently necessary to do it unless we are prevented from doing so by some uh, an accidental fact. It is impossible to say whether my theoretical reflection of last time and my moralizing, my exhortation, my preaching begin, whether one stops and the other begins. They are inseparable, where I made the inevitable but the allegedly vicious transition from factual questions to vital questions. To that extent, I hope I helped you somewhat to understand Aristotle's ethics, and to look at things from Aristotle's point of view, from a point of view which does not permit the fact-value distinction as it is now set. I would like to make a remark in passing. The fact-value distinction must not be taken too seriously or literally. It cannot be maintained in any long run, in any broad and not merely technical or academic consideration. For instance, I read in yesterday's Los Angeles Times the following sentence. We have failed to understand the implications of the new vision of man which is accepted by an ever-growing number of social scientists, that so soon as sufficient food, clothing, and shelter are available, man is forced by profound psychological pressures to drive toward self-actualization. Individuals who are deprived of the opportunity to strive to achieve their full potential will drift into personal disorientation or drift into violence.
Here we see a reference to the new vision of man. And let us assume that the crown to the author that it is new. Man is happy and gentle, provided his comfortable self-preservation is guaranteed. That is the new vision. Man is not by nature good. For by nature, he does not have the means of comfortable self-preservation, and in particular, uh, yeah, yeah, self-preservation. But after man has conquered nature, as he has done now, he can make himself happy and gentle. He uses much more highfalutin expressions, but so I try to translate them into simple uh, language. It is, of course, presupposed here that to be happy and gentle is good, and to be unhappy and violent is bad. Well, I think we can grant this without uh, being petty and, uh, and accept it. At first glance, at any rate. To be at peace with oneself, to know what one wants, one can also say, and at peace with one's fellow men, seems to be preferable to the alternative. But even on the most superficial level, a difficulty arises. Are food, clothing, and shelter the only ends of man? And does the non-availability of these three items alone make men unhappy and or violent? I think we do not have recourse to our Private experiences, if you have read a few novels, we will know that there is a thing called unhappy love and also unhappy marriages, and this has nothing to do with food, clothing, shelter, per se. The practical conclusion, therefore, drawn by quite a few of our contemporaries is that you must have, of course, a solution of the food and shelter problem, either by the utilitarian or in the Marxist spirit, but you must also have a solution to the problem of unhappy law, and that means psychoanalysis. So Marxism or, or utilitarianism and psychoanalysis together have a very great power, open or concealed in present-day social science. But without any disrespect to hunger, and sex, are there no other ends or good things which a true vision of man, in contradistinction to the new vision of man, would have to consider? What about premature violent death, for example? What about death itself? Are this not important consideration? Whatever one may say against Aristotle's ethics, he does not make the mistake of taking such a narrow view of the human ends or goods as the new vision of man does. This is another simple consideration why we should pay some attention to Aristotle. Now, to return to the chief subject of today's lecture, I have asserted last time that we must start from the broadest possible considerations, and I sketched two such considerations. The first I indi indicated by the terms Machiavellianism and, and anti-Machiavellianism, and which I then replaced by the opposition of materialism and idealism. This seems to be the most fundamental alternative, the most comprehensive alternative. An alternative coeval, if not with man, surely with philosophy. An eternal alternative, as we may provisionally say. The second consideration I considered was that of the quarrel between the ancients and the moderns. The fundamental difference between antiquity and modernity, between ancient materialism and modern materialism, and between ancient idealism and modern idealism. This alternative is not eternal, but would have to be called historical, because surely the modern alternative did not, was not available in classical times. 
It is not easy to say which of these two fundamental alternatives is more fundamental than the other, or even whether this question makes sense. Let us then leave this question open. I illustrated the quarrel between the ancients and moderns by contrasting the Aristotelian division of philosophy and the one that prevails now. I suggested that the difference between modern and ancient philosophy has something to do with the difference between the attempt at human mastery of the whole and the denial of the possibility of, or desirability of such mastery. Accordingly, the ancient thinkers held that the good life is a life according to nature. Nature, as it were, establishes the norm, the end for our life. The end is, does not have its root in, you, in man's establishing or setting. In contradistinctions, the depreciation of nature in modern times, the strive for liberation from nature's apron strength, and thus the Kantian formula and thus to make man sovereign, replacing nature by reason and eventually by history. Now I will fill up my sketch by speaking more particularly on the quarrel between ancient and moderns within political philosophy or political science. For I say or political philosophy or political science because that was in pre-modern times, political philosophy and political science were the same thing. Now we have the separation. And it is for us, it should at least be for us a question, which of the two alternatives is sound, the identification or the separation. I have to say, therefore, a few words about the general character of classical political thought. If we contrast, say, Plato or Aristotle, with what is, going, what is being done in political science now. What strikes us most, I think, is that in ancient times, political science, political philosophy, had a direct relation to political life, which does no longer exist. The questions which political philosophy or political science raised were the same as those raised in the political arena. And that shows itself in the fact that in Plato's and Aristotle's political science or political philosophy, there is hardly any term which did not stem from the political arena, but was hatched in academies. The political philosopher or political scientist looked in the same direction as the citizen or statesman. He does not look at political life from without, like the observer of microbes, stars, or what have you. But he takes his stand within it. And this has radically changed in modern times. I think I will draw a picture. Good. Oh, I could have it here. So, if this is the standpoint of the citizen or statesman, he looks at political things in this perspective. There are two. Now, the political philosopher or scientist of ancient times stands also here and looks here. There is an alternative way of looking at it, namely to stand here and to look at it from the outside. Is this clear? Now, the difference between the political philosopher or political scientist and the citizen or statesman, according to the older view, is merely this, that the political philosopher looks in the same direction but further afield. In other words, this other will go on. It will be continued beyond the point beyond which it was continued by the citizen. And with this is connected is the fact 
that the political philosopher is supposed to have a function which no one else could fulfill, a very high function. I mean, in the first place, to be the arbiter par excellence. Political life means political conflict, conflict of various groups. The most well-known in ancient modern times were the rich and the poor. But sensible men do not want conflict, but harmony and peace. And how to establish peace? Answer, you have an impartial arbiter. This happens all the time in political life. But to do this on the highest level and regarding the, the permanent questions of political life, that would seem to be the function of the arbiter per excellence. And that was meant to be the political philosopher. For the same reason, I cannot now elaborate it with the necessary clarity, for the same reason, the political philosopher was regarded as the teacher of the political men of the highest order. The political men of the highest order is a legislator, not in the sense in which the word is now used, where we have many, many legislators, as you know, but the man who elaborates a code which should last for quite some time and not a, a thing which would be revised every, every second day. So. Now, the legislator is concerned only with giving the best laws, if he's a, a reasonable man, for his community. But in order he cannot know, truly know, what the best laws for his community are, if he doesn't know what the best laws simply are. And therefore, there must be men who raise the question of what the best laws simply are. That is the teacher of legislation. More precisely, as Plato and Aristotle teach, and some other their followers have taught, laws are not the fundamental political phenomenon. What laws are and are not possible in a given society depends on the politeia, as they said, P-O-L-I-T-E-I-A, which I translate by regime. The common translation is constitution. What it means primarily is the factual distribution of power within the society. <coughs> and therefore the question arises, the ultimate question is not what are the best laws, but what is the best regime. And of this best regime, they say that it must be possible. In other words, it, it must be possible without assuming a miraculous or non-miraculous change of human beings. Human beings, as they are by nature, bright, stupid, vicious, kind, and so on and so on, no change in the system but a, such an arrangement that the more desirable people have more to say. This is, according to their view, the best regime. So it must be possible. But it, the possibility has, does not mean that it will be, there is any probability. Both Plato and Aristotle say very emphatically that it is improbable that the best regime will become actual or was ever actual. Neither Plato nor Aristotle found any example of what they regarded as the best regime anywhere at any time. This did not bother the, them at all for the following reason. I use now again a word alien to Plato and Aristotle, but easily intelligible to you. The best regime is an ideal and not an ideal among many, but the ideal. Now, an ideal does not cease to be an ideal by never being actual. This way of thinking, I think, is very well known to all of you. For you need, at any rate, a standard of judgment of the actor, a standard for the diagnosis of the actor, in what way it is good, 
in what way it is bad. And therefore, you must have a complete picture of the perfectly good society, of the perfectly good regime, and regardless of whether it is actual. Whether it will be actual or not depends on chance. As Plato puts in the Republic, it depends on coincidence, on the coincidence of philosophy and political power, on philosophy and political power coinciding. Now, this much about the classical approach. We see the origins of the modern approach by turning to Machiavelli, especially the Prince, chapter 15. I know the means to see what should be the ways and conduct of a prince in dealing with his subjects and his friends. And because I know that many have written on this topic, I fear that when I too write, I shall be thought presumptuous, because in discussing it, I break away completely from the principles laid down by my predecessors. But since it is my purpose to write something useful to an attentive reader, I think it more effective to go back to the practical truth of the subject than to depend on fancies, imaginations about it. And many have imagined republics and principalities that never have been seen or known to exist in reality. Plato and Aristotle are obvious examples of that. For there is such a difference between the way men live and the way they ought to live that anybody who abandons what is for what ought to be will learn something that will ruin rather than preserve him. Because anyone who determines to act in all circumstances, the part of a good man, must come to ruin among so many who are not good. Now, this is one of the most important passages ever written. The ancients took their bearings by how men should live, by how men ought to live. And therefore, they arrived at imaginary principalities. Incidentally, when he speaks of imagined principalities, he thinks not only of Plato and Aristotle, but of the Bible as well. The kingdom of God would have the same characteristics as the kingdom of the philosophers in, in Plato. So what Machiavelli tries to do is to use, again, a convenient slogan to make politics a realistic sign, to take men as they are. Thus, the chances of actualization of the desirable order increase enormously. If you make these high demands, which Plato and Aristotle made, then no chance, no practical chance. But if you want to put the, low, the goal lower, as Machiavelli did, and still it is still a goal, still a kind of ideal, but lower, then the chances of actualization will increase. In other words, by lowering the goal, you enable yourself to conquer chance. And that is precisely what Machiavelli says in the same verse, chapter 25. Chance, fortuna, is a woman who can be forced by the right kind of man. There is, according to the older view, chance is elusive and cannot be conquered by anyone. The ancient philosophers spoke of virtue as the most important consideration. Machiavelli uses the Italian equivalent of virtue, the two, but gives it a very new meaning. It has nothing to do with moral virtue. It has something to do with, with uh, patriotism or political virtue, uh, but even that is quite dubious. Who can be forced by the right kind of man? There is, according to the older view, chance is elusive and cannot be conquered by anyone. I'll read to you another passage. The ancient philosophers spoke of virtue as the 
most important consideration. Machiavelli uses the Italian equivalent of virtue, the two, but gives it a very new meaning. It has nothing to do with moral virtue. It has something to do with patriotism or political virtue, uh, but even that is quite dubious. Now, I'll read to you another passage in so that we get some better understanding. Is the true history of political philosophy is not cannot be written on the basis of explicit quotations alone. One has to do some thinking. If my memory doesn't deceive me, Thomas Hobbes never mentions Machiavelli. He surely never mentions him with any emphasis. And yet, without Machiavelli, no Thomas Hobbes. Now, Hobbes says in the epistle dedicatory to his elements of law, natural and quality, is the following thing. To reduce the doctrine of justice in policy to the rules and infallibility of reason, there is no way but first to put such principles down for a foundation as passion, not mistrusting, may not seek to displace. In other words, we have to start from foundations agreeable to passion. Nay, as Hobbes makes clear in, his, in the execution of his work, we have to find the principle of political life in a passion. And that passion he finds in the fear of death. Something very low, but very common, and therefore something trusted. Low but solid. That was a notion guiding such men like Hobbes, but also Locke and Rousseau. Thomas Aquinas, in his discussion of natural law, had made a distinction between three natural inclinations of men. One toward self-preservation, one toward preservation of the species, as shown in particular by generation of offspring, and one toward knowledge, and in particular knowledge of God. What Hobbes does is to erase the two higher inclinations, to abstract from them, and because that would lead to all kinds of complications, and to stick to the lowest but strongest most of the time, namely the fear of death, or in other words, the desire for self-preservation. Now, this foundation was taken over, obviously, by Locke and Rousseau, and although with not unimportant modification, but the principle remains the same. Hobbes already, but more explicitly Locke, puts the emphasis on compatible self-preservation. Meaning, sure, if you have, if you arrive at it, the immediate, you are threatened by a potential killer, then you are perfectly pleased if you can just preserve yourself. But apart from such harsh situations, you would like to preserve yourself comfortably. You have not only a bed, but a comfortable bed. And you have not only food, but tasty food and so on. At any rate, in connection with this modern movement, starting in the way from Machiavelli, but more visibly from Hobbes, you have an enormous increment in the importance of economics. Economics in the way we use the word today did not exist. Um, economics meant management of the household. That there were revenues and uh, uh, expenditures of the city was, of course, always known. But there was no discipline, surely no academic discipline dealing with that. That was done by the practitioners. But now a science of this kind of thing emerged. And under the name, the first name is this, this later on so strong baby head, was political arithmetic, reckoning on political matters. <coughs> And that was the work of a man called Sir William Petty, 
Incidentally, he had a neighbor's son. He was a friend of Hobbes, younger friend of Hobbes. This is the true genealogy, I believe, of this uh, kind of suit. Now, I mention, not merely because it's so funny, the following fact. Sir William Petty went so far to figure out the worth of a human being in hard cash, and he, he went about it in a very sensible way. He said, what does a man fetch in the slave market in Algiers? And so I forgot now what the precise sum of so many guineas. That is the value of a human being. And then a wiser man, a shrewder man, more to secure it, the next century, said, no, Sir William is mistaken. This may be the value of an Englishman, <laughs> but the value of a human being may be, is, as a rule, much lower. And it may approach zero, and it may even be less than zero. He was thinking, I suppose, of overpopulation and famine. And so, but this kind of reflections which you do not find in classical political philosophy are an important ingredient of modern. It is understandable that some noble minds revolted against this low but solid political science of the 17th and 18th century. And uh, such men like Shaftesbury, Locke was a kind of tutor of Shaftesbury, but Shaftesbury didn't like Locke at all. Rousseau, Kant. And one could say that this reaction to 17th century political philosophy led to a restoration of the moral level and dignity of classical political philosophy. That is possible. I mean, that surely needs a very thorough investigation. But one thing remains changed. Despite that protest, that revolt of these noble minds against the two practical minds of whom I have spoken before, and that is this, the concern with the actualization of the right political order remains unchanged. In other words, a simple view that an ideal, we, might, we need an ideal, the, the ideal, in order to see clearly as to what we regard as good and noble. And independently of whether there is a prospect that this ideal in its fullness will ever become realized, this is, is not restored. I read to you another passage from Kant. Kant being one of the sternest moralists that ever were. But he also had this very practical side, connecting him with Sir William Petty and uh, other people. People have in the habit of saying that the establishment of the right social order requires a nation of angels. Concern, hard as it may sound, the problem of establishing the just social order is soluble even for a nation of devils, provided they have sense, meaning provided they are shrewd enough that it is more profitable to them to be law-abiding citizens than to be criminals. The fundamental political problem is simply one of a good organization of the state of which man is indeed capable. In other words, if you arrange things in such a manner that crime doesn't pay and you don't have to be a very mo very noble soul for wishing that and for doing that, then you have solved the political problem. Now, is this concern with the actualization of the right political order shows itself in a different way in Hegel's notion of the reasonableness of the historical process. Uh, there is a convergence, we can say, of the ideal and the actor, and that is a necessary convergence, because the reasonable is actor, and the actor is reasonable. So there is the necessity of the actualization, and according to Hegel's view, 
this is now, has now been achieved. The historical process is now completed. This view of Hegel was, of course, seemed very implausible to people after him, and today there is hardly anyone who is a Hegelian in this sense of the word. Today it is generally taken for granted that the historical process is unfinishable, that man is always in the midst of it and never at its end. If this leads to great difficulties of its own, into which I cannot now go, perhaps we find a better, another occasion for this. Today I limit myself to the most massive difficulty, visible in the view that now prevails, and that is a view based on the distinction between facts and values as an unbridgeable gulf. Because this view implies that all values are equal before the tribunal of reason. Of course, not for the valuator. The man who values freedom will not regard the values going with tyranny or connected with tyranny as high, but goes without saying. But the scientist, the social scientist, is not supposed to be an evaluator in his capacity as a political scientist. And as such, the values are equal for him. And now we observe here a phenomenon known from economics, the Gresham's laws. The bad values drive out the good ones. The unbelievable vulgarization of which we are witnesses. A few examples. Culture meant originally the cultivation of the mind and especially of the highest powers of the mind. And this word culture could be used only in the plural culture. Because there is the human mind being of one fundamental character. There can only be one culture. Today, everyone speaks of cultures. And the understanding is that they are all equal. When the term cultures came out in the plural, people made still a distinction between what they called high cultures and low cultures. And that, for example, Spengler and such people. But today that is completely abandoned. All men have cultures. All men are cultured. Now, there something rebels in us because when you say a man is cultured, you mean something slightly different from saying that he belongs to a culture. The culture may be one of juvenile delinquents, for example, and you would not, are not likely to call them cultured uh, human beings. Um, one may say the question which, to my knowledge, has not yet been taken up by social science is whether lunatics can have culture. But I think they should, if they really value free, they should take up this question very soon. Please? There is a tendency to study a little bit, and lunatics are more or less unacculturated people. Unacculturated. Oh, I see. Well, this is what I would expect, and I would see, and see, that must be regarded as a culture as high. Yeah, but so I'm glad that uh, I am in contact with this movement. One of our leading political scientists did a study on the political interchange among uh, inmates of a oh, mental see. institution. This is regarded as quite valuable. Uh, Professor Riesman? Pardon? Professor Riesman, by the way? I don't believe it was Riesman. I, uh -huh. I can't remember who it was. Huh? Huh? Yeah. Oh, yes. That is <laughs> not too surprised. I'm sorry that I made this slip. Now, another a term at which we can uh, at which we can see the, what is happening before our eyes is that of personality. That was originally a very high term. There is a verse by John by Goethe, the highest blessing of the children of the earth is the personality. And, and that implies that very few people are in fact personality. Now this is still recognized. 
For example, I believe that Dinah Shaw is a TV personality. And here, and a garbage collector is not a personality. Uh, here, personality, however, approaches almost the meaning of celebrity, which was not its original meaning. But, but according to the original meaning, you could be a personality without being a celebrity, and you could be a celebrity without being a personality. And yet, today, although a personality still has this value, value meaning, every man is said to be to have a personality structure, and it is hard to see uh, how he can um, have such a personality structure without being a personality. So this difficulty illustrates again what is happening in that complete collapse, after the complete collapse of the difference between the ideal and the actor. Now this much to conclude my general introduction. Last time we began uh, our reading of the ethics. And we have seen that Aristotle stresses in this first page, which we read, the multiplicity of human ends. And yet, he made clear, there is not a mere confusion and discord, because there is a hierarchy of the arts. I trust you remember this section of our discussion. And now let us read again. No, we don't have to read that. The section we read last time, 1094A, 14 to 16. This was the, when he spoke of the architectonic arts, of the ends of architectonic arts. You remember that. What he says here is this. There is this infinite, a seemingly infinite variety of ends, but there are also, is, we observe also kinds of pyramids of the subordination of some arts to others, and therefore of the ends pursued by one kind of art to the ends pursued by another. The difficulty, however, is this. There is a kind of pyramid, also has that more, and whether these pyramids will fit into a single unitary harmonistic scheme so that there is only one pyramid, that is a question. To leave it as the examples which Aristotle gave, it is easy to see that the art of shipbuilding or shipbuilding is in the service of sailing, of using the ship, and therefore subordinate. But health seems to be something choiceworthy for its own sake. And according, at least according to many, wealth is also something choiceworthy for its own sake. Do health and wealth both come together and form a part of a whole so that the conflict, the possible conflict between them is resolved? We have not yet had an answer from Aristotle to this effect. And now let us continue. But in fairness to you, do you have any difficulty or question regarding what I stated in my exposition? Now is the time. Yes. Uh, you used the word lowering, or to say lowering of goals, which is, yeah. um, or, or to describe what is. But from Machiavelli's own point of view, was it a lowering of the goals in a public spirited sense, or was it simply that there were no other goals but the goals? Yeah, no, that is true. From Machiavelli's point, uh, point of view, one would have to say he rejected fantastic goals, apparently high, and established in, in their place rational, sensible goals, which apparently are low, with this correction. Mr. Frieden. You spoke of bad values driving out the good. I wonder whether this isn't always Yes, but the question is, that may be so, but the question is whether the teaching on this subject is in order if it has this function. You see, let us assume 
for it's not in the Middle Ages. Here is the medieval universities with their scholastics and so on. They uh, surely had frequently the effect of mere routine rigidity yeah. and otherwise. Of but still, what they said about good and bad was of a high order. Only they were not able properly to transmit it. <coughs> the time of decay of scholastics. But here we have a science which is flourishing and uh, more prosperous from every worldly point of view, and yet has this function. I think that is a deeper uh, defect than mere ineffe inefficient, ineffectiveness. Yes? Well, you were sort of the time saying that uh, if, if rational, even a society of devils can reach the good, have we ever no, that is correct. Do you, I mean, is it, is, uh, on your basis, do you feel that a rational society is possible? Yeah, that is a uh, known question. But you asked me for my private... Well, you, well, you were saying the basis for the course, we just, or, or we'd be working on the basis of that such a society is possible? No. We, we, we will investigate its possibilities. And one question, for example, would be this. Is moral virtue, of which we will hear quite a bit from Aristotle, and a society in which the men of moral virtue are in control, is this a rational society? That depends very much on the status of moral virtue. And we have not yet advanced to this point. The point to which we advance is only this, as there is a an almost infinite variety of human ends, but some hope for order shown by the fact of subordination and supraordination of the arts procuring those ends. And this fact of subordination and subordination you see all the time. Mostly we don't observe it, but it was only very late, recently that I observed that there are two kinds of waitresses. Ones, the ones who merely clean the table and the others who bring the food. And it is quite reasonable. I checked this by asking the chairman of this department, who knows more about that, that it is quite reasonable because the one activity is higher than the other. The other is a purely preparatory, a negative one to clean the table. And the other is the one which leads to the fulfillment of your desire for which you go there. Yes. Now, yes. Is it not perhaps unfair that Plato speaks of uh, the Republic and of uh, speech of speech ideals, that the Republic speaks by its ideals? Is that not identifying, is that not identifying what Plato is talking about with uh, the ideals which the modern? Ideal is not a platonic word, and therefore one should avoid it in strict language. But in introductory presentation, one may take some free liberty. But the question, the more important point which you made, is that if we are easygoing, and say, let's call it, speak of ideals, the modern ideals are radically different from the Platonic Aristotelian ideal. That is the key point. That is one major part, perhaps the most important part, of the quarrel between the ancients and modern. And a sign of this difference is that in the classical scheme, political economy plays no role. Somehow not seriously considered, not not even the historian to series, so much admired because of his realism, says much to speak of about the connection between the Peloponnesian War and trade. That simply was not interesting. In modern times, it is regarded as very interesting. Some people regard it as most. So that has something to do with the status of food in the widest sense of the term 
and rather in Rava writings of scripture, with comparative self-preservation. Now I will ask Mr. Veregrin to be, begin at A16, if you can find that. It doesn't make any difference, he says, you know, whether the activities themselves... It does not matter whether the ends are operations themselves or something other than the operations as... Something at the side of the Williams, so to say, yeah. At the side of, yeah. Yes. As in the skills mentioned above. Yes, let's just stop here. Now, also states now explicitly that the hierarchic order exists both regarding the activities which have ends apart from the activities. Say, saddle making is not for its own sake, but for the production of something apart from the activity, at the side of the activity, saddle. And of those activities which have no ends apart from the activities, say, riding. But there is a complication here. Bodily exercise, of which riding is a part, does not produce a verb as shoemaking produces shoes. Yet bodily exercise is subservient to the medical art, which has a work outside of the practice of medicine, that work being health. This is a point made by Thomas Aquinas. But let us go on and read uh, further. Yes. If our actions have an end that we wish for itself, and if we wish other things for that end, and not each thing on account of another, for this to involve us in an infinite process, making our desire useless and in vain, then obviously that will be not only a good end, but a supreme end. So this will be the good and the best. And good, i.e., it will be the best. Now, what is here important is that this sentence begins with an if. And we must not forget that. The knowledge of you know, let us hear firstly, there must be ends chose for their own sake, as it says here. Desire cannot be empty and useless altogether, because desire, at least many of our desires, are natural. And what is natural is not empty and useless. That is Aristotle's assumption, which he doesn't speak about here. But, of course, even granting that there must be ends chosen for their own sake, this doesn't prove that there must be a single such end. I referred to, the, to health and wealth before. It is not sufficient to say that health is a greater good than wealth. For... A poor man, the breadwinner of a large family, it may be better to earn money than to get medical care for which he cannot pay. An example which Plato uses in the Republic, the fourth book, where he contrasts the posture of the sensible craftsman artist who says, I would rather be dead than be a burden on my family with a rich valetudinarian who invests all his efforts and all his money in living as long a time as possible. Now, let us here at this moment step back and look at the argument as a whole. The simple basis of Aristotle's pursuit in this book is the simple beginning of the, of the ethics. It's a bewildering variety of ends. Aristotle views that variety from the point of view of the variety of the art, of the rational endeavor to achieve or procure those ends. Now, the arts show a hierarchy, and therefore also a higher, there is a hierarchy of the ends. But is this sufficient? There are arts directed toward health and wealth, for example. But what about arts productive of honor and pleasure? Would they not also have to be considered? Why does Aristotle not speak of that here? Perhaps we can say honor is given, if it is rightly given, for services. 
and there is an order of rank of the services too. And so would this not, uh, would this not always come back to the point that there is a variety of ends, but also a hierarchy? As for pleasures, some of you have read Plato's Gorgias and know a distinction made there by Socrates. The distinction between arts and flattery, for example, cosmetics. Medicine is an art, makes a man healthy within the limits of the cosmos. But cosmetics creates only the appearance of health, and it's therefore a swindle. Uh, so that is called the flattery. So this kind of consideration would also have to come in. But let us now continue. A knowledge of this, therefore, would be a great help in human living. For like archers keeping their eye on the target, we will more likely attain our objective. This being the case, we must try to determine the general characteristics of this end and to which of the sciences or skills Study pertains. Yeah, that is sufficient. Aristotle, it is really a question in the original. Others, would it not be eminently helpful also with regard to life, i.e., in contradistinction to mere knowledge, to have a single end, a single target, so that we can decide in all cases? Which of the many ends has a priority? Would this not be wonderful? But for this purpose, we would have to know first what that target is, and the best, superior to all other good things. And second, which kind of human knowledge or faculty is competent to know it? Because if we don't have such a faculty or knowledge, then the existence of this end will always remain dubious. Let us assume, for argument's sake, that this best is known only to women's intuition. Prior to investigation, we cannot exclude that. And then it would be very hard for the male part of the human race and gynecocracy would be established, but we would be in a difficulty because a woman's intuition implies that the lady cannot give a reason, and therefore that could be. Uh, we are, the, we has not in any way decided the question, but he prepares now a decision by what he says. Yes? Undoubtedly to belong to the most truly architectonic science. This, to all appearances, is political science. Yeah. So Aristotle has given us an answer, whether it is satisfactory or not, we do not yet know, to this question, how we can know this best thing. Aristotle answers, as you see here, not the question of what the best thing is, but the question what knowledge or faculty is competent to know the best. Here again, he starts from the side not of the goods or ends, but from the side of the arts or knowledges. He qualifies his statement, as you have seen. It, it seems, it could seem to be that it is a matter for the most lordly and the most architectonic art. And as such, the political art political faculty comes to sight finite. This word which you use, which I don't say, comes to sight, tries to preserve the ambiguity of the Greek. It's not mere seeming. It may very well be the, the real, real stuff. It comes to sight as what it is. But there is a question also whether it is not mere appearance. Why is the political art the most lordly and the most architectonic of all the arts. That is read the secret. Economy and rhetoric fall under political science. Political science, in fact, makes use of other practical science, sciences, even legislating what is to be done and what is not to be done. Its end, therefore, embraces the ends of the other practical sciences. For these reasons, then, this end will be the good 
meaning the end of political science, the political art, the political ability is the human good and of no other art. No, no, that is to, to try to understand Aristotle's argument. Today, for example, what does it mean that all arts serve the political art? Today, physicists serving the government. Yeah? That's one example, a very topical example. So Aristotle gives two reasons. The political art determines which sciences ought to be or to exist in the city. That seems to be incompatible with academic freedom. But the question arises whether there is not under certain circumstances, the question doesn't arise, whether some arts or sciences are not dangerous to human society. Aristotle takes this for granted. And the second reason which he gives is that he takes the most respected of the arts, uh, and these are, according to him, the art of the general, that of the manager of the household, and the art of public speech. Now, these are highly respected arts, as we learn here from Aristotle. And all three of their practitioners admit that they are subject to the political art, if only because they are subject to the law. And the law is a work of the political art. Or is there any difficulty here? So, in other words, it, it is thinkable that there might be arts or faculties which are not, according to their own confession, subject to the political art. But the most respected and respectable are subject. Let us assume for one moment that there is an art of sophistry, and this art would deny its being subject to the political art. Think of the sophist, sophist as they appear in Plato as well. Well, but are they respected people? Not among the right kind of people. What is the question? Yeah, well, that is, a, a, such a, a, one, that is one of the deepest questions, absolutely deepest questions regarding the ethics. And it is of no use to give a dogmatic answer. Let us see what we do. But for the time being, we have learned merely this, that Aristotle asserts that the political art is the art which deals with the highest. Whether that is qualif unqualifiedly true or only what if I be true? He do not yet know. Now, what also, if he follows the drift of the argument, uh, does here is this, that there is an art in existence called the political art or science. The very existence of that thing is the most architectonic power of man, proves in a manner the existence of a single highest and you, you remember that you have on the one side the good thing, and the other side the art. Now, if the one side is pyramidal, culminating in the highest art, it is plausible to expect that there will be a similar pyramidality on the side of the good. That is not a proof, but it's leading up towards some expectation, and then we must see later on whether Aristotle can make it stick, what he here only suggests. Now, let us read the sequence. Even though it could be the same for one man and for the whole state, it seems... State means all right. Yeah, go on. For the whole city. city. Yeah. It seems much better and more perfect to procure and preserve the good of the whole city. It is admirable, indeed, it is admirable, indeed, to preserve the good of an individual, but it is still, but it is better still and more divine to do this for a nation and for cities. With such a good as 
the object of our inquiry, we may call our study political science. You know, that is not bad. Yeah, the enterprise, the inquiry, strives for these things, goes after these things. And our enterprise is a kind of political science, grave qualification. Corresponding th this kind of critique uh, to what Sukadev says in the Gorgias of it, that he says that he alone is the true politician in Athens. Now, the true politician, that is the same as not being a politician. Yeah. Uh, surely not an ordinary politician. And similarly, this political science which Aristotle exhibits in this book is, in a sense, it is political science, but only in one sense, in other words, it's not. Now, what the difference is, we must exactly <coughs> see. Now, as for the word city here, a polis in Greek, let us translate it by city all the time, and not by state, nor by city-state. And if someone is compelled to think of Wall Street or Threadneedle Street when he hears a city, then he must change his habits. That is not too much to other than that in mind. And uh, otherwise we will not really understand what Aristotle is talking about. There is no state there. State is a term which ar arises with Machiavelli or about that time. It didn't exist there. Uh, the Romans also didn't have the word for state. It's civitas, the collective of the citizens, which is fundamentally the same as polis. The point which we have to make is that the modern equivalent to what Aristotle or the Greeks altogether understood by polis is a country, and not the state. It's a country. I mean, i.e. not merely, uh, for example, also, the emotional uh, implications which the word, especially the country, has do not belong to the state. The state is, as Nietzsche said and President de Gaulle repeated, a cold monster. Only, I think, de Gaulle meant it as a compliment, but Nietzsche, uh, <laughs> what Nietzsche meant as, as I mean, shocking. But the country is nothing cold, and that is a police. That the police has something to do with the state, there is no doubt about it. But we should nevertheless uh, uh, get some more precise understanding of this difference. Now, the single highest status end is the human good. But why should it be the object of the political art? That could be questioned. We have here already a, an indication. Is the good the best, the same for the individual and for the city, perhaps that is not so. Then the highest art would not be called political art. Aristotle says they are identical, but there are so many qualifications that, uh, as you would see when, by reading the third and seventh book of the politics. Here, however, Aristotle assumes at the end of the tool is the same. To achieve and to preserve the human good for a nation or a city is more noble and more divine than do it for one man alone. Now, when Aristotle speaks here, you must not forget when he says here a kind of politics. And previously he had spoken of politics. There is also another point to consider. Formerly, he's, in the first case, he spoke of the art procuring and preserving the highest good. And that was the political art. But Aristotle speaks now of his work, of his political uh, or moral teaching, however you call it. And that is not simply political. It is political in a sense. Do you understand this difference? The legislator it takes the highest case. He elaborates a code for a given political community. He is politically active to the highest degree. But the teacher of legislators, 
surrounded by 10 or 12 young people who give promise of becoming legislator, he is not, as a teacher, politically active. He is a man in the classroom, in the study. It, therefore, in the Middle Ages, they made a distinction between the practical sciences proper, like politics, economics, and so on, and theoretical, theoretical practical sciences, the sciences which clarify the practical sciences, and therefore are at one remove away from the practical sciences. That is, I think, what I saw in mind. Now, he mentions here nation, in Greek, ethnos, and polis. What is the relation, or what is the order of rank of nation and polis? What would you say, according to Aristotle, from your knowledge, to the extent to which you have that? I, no, I respect that uh, you would think that the Yes, I think that is correct. But it is very interesting that Thomas Aquinas, in his commentary on this passage, says the nation is higher because it contains many cities. I think that is one of the few interesting deviations of Aris, of Thomas from his teacher, uh, Thomas. Aristotle and not all other classical writers use frequently the expressions the cities and the nations, polis kaetne. Then in this connection, this means almost the same as the Greeks and the barbarians, because the polis was more frequent among Greeks and the barbarians, most of the barbarians lived in tribes. Perhaps one should translate ethnos by tribe and not by nation, and not in order to avoid certain modern connotation. Yes. Now, I believe we have to leave it at this point. Is there anyone who has a question or objection which I can miss a feeling? I wonder whether I could ask about something you mentioned on Monday. Yes. When you spoke of... And Mark. that would be a gross misuse of authority, if I would say what I discussed on Monday will be discussed in class only on Monday and Monday. Yeah. Uh, insofar as you characterize modern science as being metaphysically neutral as compared with yeah. the ancient science, <laughs> is it not the case that in a certain way it, it supports materialism Idealism. Yeah, this is a point, you see, this is, they deny, and that was, a, that is an interesting question, because there was once a man called Lenin, of whom you have heard, and he was a materialist, and he said so. And then there were people who were surely not spiritualistic or idealistic, but positivist. One very famous man among them was and Smach, who wrote the history of mechanics, and this kind of people. And they said, and the school was called imperial criticism. Now they are called uh, positivists. And uh, Lenin wrote a fat book, although he was very active, as you know, doing things different than, than writing books. Uh, and he wrote this very fat book, and uh, that was the point that these people, these in modern positivists, interpreters of modern science, deny the materialistic character of modern science. And Lenin asserted it. And the, if you want to go back into the prehistory, one would have to study Kant's critique of pure reason, especially, in which it is shown that modern natural science is true only of the phenomenal world not of the human world, and therefore radically non-metaphysical. And the, metaphys the materialistic conclusions drawn from science are invalid. I, uh, it's, of course, a question whether I can decide or not, but uh, this is, uh, the, one can say, the official view that modern science is metaphysically neutral. And some of the admirers of modern science and some of its critics assert that it is not metaphysically neutral. 
There are people, for example, who say modern science originated in scholasticism in the 14th, 15th century. They may have heard of it. But insofar as materialism might be less than metaphysical in some cases. Yes, yeah, sure. Now then, if you take metaphysical in the older sense, then materialism is, of course, not metaphysical because it denies that there is anything beyond nature or behind nature. <coughs> Yeah but, today, yeah, but today the meaning of metaphysics has somewhat changed. And metaphysical means then any assertion about the whole not supportable by scientific evidence. From this point of view, Democritus' doctrine of the atom is as metaphysical as the greatest fancies of Plato. You know, and this you have to consider it. Yes. So you began by explaining that uh, the meaning of subordination of the several arts to the political science means something very different today than, than it is for Aristotle. That for the physicist who serves the government today, it means uh, something quite different from the, uh, the art of generalship or any other art serving with the science, or being under political science in our time, uh, you didn't exactly get through the information. I, I hope you forgive me if I say I am a bit tired now. Will you make a note of your question and let me have it in writing at the beginning of the next month? Thank you. So, then, let us remind us for a moment of the title of this course, The Moral Foundations of Politics. That we have been reminded of it, I think, by Aristotle himself, when he says that the true political man, uh, the true statesman, wishes to make the citizens good and subject and obedient to the laws. The emphasis on is on good because the laws, as we know, may be bad, and therefore to make them obedient to bad laws is perhaps not a great feat of statesmanship. Now, in order to see what the importance of this statement of Aristotle, we have to compare it not only with Machiavelli, as we occasionally did, but I read to you a passage from Locke. Locke says, quote, however strange it may seem, the lawmaker has nothing to do with moral virtues and vices, unquote. But he's limiting his function to the preservation of property. So that in his way, Locke is on the side of Machiavelli, i.e. not on the side of the angels. And Aristotle definitely is. <laughs> and this, I think, we should not entirely forget. Now, we begin to read the last chapter of the first book of the Ethics last time. I remind you of the context. The highest good is happiness of bliss. And here there is this uh, complication. The core of happiness is excellent activity of the soul. Yet happiness is venerable, an object of reverence, whereas the excellent activity of the soul is only praiseworthy, as we have seen. Happiness, in other words, is a blessing, whereas moral excellence, moral virtue especially, but also all virtue, is not a blessing. You take, um, as a simple case, you don't say X has something to be grateful for. He is an honest man, but uh, that is supposed to be his own work. There are certain complications here, as we know, on the basis of theology, but 
taking the simple common sense view, it is just something which is expected of everyone and not something for which he is syndicated. Now, after having explained this complicated uh, difficulty regarding happiness, Aristotle makes a natural transition to virtue, because virtue is, after all, the core of happiness. And we began to read this chapter, and I think we should continue where we left off, and that was 1102A12, if Mr. Panger will be so good. But if the study of goodness falls within the province of political science, it is clear that in investigating goodness, we shall be keeping to the plan which we adopted at the outset. So the study of virtue does not entirely depend on the result of Aristotle's definition of happiness. It is sufficient to start from the two accepted opinions, which are accepted without discussion. First, that the political art is the architectonic art. And second, that is the work of the true statesman to raise the moral level of society to its highest pitch. Given this, it follows that we must study virtue even without going, even if he would not fully agree with Aristotle's analysis of happiness. Yes. Um, Please. Why does Aristotle say if? Here now, if the study of goodness, is that just a logical if, or is there still some doubt? That if the study of goodness falls within the problem. No, but what he said, what he means by that, I believe, is this that he had said right at the beginning, in the first chapter, that there is a variety of ends and the variety of arts, but we see a highest art. The political art. And therefore, we can assume that there is also a highest end. That was the starting point. He did not start from the premise that there is a highest end, but he used it at a later point. Now, you know, uh, what Aristotle means here, it seems, is this. If is the, um, the investigation of virtue belongs to the political art, then our investigation is in perfect agreement with what we said right at the beginning. That I believe is it's better. Now? Now, the virtue that we have to consider is clearly human virtue. Since the good or happiness which we set out to seek was human good and human happiness. But human virtue means, in our view, excellence of soul, not excellence of body. Also, our definition of happiness is an activity of the soul. Yes. Now, this is only, seems to go without saying, but one should not take too much for granted. So, the investigation concerns the virtue of the human soul. First, of the soul, not of the body. That would be the matter for the physician or gymnastic trainer. And the virtue of the human soul, because conceivably there might be virtues of the souls of animals as well as of gods. This would not be the subject of political science, which is, deals emphatically with the human things, neither subhuman nor superhuman. Yes. Now, if this is so, clearly it behooves the statesman to have some acquaintance with things concerning the soul, just as the physician who is, who is to heal the eye or the other parts of the body must know their anatomy, and more so inasmuch as politics is more honorable and better than medicine. But physicians of the better class devote much attention to the study of the human body. Yes, now what does he mean by that? He makes a comparison first uh, in order to make this clear that the political man the statesman should be a knower of the human soul. 
that might be uh, seem to impose an unreasonable burden on him. Think of many famous statesmen who were very far from the theoretical man in any way. So he compares the political man with a physician, not with, with the healer of the body, not with the one who builds up the strength of the body, the gymnastic trainer. So therefore, traditionally, ethics and even philosophy was called the medicine of the soul which cures the soul rather than which makes it health, strong, in the first place. Curing presupposes a previous disease that is of some uh, importance. It is not necessary that the untrained or uh, man is rich, but the physician has a much higher status then the gymnastic trainer, this would be a reason why he would compare him to the, to the physician and not to the gymnastic trainer. After, you know, there is one reason why he should compare him to the, to the gymnastic trainer, as I stated before, because the first thing is to build up the human soul properly and not to cure it from the diseases which it has contracted. But the explanation is simple. The physician is a socially respected man, and the gymnastic trainer is not. This is the first one. But strangely, Aristotle compares the statesman not with the physician as such, but with the ophthalmologist, with the specialist. Why does he do that? Well, we, perhaps we can say that the statesman deals only with a part of the soul, just as the ophthalmologist deals only with a part of the body and nevertheless has to have some knowledge of the whole body. I believe this interpretation is confirmed by the sequel, that we are also explain that only a very limited knowledge of the soul is required of the statesman. Pardon? Yes. The student of politics, therefore, must study the yeah, soul. You see, be, he changes all the rest of the translation. Student of politics, statesman, that's all in Greek always the same word. The political one, literally translated. And meaning the man who possesses the political art. Yes. The statesman, therefore, must study the soul, though he will do so as an aid to politics, and only so far as is requisite for the objects of inquiry that he has in view. To pursue the subject in further detail would probably be more laborious than is necessary for his purpose. So in other words, that according to Aristotle, there is no need for scientific psychology. And you see the contrast with today immediately. But what Aristotle says, however, is in fundamental agreement with what Plato suggests. Do you remember where Plato speaks about this subject? In a rather well known work. Yes, what does he say there? And what is that? Uh, why is this not scientific psychology? Well, Plato speaks explicitly in the Republic somewhere of the fact that there is a longer way regarding the soul, uh, which will not be taken in this work. So that is, it is a provisional study of the soul sufficient for that purpose. The same is true of the psychology which Aristotle is now going to use and which would have to be rewritten uh, very radically in order to fit perfectly with the true or scientific teaching regarding the soul. Yes? Now on the subject 
some of the teaching current in exoteric discourses is satisfactory and may be adopted here. Namely, that the soul consists of two parts, one irrational and the other capable of reason. Now the word exoteric, uh, what that means is controversial. It may mean popular, not strictly academic, scientific, and it may mean external to the present study. Therefore, say, an ethical study would be exoteric to physics, and physical studies would be exoteric to ethics. It is impossible to decide in an individual passage what the word exoteric means. It, one could translate it by external, and understanding it in this ambiguity. External, meaning for people who are not in the inside, and meaning uh, uh, the subject matter is not inside. Yes. Whether these two parts are really distinct in the sense that the parts of the body or of any other divisible whole are distinct, or whether, though it's distinguishable in thought as two, they are inseparable by nature, like the convex and concave sides of a curve, makes no difference for the matter in hand. In other words, here we have an example. The precise meaning of parts here, a rational and an irrational part, is of no interest uh, for our present purpose. It's sufficient that they are distinguishable uh, um, from each other. Yes. Of the irrational part of the soul, again, one division appears to be common to all living things and of a vegetative nature. I refer to the part that causes nutrition and growth. For we must assume that a vital faculty of this nature exists in all things that assimilate nourishment, including embryos, the same faculty being present also in the fully developed organisms. This is more reasonable than to assume a different nutritive faculty in the latter. The excellence of this faculty, therefore, appears to be common to all animate things and not peculiar to man. For it is believed that this faculty, or part of the soul, is most active during sleep. But when they are asleep, you cannot tell a good man from a bad one. Whence the saying that for half their lives there is no difference between the happy and the miserable. This is a reasonable result, for sleep is a cessation of the soul from the activities on which its goodness or badness depends, except that in some small degree, Certain of the sense impressions may reach the soul during sleep, and consequently the dreams of the good are better than those of ordinary men. We need not, however, pursue this subject further, but may omit from consideration the nutritive part of the soul, since it exhibits no specifically human excellence. Yes. Now, there, he, he speaks now of a part of a part, I mean a part of the non-rational soul, the nutritive part, which is irrelevant as far as human virtue and vice is concerned, because that is not specifically human, and therefore specifically human goodness and badness cannot be found there. Take, uh, say, a man is not, be co not called a good man or a bad man with a view to his digestion, obviously. And we say he has a good digestion or bad digestion, but we do not say he's a good man or a bad man. And therefore, this is of no importance to uh, an ethical study. Yes? But there also appears to be another natural element in the soul, which, though irrational, yet in a manner participates in rational principles. In yes. self-restraint... Now, he had spoken of this before that there was such a part of the soul which is in between the rational and the irrational. He says, there he said, this part belongs to the rational part. But now he says that it is, belongs to the irrational one, but participating in reason. Now, this is a, a certain progress of the argument. 
the first and roughest statement is to effect, it's to the effect that it is rational, because it has something to do with it. The more refined statement is, it is not rational, but it has a certain nearness to reason, a nearness which will be explained in the sequel. The term which he uses is quite strange at first glance. He says there is some other nature of the soul which seems to be irrational. Now, nature has here the meaning rather of a kind of something, a kind or part of something natural, the natural being the soul, is a natural part of a natural being. Yes? In self-restrained and unrestrained people, we approve their principle, or the rational part of their souls, because it urges them <clears throat> in the right way and exhorts them to the best course. But their nature seems also to contain another element besides that of rational principle, which combats and resists that principle. Exactly the same thing may take place in the soul as occurs with the body in the case of paralysis. When the patient wills to move his limbs to the right, they swerve to the left. Similarly, in unrestrained persons, their impulses run counter to their principle. But whereas in the body we see the erratic member, in the case of the soul we do not see it. Nevertheless, it probably cannot be doubted that in the soul also there is an element beside that of principle, which opposes and runs counter to principle, though in what sense the two are distinct does not concern us here. But this second element also is seen, as we said, to participate in rational principle. At least in the self-restrained man it obeys the behest of principle and probably in the moderate and brave man it is still more amenable, for all of him is in harmony with reason. Yes. Now, Aristotle gives here a short proof that such a nature exists, and the proof is the phenomenon of continence and its opposite, incontinence. Continence and incontinence are a in to moderation and its opposite, but they are different. And the difference is that, as he alludes to it here, that the moderate man is, has no bad desires, whereas the continent man has bad desires, but controls them. And it is better to have no bad desires but being able to control them. That is at least Aristotle's premise. Now, uh, there is something in man that is proven by the fact of continence and incontinence. Because the incontinent man is also a man who knows that he should not say smoke, <coughs> and yet does. That's incontinence. And whereas a man who doesn't even have the urge to smoke is moderate. Now, so the, inc uh, the incontinent man has this conflict in himself, and this conflict shows uh, the, the a dualism of which he speaks. Reason is there, which tells him don't, and yet something else which rebels against reason, or which may obey reason. But the fact that it may obey reason shows that it has a kinship which the nutritive part lacks. I mean, digestion does not follow the commands, or growing does not follow the commands, but it cannot follow commands. But this part of which he speaks now he can, in principle, follow commands. It's just as the members of the body can obey the command of reason unless they are paralyzed. 
then of course not, but they can in themselves. But this paralysis is merely a primitive form of the healthy condition, and the healthy condition is obedience. The possible disobedience shows that it is not in itself rational, that it belongs to the irrational, but in the way that it can obey the reason, that it can participate in reason, but it is not in itself rational. We praise even the incontinent man, that is what Aristotle implies, in as much as he approves of the rational principle. In that respect, we say he knows at least that it is wrong. We blame him that he is unable to, to in fact, to obey it. Yes. Uh, now let us first finish, and then we may have to, to call, uh, call you in discussion. Yes? Thus we see that the irrational part is double. The vegetative part does not share in rational principle at all. The other, the seat of the appetites and of desire in general, does, in a sense, participate in principle, as being amenable and obedient to it, in the sense, in fact, in which we speak of paying heed yes, to one's... Obedient is too strong, able to obey it. Yeah. Uh, and able to o obey it. In the sense, in fact, in which we speak of paying heed to one's father and friend, not in the sense of the term rational in mathematics. Yes. Here you now he draws a conclusion regarding the bipartition of the irrational part of the soul. That part of the irrational which listens, uh, that's to say, which can listen to reason, listens to reason in the manner comparable to that in which we are said to listen to our father or our friends, as distinguished from our way in which we listen to a teacher of mathematics. Listening means here, listening to the father, as distinguished from the mathematician, means obeying, being considerate. Whereas in the case of mathematics, the mathematicians, the proper reason, the proper listening is understanding, and only understanding. Here, in this case, not understanding, but obeying, or maybe even disobeying, but the disobeying is <coughs> not possible unless there were the possibility of obedience. Therefore, they belong together. Yes? And that principle can, in a manner, appeal to the irrational part, is indicated by our practice of admonishing delinquents and by our employment of rebuke, of rebuke and exhortation generally. If, on the other hand, it be more correct to speak of the appetitive part of the soul also as rational, in that case, it is the rational part which is divided into two, the one division having rational principle in the proper sense and in itself, the other obedient to it as a child to its father. So Aristotle uh, repeats here what he says at the beginning. You see, Aristotle is in no way pedantic. He says, you, one may also say that the higher kind of the irrational is the lower kind of the rational. Yeah? As he had said at the beginning. You don't understand that? You have a clearly irrational part, the vegetative part, say that And then you have a clearly irrational part, which has a reason in itself, say, uh, it's a scientific reason. And then there is one in between, which is capable of listening to reason, but does not have the reason in itself. And therefore, you can say, with a view to its capability of listening to reason, that it is rational. But you can also say, with a view to the fact that it does not have the reason in itself, it is irrational. Is that clear? No. Yeah. I see. Good. And uh, 
Yes. Now, virtue also is differentiated in correspondence with this division. Some forms of virtue we call intellectual virtue, others moral virtue. Wisdom and intelligence and prudence are intellectual. Liberality and moderation are moral virtue. When describing a man's moral character, we do not say that he is wise or intelligent, but gentle or moderate. But a wise man also is praised for his disposition, and praiseworthy dispositions we term virtues. Yes. Now, here he makes a crucial distinction, and then he, which is based on the distinction of the parts of the soul. The distinction of the rational part of the soul into one which is rational in itself and another which is rational because it is capable of listening to reason underlies the distinction between dianoetic or intellectual virtues and ethical virtues. The dianoetic virtues are the perfections of the in intellect in various respects. They are, Aristotle so discusses them at length in Book 6. And then there are other virtues which are excellences of the part obeying, to, obeying reason, but not rational itself, and these are the ethical virtues. I can, I, the distinction is very obvious, although it may, uh, one need not know the technical terms. I remember a remark about Perry Mason, that he was, has a sharp like a steel trap and clean like a hound's tooth. That is the distinction, because a man can have a very sharp mind, and that is only admirable. But it is not a guarantee of his morality, his integrity. And uh, the other one, well, he can have, uh, be a man of perfect integrity, and yet he does not have to have a sharp mind for that. So these are, are two different considerations. And yes, what did you want to say? Would, would there be any distinction between uh, the irrational part of the soul, which is capable, of course, able to listen to, to reason, uh, and that part of an animal soul, in the higher animal, which is likewise capable of uh, listening to something that human instructor, or being trained to certain Yeah, but still, the, you, that is, there is also a difference in the world between an education by carrot and stick only, and an education by speech, you know? I mean, the color and stick means no reason is needed, no thought of consequence. But in the case of man, you can explain him. Even if you explain to him, if you act in this and this way, you will get the color, and if you act in the other way, you will get the stick, you can explain it to him. He doesn't have to feed it immediately. Please. Therefore, the brutes have no ethical virtues. They may have analogies to ethical virtues. We speak of a gender dog and a savage dog, for example, and, all, and uh, apply other ethical terms to animals. But this is not, strictly speaking, correct. Well, it, it seems in a way that um, this middle form of the soul, this middle part of the soul, is, 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 in, is in a certain sense most characteristic of, of man rather than the, the rational part. And I mean that, I mean it sounds silly in that point. But I'm, talking, yes. I'm thinking of Aristotle's view of man as the in between the sense. Yes, yes, one can say that. And therefore, the whole investigation here in the politics is called by Aristotle the investigation regarding human things. The mere, the, the, the purely intellectual is also, is in itself superhuman. But the moral virtues are specifically human. He denies at the end of the book that the gods 
can have moral virtue because they do not have that part which has to be controlled and trained by reason. Yes, that is correct. Now, there is another point. Yes. Um, I'm going to ask a question related to the last question. In what sense is moral view clear enough to attempt to the comfort of God? And analogously to the third part of the soul, which is capable of obeying reason. Uh, so when it obeys the Father's Very simply, uh, what does it mean to obey one's father? The father says something. Yeah? Do this, don't do that. That's the logos. And you must understand the logos. At least, uh, I mean, first of all, you must understand that this and this is the thing which you should do or should not do. And secondly, the father probably will in many cases give a reason, lovers, in the other sense, why it is good for you to do it. All these things, uh, I mean, this twofold speech, discourse, reason. It's, it's, in the sense that it admits of love, uh, that's really, um, it seems that to me, we decide is that it, it, you wouldn't, you would say it would be on the side of, rash, of the rational instead of the irrational. In the sense of partake of persuasion or the give and take that takes place in speech. Yeah, well, is an example which Plato likes, how one, taken from some verses of Homer, how you can talk to your passion, yes. to your anger, for example. And uh, that means it is persuadable. And therefore, it, it is capable of listening to reason, and therefore, it is not irrational simply. But on the other hand, that someone, something else in you must talk to it. The anger doesn't persuade itself to cease to be angry, but reason tells him to cease shows that it is not simply rational. Yes? Is it fair to say that Aristotle did not consider the possibility of the perversion of the highest part of the soul, the perversion of reason? Of course. Now, but then he, that would be very bad if he had not, not done that. And he would be of no interest. I mean, there were, a, well, take, uh, there were so many great examples of people who perverted their reason, their very powerful intellectual qualities, think men like Alcibiades. From Aristotle's point of view, perhaps also Philip of Macedon and Alexander the Great. So he knew that. He speaks less about it uh, than Plato does, but uh, he surely knew that. The sophists were in a sense such people. Yeah. Yet, how, how does a scheme of the soul, such as he has over here, uh, how does that take into account the possibility of perversion of reason? Because if reason speaks to, speaks to the passions and, and persuades the passions, not might, not, might not a perverted man's reason uh, sure. counsel the passions along quite sure, a bit? Well, there the is no doubt about that, that it could. But then ethics has no uh, ethics has no meaning apart from right reason. Yes, but uh, uh, reason can, can of course be a perverted, and it is perverted when it is in the service of something irrational. And for someone's desire for glory, for uh, 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 making a splash in the world. And may, of course, uh, uh, pervert his reason very easily. So, virtue so, is mean so ethics is meaningless unless understood in the context of right reason. Yes, sure. Reason can be perverted. There is no doubt about that. But what Aristotle has in mind that reason in its highest form, theoretical reason, 
in the case of someone who is really, who really understands, it will not be pleasant. I mean, someone who has truly tasted it. Someone may have seen that it gives a man great advantages over others if certain parts of his intellectual faculties are developed. But then he would, of course, only think of the advantages which he derives from his theoretic training and not be, uh, not follow the inner demands of the theoretical mind itself. No, I, I think Aristotle would say that uh, the perversion is possible only in more or less Im, uh, imperfectly theoretical man. And uh, Plato seems to have felt the same view, because such a man like Protagoras, for example, when you read the dialogue of Protagoras, should he have a, a good mind? But when you, when you observe him in this uh, dialogue, you see the main concern with him is to make a very good impression. And that is, of course, fatal. And you cease to be, quote, objective, and become concerned with yourself. And that is ruinous. Even if it has a more amiable form of shyness, yeah. that the man is concerned with himself, that he might embarrass others by speaking up, even that is bad. And no, it is amiable. Whereas the other is not amiable. Does it make sense? Yes, sir. So the full dedication of the, to the truth, that's the point, for both people. Mr. Strunsky? When Aristotle says that all men by nature desire to know, yes, yeah. the highest part of their reason, the best possible, yeah. so that's not a, simply not a desire that stems from this middle part of the center. Oh, no. No, that is it, 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 the most, simple and crude form is curiosity, ordinary curiosity. Some, uh, there are people who, when they see something happens on the road, let's say a bicyclist, um, a bicycle doesn't function, and some, uh, they stand and, and steer at it, they find it, find it very interesting. And everything which is out of the ordinary attracts our attention. I mean, good or bad, high or low, doesn't make any difference. But even that, that we want to see, that we are interested in the novel as novel, is something which distinguishes us from the brutes. And Aristotle only tries to show that if we follow the inner logic, if I may say so, of this simple curiosity, we are eventually led to the highest form of human activity, I mean, to the highest form of the desire for knowledge, which has no longer anything to do with curiosity, but is, nevertheless, there is some kinship between the two. Yes. But in terms of this tripartite theme of the soul, would one say that the activity of the, of the highest part simply by itself is curiosity leads to knowledge, or is it something? Uh, no, of it would be. Well? Yeah, but it would be. Well, it, that, is a, yeah, that, is, that is a very deep question which, of which I still say is very little. What's the relation of desire and knowledge altogether? Is there not a desire presupposed or, or inherent in knowledge insofar as it, knowledge is acquired on the basis of a previous desire for knowledge? Of course he assumes that as the first sense of the metaphysics shows. And in Plato the same uh, uh, question is raised in the relation of the Platonic language of arrows to knowledge or science. But that is not the theme with which Aristotle is the ethics is concerned. There is one point, one second, one point which I, we must not forget. Here we have heard, I believe for the first time, the word ethical in Aristotle's work. 
And this is, this is the first ethics in existence. Now, ethics is derived from ethos, a word now very, very common in sociology among other disciplines. Ethos means character. And uh, the primary subject of the ethics is character, i.e. good and bad character, noble and base character. And since there are a variety of such characters, we should rather use a plural, noble and base character. And now I'm sitting there. Yes, um, at the very end, Aristotle uh, reconsiders for us to the possibility that, that the rational part of the soul is really divided into two parts. And I wonder what, what the significance of that would be, especially in a comparison with Plato's is that closer to Plato's scheme of the soul? Which one? The second possibility that the appetitive part of the soul is considered to be rational rather than simply a kindred. I could not answer your question. It is a sensible question, but I could not answer it. Because the relation of the appetitive and the cognitive is very complex in Plato, for the reason I indicated. But uh, can I ask a slightly different yeah. question? Uh, in what sense does the stigma play a role here in this Not, Not at all. Not at all? No. And they belong, uh, he will speak later on, very shortly after, of the distinction between the desire, uh, the appetitive, and the spirited part, or the irascible part, as Aristotle would call it. He speaks of it. But for uh, the distinction between these lower parts and the Russian part is much more important for both Aristotle and Plato than the, the distinction between the irascible and the appetitive or concupiscible. Did you, did you make myself clear? I mean, the distinction between uh, the, the irascible or uh, the spirited part and the co uh, concupiscible or appetitive part is less important, I repeat that, for both Plato and Aristotle than the, the distinction between both on the one hand and the rational part on the other. Well, that's, that's, it seems this possibility here that is just mentioned is precisely the possibility which makes the distinction altogether unclear again insofar as the appetitive part it might be considered to be rational, strictly speaking. Rational. It is not strictly speaking rational. From, I mean, if you use it in this sense, then it is, it, uh, then both Plato and Aristotle would say, without the light of the intellect, they, they, all, they both need the light of the intellect in every form, in, on every level. And to that extent, clearly, uh, the appetitive or spirit it is below the intellect. But the, it seems here that the implication is that the two are always together at, in man and in any group. Yeah, but the question is how are they together on the highest level? I mean, in the case of moral virtues, that is, has been sufficiently illustrated and will become very clear in the sequel. But the question is how is it on the highest level? What is the relation between the oryx is the desire for knowledge, the arrows for, for wisdom, and the insight as insight. Do they not mutually fructify each other as it were? That is the question which is harder to answer. So then we have now completed our joint study of the first book, and I think without further ceremony we will turn to book two. Virtue being, as we have seen, of two kinds, intellectual and moral. Intellectual virtue is for the most part both produced and increased by instruction, and therefore requires experience and time, whereas moral or ethical virtue is the product of habit, he thought, and has indeed derived its name with a slight variation of claim from that word. Now, this is Aristotle's etymology, which seems to be correct, 
said ethos, long E, T-H-O-S, comes from the Greek word ethos, short E, T-H-O-S, and ethos means habituation. Ethos is something which comes about through habituation and therefore, of course, through time. Yet Aristotle says the intellectual or the anoetic virtues need experience and time. Does ethical virtue not need this? I think what Aristotle means is this. Even the intellectual virtues need experience and time in order to be acquired. Also more so, where it is quite obvious, the ethical virtues. We have read a remark to the effect that young people are not able to act perfectly because of their youth, which means time and experience are needed for acquiring ethical virtue. Does he translate moral or ethical? Yes. Well, I see. That, that is, of course, very confusing, because moral is simply the Latin word for the Latin translation for ethical. There's no, there's no distinction. I think I mentioned before the present-day distinction used in this country between the, or the unethical pharmacist and the immoral woman is that's present-day American uh, language, not uh, original. Both would be called unethical by the Greeks and immoral by the Latins. Yeah. And I think also by English-speaking people in former times. Yes. And therefore it is clear that none of the moral virtues in, is engendered in us by nature, for nothing existing by nature can be altered by habit. For instance, it is the nature of a stone to move downwards, and it cannot be trained to move upwards, even though you should try to train it to do so by throwing it up into the air 10,000 times. Mm. Nor can fire be trained to move downwards, nor can anything else that naturally behaves in one way be trained into a habit of behaving in another way. The virtues, now, let us first understand that, is because it's not quite uh, clear. Because ethical virtues arise through habituation, they are not in us by nature. And the reason is this. In the emergence of ethical virtue, we become habituated to act differently than we did before. But what is natural cannot be changed by habituation. And therefore, is that there is, uh, the ethical virtues and their bases are not simply natural. Yes. The virtues, therefore, are engendered in us neither by nature nor yet against nature. Nature gives us the capacity to receive them, and this capacity is brought to maturity by habit. Yes, true. Perfection would perhaps be a more literal translation. Now, how does Aristotle know that the ethical virtues are not against nature? After all, you, why you cannot change the, uh, the falling of the stone? There are not other natural uh, things which can be affected uh, by habituation. And uh, why does Aristotle know that the ethical virtues are not against nature, that violence is done to us? There are many doctrines, especially in our time, uh, which regard at least some of the moral virtues as against nature. And there is a book by Freud about civilization. What is the full title? Civilization is this yeah, there is this almost suggestion that civilization is against nature. Now, how does Aristotle know that this is not the case? Answer, because he knows that the moral virtues complete man, perfect man. Against nature means against the grain. And it's not against our grain that we should be moderate, just, brave, etc., we possess by nature the ability to acquire 
moral virtue. We do not possess by nature the power to act virtuously. That must be, this power must be acquired. Man has a certain latitude of flexibility, which is as natural to him as fixedness is, say, to the stone. You cannot transform a beagle puppy into a Saint Bernard puppy, but you can make it housebroken. And that is still more true on the human level. Yes. Moreover, the faculties given us by nature are bestowed on us first in a potential form. We exhibit their actual exercise afterwards. This is clearly so with our senses. We did not acquire the faculty of sight or hearing by repeatedly seeing or repeatedly listening, but the other way around. Because we had the senses, we began to use them. We did not get them by using them. The virtues, on the other hand, we acquire by first having actually practiced them, just as we do the other arts. The art, say the art, such as, I think, a slight misunderstanding of the Greek word. We learn an art or craft by doing the things that we shall have to do when we have learned it. For instance, men become builders by building houses, harpers by playing on the harp. Similarly, we become just by doing just acts, moderate by doing moderate acts, brave by doing brave acts. Yes, please. So we, here also gives a second reason. One must always watch that, and the word which he normally uses is in Greek the word eti, which we can translate by furthermore or besides. I would translate it always in the same way, so in order not to create the impression that there is a variety in Aristotle which is not there. And that is Carissa also. Furthermore, furthermore, furthermore. And look around. Here that proves it. Here something that proves it. Here something that proves it. That is so characteristic of, uh, of Aristotle, more than of him than of any other philosopher. Now, in the things which we have by nature, the potency precedes the act, if we use the highfalutin language of metaphysics. But, for example, we have the capacity to see before we see. We have the capacity to hear before we actually hear. In the other things which we do not have by nature, namely the virtues on the one hand and the arts on the other, the acts precede the points. This is a paradoxical statement, but perfectly in accordance with observed facts, as you can see. Take the uh, a simple uh, art, shoemaker. The apprentice, in the moment he becomes an apprentice, simply cannot make shoes. And he acquires the capacity to make shoes through his apprenticeship. He acquires the potency by, in a, by making shoes. Of course, first, in a very subordinate manner, he will probably have to sweep, clean, the, shoe, the workshop and things which are only very indirectly related to the making of shoes, but then gradually will also do some things more closely related to the center of shoemaking, and eventually he will have learned to make shoes. But he did make shoes to, in different degrees. Uh, he made shoes and contributed to the making of shoes, before even he had acquired uh, the capacity. Yes, and here is the crucial importance of the term used by Alison here, the activities, as, it, as I believe he translates in Greek, energia, the, the activities. You see, we, we have a certain general notion like activities or motions without making this fundamental distinction by which the Aristotelian teaching stands and falls. The completed activity, say, uh, the actual making of shoes, is distinguished from the acquisition of that capacity, which is a becoming, a coming into being. The actual shoemaking is not a coming into being, it is a coming into being of the shoe but not a com come into being of the activity of making shoes. Is this clear? Uh, everything depends on that. Now, in the case of, if we apply this to moral virtue, ethical virtue, what the apprentices do, 
in the I mean, young people is not yet moral. But it is an acquisition of morality. So that they later on will act morally. There is a little point to which I should draw your attention, and that is when he speaks here, the virtues we acquire by having practiced them previously, just as we do in the arts, or as men do in the arts. But what we must do after learned, after having learned, this we learn by doing it. As house builders become house builders, as men become house builders by house building, and cithara players by playing the cithara. In the same way, by doing just things, we become just. When he speaks of justice, he uses the we. When he speaks of house building, he says they, because Aristotle himself would never think of becoming a house builder but very much of the common just. This is a little bit a uh, characteristic point. Yes. Aristotle now does not give an additional reason, but he gives an additional illustration of the same thing. It's a secret. Yes. This truth is attested by the experience of cities. Lawgivers make the citizens good by training them in habits of right action. This is the aim of all legislation. And if it fails to do this, it is a failure. This is what distinguishes a good regime from a bad one. Yes, no, that is uh, a sign that uh, that virtue comes through habituation. Every legislator thinks in terms of such a habituation, and therefore, no, that is unlikely that all legislators are radically mistaken regarding the most fundamental part of their class. Here he makes a distinction between, or refers to a distinction between legislation and regime. This is also something crucial for Aristotle, although he does not speak of it here. That is one of, in a way, the most important theme of the politics. For Aristotle, laws, codes, are never the fundamental political fact. Every, all codes are the work of a legislator. The legislator doesn't have to be merely an individual. It can also be a group. But the legislator, the man or body of men, who can make and unmake the laws, are for this reason not subject to the laws. Qua legislators. They will be subject to laws as far as they are citizens. That's not a matter. Now, so the legislative activity, activity which causes the laws which is prior to the laws, is nevertheless not an undetermined sovereign power in the sense of thought, but it depends on the character of the ruling part of the society. So, the, in other words, to take the simplest examples, a legislator or legislative body will be either democratic or oligarchic, or tyrannical, or whatever. And therefore the laws will be either democratic, or oligarchic, or tyrannical. The, this, the character of the regime, accounts for the character of the laws, which every regime sets up with a view to what it regards as most important. It does not necessarily mean that every regime sets up the laws with a view to its own interest, although it may mean that. But the most important point is that it sets up the laws with a view to what it regards as the highest and most authoritative. And so it refers to here this, uh, to this point here in passing. So we have some, in one sense, we have, it is easy for us to understand that because the whole notion of rule of law has no longer the evidence which it possessed in former times, because we are more aware than the 19th century was that rule of laws should mean rule of good or just laws. And therefore, the rule of law simply is not, uh, one can still make a case for the rule of laws as laws, but it is unsatisfactory if it is not a case for good or just laws. 
I think we sent this more strongly than people did prior to the First World War. Yes, now let us go on. Again, the actions from or through which any virtue is You see, what he translates here by again is the same Greek word, furthermore, eti, and uh, which one must keep in mind to see that it's really an enumeration of reasons. And uh, it is of some importance to see that in order to see what is the context in which a given statement appears, a statement which might be particularly evident and striking, and yet uh, is not necessarily the purpose for which the whole thing is made, but only a, a context. And in order to establish what the context is, we must observe this partition. Now begin again, Mr. Panga. Again, the actions from or through which any virtue is produced are the same as those through which it also is destroyed, just as is the case with skill in the arts, for both the good harpers and the bad ones are produced by harping, and similarly with builders and all the other craftsmen. As you will become a good builder from building well, so you will become a bad one from building badly. Yeah, he uses the third person here. You see, the translator is not aware of the niceties of other sort of stuff. Yeah. Were this not so, there would be no need for teachers of the arts, but everybody would be born a good or bad craftsman, as the case might be. The same, then, is true of the virtues. It is by taking part in transactions with our fellow men that some of us become just... We, yeah. We now, again. Yeah. Yeah. And others unjust. Yes. Yeah. By acting in dangerous situations and forming a habit of fear or of confidence, we become courageous or cowardly. And the same holds good of our dispositions with regard to the appetites and anger. Some men become moderate and gentle, others profligate and irascible, by actually comporting themselves in one way or the other in relation to those passions. In a word, our moral dispositions are formed as a result of the corresponding activities. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, yes, there is stop here. So here he gives his third reason why virtue does not arise by nature. That is still the point. If it were to arise by nature, then all men would become either good or bad, or middling, whatever they get to be. But since they become either good or bad or middling, some good, some bad, some middling, it, this is not simply natural. Aristotle disregards here entirely a complication, which is caused by the fact that there are what he calls later on natural virtues, meaning that some men are born with a disposition toward courage and others with a disposition toward cowardice and so on. And that is too complicated for this still from introductory consideration. Yes? Hence, it is incumbent on us to control the character of our activities. Yeah, but to make the activities, activities of a certain kind. It means, of course, of a good kind. Yes? Since on the quality of these depends the quality of our dispositions, it is therefore not of small moment whether we are trained from childhood in one set of habits or another. On the contrary, it is of very great importance, or rather of supreme importance. Everything, de everything depends on the quality of the activities we engage in from our very childhood, from our earliest childhood on. That is another final conclusion from the fact that virtue arises through habituation. Therefore, let us be watchful from the very beginning how we habituate our children or ourselves. That's necessary. Good. Now, um, is there any point needing discussion, in your opinion? If this is not the case, then we... Oh, Mr. Finn. I, I, I think there's a difficulty which Aristotle recognizes and perhaps even allows for, in that not everyone who does what appears to be a just action is necessarily just. But if you were being trained or habituated to justice, uh, I suppose there are people that consider that a, a, you know, an outwardly just act to be the kind of act that would lead him to the higher or the yeah. justice. Yes, that's what he means. That is what he will make uh, clear to the meanest capacity in the secret, because it is very explicit here, this man. But he takes his time, he goes step by step. Surely, as they what a small child does, is not, cannot be described as a perfectly virtuous act. And even many acts of 
Mature human beings cannot be described as perfectly virtuous, but only as externally virtuous. But they are, as it were, the entrance of the antichamber of the virtuous acts proper. In a certain sense, then, the capacity does precede the actual no, exercise no, of it. No. And the, the, at a certain moment, there is a change over from the coming into being to the actual practice, to the energy. That is right. He will take some time out. Mr. Fleming? When Aristotle said that uh, none of the things that are by nature uh, can be habituated otherwise, is that supposed to be simply true, or is that just kind of a general <coughs> I think, for example, cases like uh, certain religious ascetics uh, always go around on their hands and knees, and they presumably become used to this. Yet, does that mean that walking upright is natural? And there are other things. Well, it is not, uh, but they, they do not deny and do not mean to deny that the activity that man is an upright, right, uh, meant for upright walk. I mean, yeah. I don't... But... Uh, or, or what to what do you mean? Well, as there are states that if you took that one formulation completely seriously, that would mean that any kind of behavior which could be possibly altered through habit couldn't be natural. No, no, well, there are very similar examples, like somebody, someone um, that tries uh, to reduce his food input to the bare minimum. You couldn't say that this bare minimum is the only natural thing. Actually, I also would not say that. It is a general statement. And he takes the most simple cases, like from his point of view, like those of the elements, uh, heavy stones or light ones, and they cannot be changed by habituation. Subhuman, subliving. You want to see? Yes. I I did not quite understand you, and that is partly due to the fact that my hearing is not perfect. Now, I. Did you refer to the natural virtues? No. Then I'm misunderstood. Uh, the moral virtues. Yeah. As, as versus the intellectual virtues. That is, the man, the, the man who is intellectually virtuous need not necessarily be morally virtuous. But on the other hand, how would a man of intellectual virtues also relate to uh, his excellence in action if he was not morally virtuous? Yeah, but in action he has to be morally virtuous, because that is not the sphere of the intellectual uh, activity, and of the intellectual virtues. But the other way around, Aristotle does not speak explicitly about this whole question. That is very also another characteristic of Aristotle. Aristotle can be, and is most of the time, very clear and very explicit. And yet, as you see at once, if you look at an account of the medieval discussions of which interpretation of Aristotle is correct, say the Thomistic or the Averroistic one, and if you look up then the Aristotelian passages, there are few pages in all his works on which everything else depends, and they are very short and very uh, laconic. There is one example in this book of special importance which we shall discuss later, and that is a pa one page on natural right. That's all. It's one of the most difficult passages in the whole book. Now, similarly, the question is intellect, is moral virtue a prerequisite of intellectual virtue? You do not find an, an unambiguous statement of Aristotle, either affirming or denying it. That is a difficulty. But so we have to use our own uh, minds in order to solve it. And when he speaks of in, 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 uh, at the end of the book, where he speaks about the superiority of the theoretical life to the practical life, he says of the gods who are presumed to be by him to be, su of course, superior to men, superhuman, they don't need for moral virtues, and they 
are, of course, beings uh, capable of contemplation. Uh, for example, they don't need justice because they are not just, because they don't need justice, because they don't make any transactions. They have, or they have no desires uh, for goods which cannot be shared. Uh, and it's the same, they have no courage, not because they are cowards, uh, but because they are not concerned with self and so on and so on. Uh, so that is a very long question, and uh, one, we, perhaps we find some evidence uh, while we go which permits us to decide it. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, who knew Aristotle very well, simply teaches that the intellectual work In moral virtue, with one exception, and that is practical wisdom. Practical wisdom, prudence, promises in Greek, that is, cannot be acquired without the simultaneous acquisition of moral virtue. But this is what Aristotle himself says in the sixth book of the Ethics. But the other things, wisdom especially, theoretical wisdom, can be acquired without moral virtue. But Common sense seems to speak for it up to a point. A man can be a very great thinker or scholar, it seems, without having moral virtue. But in the moment we say that, we say, is it really true? A, a, a specialist, of course, I mean, that is possible. Men may have a very sharp mathematical mind and so on, and, and can be wholly irresponsible in his an intellectual virtue much lower than theoretical wisdom, which are quite strange for us, and where we have to make a certain effort to um, see what Aristotle means. I suggest that we postpone this discussion of this question. Yes? Is there a sort of distinction between the law and the law and the law and the law and the law from a political man, a legislator who was day by day. In the system, especially by Thomas Aquinas, but and by his successor. And the point is, this is what they, they distinguish the whole between practical science and I think they call them theoretically practical, meaning practical as a remove what the, the, the science of legislation is practiced by the actual legislator. But there is a science of legislation taught by a teacher of legislators who is himself not necessarily a legislator. This would be on a higher level. Now, here perhaps we can discuss this, for example, for one moment. The legislator must be a man of great integrity. Otherwise, he will be swayed by sympathies or antipathies which make him partial, and uh, he must not be bribable, and so on and so on. But what about the teacher of legislators? In his case, it is not so necessary because he is not exposed himself to the temptations to which the legislator is exposed. This might be of some, is certainly relevant to the question which you raised. Now, shall we read a bit more? And then our present study is not for the sake of observing like the others, for we are not investigating virtue for the sake of knowing what it is, but in order that we may become good, without which result our investigation would be of no use. We have, consequently, to carry our inquiry into the region of conduct and to ask how we are to act rightly. So let us stop here for a moment. You know, the present inquiry is not for the sake of theoria, of contemplation, as the other uh, pursuits are, say, of the mathematician, of physicist, and so on. For we make our inquiry not in order to know what is virtue, but so that we will become good. For if this, were, if, if this were not the result of our inquiry, our inquiry would be useless. Yes, now this is directed against 
the Socratic view, at least against the way in which the Socratic view is frequently presented, and in particular presented by Aristotle himself. I will give you one example from another version of the ethics called the Eudemian Ethics, 1216b3. Now, accordingly, Socrates thought that the end is to get to know virtue. And he pursued and he investigated what is justice and what is courage and every uh, of the other part, every other part of virtue. And this was reasonable for him, since he thought that all virtues are forms of knowledge. So that knowing justice and being justice, we are architects and geometricians. And correspondingly, as soon as we know what virtue is, we are virtuous. Now this is at least the way in which Socrates appeared to quite a few men, Aristotle one of them. And this is what Aristotle denies. And therefore, the study, we, we do not become virtuous by knowing what virtue is. Here Socrates, Aristotle simply says what Common sense dictates to say, and the paradoxical statement is not Aristotle's, but Socrates. What Socrates meant by it, that's a long question for which we don't have the time here. But it is um, sufficient to have and uh, make this observation. Now, since it's the case, since we study virtue, not for the sake of knowledge, but for the sake of becoming virtues, therefore we must first turn above all to the action and see how these actions have to be performed. That is the point. Whereas for Socrates uh, was apparently concerned much more with the definition of justice and the other virtues than with doing the actions. Yes. Since our actions, as we have said, determine the quality of our dispositions. Now, yeah. to act in conformity with right principle is common ground and may be assumed as the basis of our discussion. We shall speak about this later and consider both what right principle is and its relation to the other virtues. But let it be accepted to begin with that the whole discussion of conduct is bound to be an outline only and not exact in accordance with the rule we laid down at the beginning, that discussions must only be required to correspond to their subject matter. And matters of conduct and expediency have nothing fixed or invariable about them any more than have matters of health. Okay, let us stop here, and I think we must stop here altogether. Now, he will then turn to the actions. How should we act? How must we act in order to become good or to remain good? Now, he says the actions by which we become good must be kataton or ton logon, according to the right reason, if we translate it traditionally, according to right reason, which is better than his translation. One could slightly improve on it, saying, according to right reason, mean all human actions in order to be good must be in accordance with some reason, with some account to be given, explicit or explicit, explicit or implicit. One can even say all bad actions also have some reason. The bad actions are justified by an incorrect reasoning. The good actions are justified by a correct reasoning. But there is always some reasoning, explicit or implicit, present. Now, there is a correct reasoning, of course, also in other fields. For example, the reasoning which a carpenter has when he tells you why he made the chair in this manner and not in that. The characteristic of the correct account regarding objects of human action is that there is no stability possible in this sphere. There are no general rules without exception there, as little as in the sphere of health, as Aristotle says for the time being. Now, and therefore, uh, we must first see, this is the beginning of the argument, what kind of account can reasonably be expected
expected of our actions? Can it be given in terms of universal rules, universally valid rules, or can the most, uh, what the, is the most that can be expected, an account in terms of general rules, which admit of exceptions, and the proof that the case for ex exception, exception is not given here now. Now we will take this up next time. Aristotle ex continues this statement about the limited uh, certainty we can expect in this sphere, and yet he goes on. Nevertheless, we must try to spell out what can be said about how virtue is acquired in general terms. And the first thing which strikes him and which leads soon to the core of his view of virtue is that distinguish in our actions excessive actions, deficient actions, and actions which are in the mean. And the actions in the mean are, generally speaking, the correct ones. And that leads then eventually to the definition of virtue as a mean between two faulty extremes. You have some difficulty in hearing, you know, sir. So then we will uh, continue this uh, on Wednesday. There was someone else who wanted to hand in a paper today. Oh, yeah. The two distinctions is more important that between Machiavelli and the Machiavellians or that between ancient and modern, between this book. According to a very common view, Modernity, the reality of modernity is indicated by its origin, namely its Christian origin. Modernity is secularized Christianity, uh, extremely heretical Christianity, but still of Christian origin. We must say that is quite clear. Now, regardless of whether this explanation is correct or not, we cannot disregard when trying to understand Aristotle's ethics, the teaching of the Bible concerning human conduct and the source of the right thing. The main point, which you all know, love of man, and God is the loving God. God is love itself. This we must never forget when reading Aristotle, because then we find an entirely different account from the biblical account. And if we do not try to understand this profound difference, perhaps the most important of all differences, we will unconsciously carry into Aristotle the views which are closest to us and which, in a way, are the ones in which we have been brought up. And it's the older one, of course. Now let us now turn to our text. And remind you of a point which came up at the conclusion of the last meeting. And when Aristotle speaks here in 1094 P11, the, our science, our pursuit, strives for these things. Our pursuit being a kind of politics. Politics and it is also of the highest art, highest practical art. He had said it is a political art. The political art is with the highest practical, in a sense, with the highest geometry. But what Aristotle does here is not simply the political art. Aristotle is no Pericles or Lysander or whatever else you might think. Aristotle is a man addressing potential legislators. He is not a legislator prop, and therefore his ethics is not simply a political book, and this applies also, by the way, to his politics, but politicetis, or to use a scholastic medieval distinction, his work here is not simply practical, but theoretically practical, and the second rule is direct over practical. What I explained figuratively in an earlier meeting, that I said Aristotle is in the same direction as a citizen states, but he looks for the evil. 
and that is a few and not negligible difference. In ordinary life, it is perfectly sufficient to say, uh, be decent or be courageous, whatever the subdivisions of decency may be. But Aristotle is very much concerned in finding out what precisely is courage, what precisely is justice, which uh, may be quite good for practical purposes to know, but all, quite a bit of decent practice gets along very well without raising this kind of question. Yes. Yeah, you were the one who had a question at the end of last meeting? No. But, uh, uh, but still, that is not you can end it. Would Aristotle's enterprise be more correctly uh, termed propagandic or, or a guide for, to, the, to the political art proper? No, I think it is more than merely propaganda. I think it, it, has a, it claims to have a higher dignity. Yes. In other words, that would mean that Aristotle says, I'm the humble servant of future Theseus, Romulus, Heracles, or whatever. No, he is, claims to be more than that. As we do. He will soon find out more about it. Now let us continue where we left off last time. And incidentally, who was the other one who had a question? And two other ones? Well, the question was, uh, we noticed that Aristotle says that, uh, that political science is the science which orders all of the arts which are practiced in the police. Yes. Uh, and thus, uh, all science is subordinated to political science. Uh, and we also notice that today, uh, so you pointed this out, that today, say, physicists are working in increasing numbers for the government, and that there is a sort of subordination of science to political science. But uh, you, you noted there was a difference, and I was wondering if you could explain well, that I difference. see. Well, is this Hansel has not spoken of the and that will come out later, especially in Book 6. The theoretical sciences are, according to Aristotle, not subject to the body. That is the physics. But physics, as, as in the service technology, military or not, is, of course, not simply a theoretical science. And therefore, one can use the conclusions uh, from the ones that other can not so easily be drawn. But for the time being, let us leave it at the simple position that the political art is the commanding art regarding all arts in contradistinction to theoretical sciences. The theoretical sciences are, belong to a higher sphere than uh, Paul Wiesel. Teacher of legislators, however uh, uh, broad minded, could not be prescribe uh, what mathematicians or what mathematic mathematicians or physicists or biologists should do. And for Aristotle, the theoretical science is a higher rank. Uh, but we have not yet reached this point. We are still sitting as good boys or good girls, for that matter, at the feet of the mass of those who know. Right? I will learn first what what we can learn from it. Now, up to this point, Aristotle had spoken about the subject of his discourse. Now, at 2094 BLM, he turns to the manner of his discourse. The distinction between subject and manner should be clear, or is, is this in need of explanation? It means method or something like that? Not manner. Now, the manner, for example, say you can treat as the same subject in different manners. For example, for beginners and for advanced students. This is one, isn't it, intelligent? You can treat it in a popular manner and in a very rigid academic manner. It's And other distinctions uh, which would apply. So, the, he wrote about 39 lines in the edition which I used to the subject of his discourse. He will devote about 29 lines to the manner of his discourse. To see from this mere statistical fact that the manner of speaking is very important to Aristotle, very important to Aristotle. And now, let us begin at the beginning of this section. Mr. Redagreen. Now, our treatment of this science will be adequate 
if it achieves that amount of precision which belongs to its subject matter. The same exactness but not, must not be expected in all departments of philosophy alike, any more than in all products of the arts and crafts. This of exactness must not be expected in all speeches, as little as in all product of the manual arts. Yes, well, for, take such an expression like precision instruments. Obviously, they are, have a higher degree of precision than non-precision instruments. And we expect different degrees of precision in different spheres. Now, this term precision or exact actually basically is called in the old Latin translation certo, from which the English certain. In the uh, Renaissance translation, it is translated subtilis, subtle. And it is very interesting that the Greek word can equally well be translated by certain as by subtle, two words which for us have entirely different meaning, as one can illustrate most simply by the example uh, of Pascal, who opposed to each other the spirit of geometry, in a way, the geometry means mathematics, yeah. and on the other hand, the spirit of finesse, of subject. So this was a clear opposition by that time, and it has remained up to the present day, hence the talk of the two cultures, the culture of exactness and the culture of subject, but in the original meaning, uh, the Greek word is this distinction has not yet been as pronounced. A Greek temple is built with the greatest precision as well-known classical archaeologists want to explain to me. And this precision is not simply to be reduced to mathematical uh, precision, and, uh, but has also to do with the purpose of the temple. So is the Sophoclean tragedy or an Aristophanian comedy. Nothing haphazard. It's also a principle of precision. What degree of precision is to be expected depends on the subject matter, on the hule, as Aristotle says here, which means literally translated it's a wood, that out of which a thing is made, and is then traditionally translated by matter, also in the sense of subject matter. For example, different uh, uh, exactness would be expected of an artisan working on marble or on clay or on wood. And this also applies to the necessary changes to the subject matter in the somewhat metaphoric sense, as distinguished from the matter strictly and sensibly, uh, uh, sensibly conceived. Now let us go on. Subjects studied by political science are moral nobility and justice, but these conceptions involve much difference of opinion and uncertainty, so that they are sometimes believed to be mere conventions and to have no real existence in the nature of well, things. That is, I think, translated a bit more precisely. The noble and the just things about which the political art makes its inquiries have great differences of one another and confusion, so that they seem to be only by convention and in no way by nature. Yes? And a similar uncertainty surrounds the conception of the good. There is no conception, of course, the word doesn't exist here. Why, why make things unnecessarily complicated and create the appearance of learning by speaking all the time of conception? Mm -hmm. There must be people who can say, the drink a glass of peace would say it's a conception of <laughs> which I believe they wouldn't say. I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one cannot know. No? Uh, because it frequently occurs that good things have harmful consequences. People have before now been ruined by wealth, and in other cases, courage has cost men their lives. Yes, yeah, yeah. before now, some have come to ruin through wealth, 
and others through courage. And the po- that is, you see, what he does with others that's concise and unnecessary. But uh, let us be not, uh, not uh, uh, apply too much attention to that. What he means here, of, the, of course, in the last part of the sentence is this. Everyone would say, it without being, trying to be subtle, well, this is a good thing. A courage is a good thing. And now, look how many men have been ruined by their wealth. Uh, is this not intelligent? That some people are ruined by their wealth, and some have been ruined by their courage. And they, they uh, volunteered for all kinds of dangerous things, and uh, they're ruined. That's uh, <laughs> popular and uh, intelligible idea. Uh, now, what degree of exactness is to be expected in the present inquiry, in the, which is a kind of political inquiry? That is now the question. And then, therefore, we must look at the subject matter of the present inquiry. And this subject matter consists of two kinds, and that is crucially important. The first is called the noble and just things, and the second is called the good things. Very much depends on your grasping this distinction. The noble and the just things, they um, correspond to what we would call today the moral things, or the ethics the noble and the just things. And you can understand the difference most between the noble and just most simply as follows. This is rather a very provisional explanation. Just things are the matter which you, the matters which you are obliged to do. So do, do, do. It's just for you to do. And the noble things are in a way beyond the call of duty. This is not literally true, but as a provisional explanation, and as indicating that there is still some intelligibility of this distinction in our way of thinking, are using them. So. Now, and the good things are the good things. There are two dimensions here, wealth and courage. There are many more, as we have to see. Health, of course, would be one. But they are not in that way <coughs> in which uh, uh, the noble and just now, regarding the noble and just things, Aristotle says there is a great variety, a great discord. This word occurred at the very beginning uh, of the work, as you may call it. Uh, there is in line three of the whole work. There comes to sight some, div- some variety, some difference, some discord of the end. Here he speaks, repeats this, but with a, with a bang. There is a great uh, discord and confusion regarding the noble and just things. Only now does Aristotle speak explicitly not merely of variety, but of the chaos in the moral world. But this chaos, which you know, of course, through present-day relativism, and there it becomes a matter, of course, about which nothing has to be said except to take it as a safe and sound starting point, which is not Aristotle's way of handling it. Now, what people, what, to, to, uh, the, what corresponds to relativism in our age was in classical antiquity what we can call conventionalism. And that is defined here, that the noble and just things are only by convention and in no way by nature. It's the difference between conventionalism and present-day relativism is this, that conventionalism is guided by the distinction between the conventional and the natural. And they, the old-fashioned conventionalists admitted, of course, that there are things by nature good. For example, have a sane mind, a healthy body, mentioned to food, simple examples, and to have good friends, good children, good parents. These are, of course, things which are by nature good, which everyone in his senses would decide. And this is in no way conventional. Whereas whether there should be polygamy or monogamy, or whether there should be community of 
property or not. This would be, according to the conventionalist view, a matter of convention. It depends on the society for which of the various and curated it offers. But there is a sphere in which no such human preference or, or tossing of coins is relevant, and this concerns a bit good by nature. Nevertheless, Aristotle goes on to suggest, there is some such confusion also regarding the good thing. But no one says, I know in passing, that the good things are good merely by convention. That uh, would uh, no one uh, suggest. Yet, as we can say, the good things are ambiguous. We think they are simply good, especially when we are inexperienced. And then we find out gradually that they are not always good. For example, wealth, desirable for someone poor, so that some people think if we had only money, we, everything would be fine, find out later on that this was a delusion. The same would be true, speaking crudely and superficially, as we do all the time now, of courage. Because it's uh, wonderful to have courage and to face and brave all kinds of dangers. Yeah, well, look, X did have this admirable quality, and then he got that he was killed unnecessarily because of it. So that same thing would seem to apply at first sense to all good things. There is a chapter in Xenophon's Memorabilia, Book 4, Chapter 2, which you might read, where this is beautifully and simply explained by Socrates himself to a young man called Eutychemus, who, uh, for example, that even wisdom which, is, which was surely regarded by Socrates as a very great book, that even wisdom can be damaging. For example, Socrates uses as the example of a fellow who was kidnapped because of his wisdom. The Persian king wanted to have him, I don't know more. <laughs> so you know that his, the good things are not as unambiguously good as inexperienced people might be uh, inclined to think. Now, what is implied here is also is that the good things as good things have are fundamentally superior to the noble and just things. And this will begin with very hard for us to understand. It has something to do with that problem I stated on an earlier occasion diagrammatically, and I will repeat that because I think it's good to do it. Here is the social scientist, however you call it, in the wide sense, the Aristotle too would be a social scientist. And here he looks forward to noble and just things. And then it is possible to look further afield, but it would still be the same perspective. That, that is what Aristotle is. And then there is another possibility to look at this whole dimension from the outside, the spectator. These are uh, fundamental alternatives, and now the superiority of the good to the uh, noble and just has something to do with this shift of perspective from this to this. This is, for the time being, perhaps wholly unintelligible, but I know from long experience that a teacher must sometimes throw some seeds and hope that they will this one. Good. Now, only one illustration for the time being, which is not more than an illustration, but perhaps a poor one. In Plato's Republic, the mention is made of the idea of the good as the highest theme. And the good is said to be, or the idea of the good is said to be superior to the ideas of the just and of the noble. So that is also Aristotle's view, although he would not express it in these terms. Now, Mr. Levin? We must therefore 
be content if, in dealing with, this, with subjects and starting from premises thus uncertain, we succeed in presenting a broad outline of the truth. When our subjects and our premises are mere generalities, it is enough if we arrive at generally valid conclusions. Yes, generally he understood in, in condescension to universal, not in the sense of abstract. So Alexander Reyes begins now to raise the question after he has made clear that the subject matter of politics is singularly chaotic, disorderly. How shall we speak about it? Rather rudely and crudely, so we can interpret what Alexander says. In other words, we should be satisfied with rules of thumb rather than with mathematical rules. Uh, with, with quite a few ifs and buts. And that means general, not universal. No rules here without exception. Um, take an example. And Alison makes this clear in his politics that we must make it is that one of the fundamental facts of the politics is the distinction between the rich and the poor, a distinction which is so little peculiar to Aristotle that, for example, Machiavelli makes also very much of it. It's elemental. But is this a precise distinction? It obviously depends very much on the total wealth of the society and on the relative distribution of wealth within the society. So that is not an exact distinction, but yet a very powerful one in which we must not forget. Or take um, the good man, the man of integrity, as he would be called today. Now, how deeply should we look into his heart before we pronounce the man is a man of perfect integrity? And so, Aristotle says, not too deep. That's pretty unsafe. He shuts him from his actions. And if he is, has constantly behaved decently throughout his life, then we pronounce him a perfect gentleman. As for his intentions, as I said, they are in manifest. And therefore, you can't say anything about them. That is, but on the other <coughs> can we be satisfied with external correctitude, even if extending throughout the whole of life. Difficult questions, no, no, uh, ifs and buts are individual. Now, since we start from premises in our present inquiry, from premises which are true only generally, i.e. admitting exceptions, our conclusions will be only general as well. That should be clear. Take another example. Generals ought to be men of great bodily vigor. Yet in one particular case, it, there may be a very gouty old general who may have much more uh, strategic acumen than the young generals. Naturally, every sensible man would say, let us choose this gouty old general against the rule, which as the general rule is sound. They say vigorous young men in their youth put together. So I think that is not too difficult to understand. Now Aristotle goes on in this discussion. Uh, Accordingly, we may ask the student also to accept the various views we put forward in the same spirit, for it is the mark of an educated mind to expect that amount of exactness in each in each kind which the nature of the particular subject admits. It is equally unreasonable to accept merely probable conclusions from a mathematician and to demand strict demonstration from a uh, order. Again, each man judges correctly those matters with which he is acquainted. It is of these that he is a competent critic. To criticize... Sure, sure. Let me say, John. Not, not try to avoid technical terms when simple terms we do. Critic is a derivative term, isn't it? Critis is church. Church. Yes. To criticize 
or to judge a particular subject, therefore a man must have been trained in that subject. To be a good judge generally, he must have had a had an all-around education. Yeah, and it is talking at all. So Aristotle raises now the question not how to speak about this subject matter, but how to accept such speech. First he had spoken as it were of what the, the speaker, the teacher should do. Now he speaks about the hearers, of the, of the students. What the listener or reader should expect or demand in such, in, in each case or kind of case. The exactness which the nature of the matter permits. The extreme would be the mathematician and the orator. From the mathematician you would not be satisfied. In the case of the mathematician you would not be satisfied if he would say, my God, that is so. But in the case of the orator, it might very well be very con conclusive if in a given part of his uh, speech, he says so. I think if you would make a study of political speeches, you would see that both or their equivalents are very persuasive, or can be very persuasive, in public speech, political speech, but not in mathematics. And some of the jokes which Plato commits in his dialogues is that he makes sometimes questions be decided by, quote, by Zeus. The, the swearing, say, of Glaucon in the Republic would add an atom of truth to the disposition. So uh, that is clear. Then we could perhaps illustrate it by a modern example uh, taken from Machiavelli. Machiavelli's prince begins with a chapter <coughs> which reads rather dry and dull. It's kind of scholastic divisions, roughening sequence of divisions. And then it ends with a quotation from a patriotic Italian <coughs> Now, perhaps one could say what Machiavelli suggests is that the proper posture of the student of politics consists in the proper mixture of academic dryness and academic fervor. I would think that is not. Uh, you would not need such a, or could not use such a mixture in mathematics or that matter in biology. But in the study of human political things, it would make sense. Now, in order to demand the right kind or degree of exactness or precision, one must know the nature of the subject matter, or uh, one must know the genus, genus with which the science of question deals. One does not have to be a scientist in order to do that. I also use here the term the educated man. The educated man is a teenage man, not a man of science. The particular, a kind of second-hand familiarity with the subject matter compared to the, the true man of science. And the highest possibility on this level is a man who has an all-around education, something which we can no longer expect in our age but which in former times was, of course, possible when there was much uh, less specialization and much less progress. So Alistair has here stated again, in general terms, answers the question, what about the spirit in which to expect or accept speeches? And now he turns again to the question at hand, how to accept or expect or what to expect of speeches regarding our present subject. Will you go on, please? Hence, the young are not fit students of political science, for they have no experience of life and conduct, and it is these that supply the premises and subject matter of this inquiry. And moreover, they are led by their feelings, so that they will study. But you could also say uh, feelings, but the usual translation of pathos is passion. 
so that they will study the subject <coughs> to no purpose or advantage, since the end of this science is not knowledge but action. And it makes no difference whether they are young in years or immature in character. The defect is not a question of time. It is because their life and its various aims are guided by passion. For to such persons, their knowledge is of no use any more than it is to persons of defective, selfish incontinence. But uh, moral science may be of great value to those who guide their desires and actions by principle. Of course, Aristotle doesn't say a word of moral science, nor does he say political science. He says in Greek, he politike, which, to which you can add, as, a, as an adjective, you can add a noun, techne, for example, the political art. You can also add the politike dynamis, the political ability. It is not so hard and fast, he thinks, in Aristotle, as a translator's innovation of help to make. Now, who are then the proper hearers of what we could now call ethics? Perhaps ethics is better than ethical science because the claim is somewhat different when you speak of ethics and when you speak of ethical science. Now, the proper hearers of ethics are not the young. And I do not know what I have to say here, but I can assume that you are part of you are graduate students and actually all of you are beyond high school. Uh, and the young means here arise, Aristotle says in Italy, those who lack self-control. And he gives two reasons. First, young people lack experience. And secondly, young people, generally speaking, lack self-control. They will not learn, they will not listen properly, because their passions blind them. If someone has a very strong desire for something, then he doesn't listen uh, to reasons which tell him he's strong to desire that or to start from it. I don't, don't think that I have to labor this point because all of you have read some novels and <laughs> you don't know what to do. One may say, going a bit beyond Aris, what Aristotle here explicitly says, that the proper hearer or student must already be a perfect gentleman. Others are not admitted. Aristotle does not do the job which Plato or Socrates does in the Republic on Thrasymachus, who is not a perfect gentleman, and doesn't claim to be one. And Socrates refutes him. Or in the Gorgias on Caligrus. Aristotle, in other words, says, I'm not going to refute the immoralists. The people who say the just and noble things are merely uh, conventional. I, do. I, I don't talk to such people. Now, this seems to be a very arbitrary procedure. But uh, le nevertheless, let us uh, see what speaks in favor of it. If we take first the contemporary example, uh, there is now much talk of freedom of love, I believe they call it, by which they mean complete sexual freedom. Now, Alfred would say, are young people competent regarding this subject? And they know the grave consequences for the whole of life and pride in them. Or to take a simpler case where there will be no controversy among us, are three-year-old children competent to judge regarding matches? The application of one to the other example I leave to you. The point which Aristotle makes here, which I must uh, emphasize, the end of this, which Aristotle pursues in this book, is not knowledge, but action. In other words, he does not, uh, he is not concerned, at least not primarily concerned, with reaching an understanding of the moral thing, the just and noble thing, but with making, in the, within the limits of the possible, with making men 
better men, men more noble, more just. That is the end. To, to whether one needs for this purpose an understanding of what nobility and what justice is from the point of view of that outside observer, we are not yet in a position to say. Now let us read then. As Aristotle has drawn our attention very forcefully to the moral chaos, which leads to the fact that people say the noble and just things are only conventional. One could say, being uh, harsh on Aristotle or nasty to him, that the moral chaos disappears or ceases to be terrible by virtue of experience of life and of control of the passions. Or perhaps more simple, we will only talk to people who have fulfilled this condition. Now, the other side of it, the genuine and substantial side, will come to side soon enough. Now, the next sentence. Not so much suffice by way of introduction as to the student of the subject. The spirit in which our conclusions are to be received and the object that we set before us. Yeah, this is important because it says what we have read either do was only the introduction, the preamble, and later on we go. But first, let us have a discussion before we go on. So this was an entirely provisional discussion of Proemio, indicating the subject matter, and indicating the spirit in which it will be treated, and in which the treatment must be accepted by the year. There must be quite a few questions. Uh, yeah, I've got a couple. First, is this a, a prologue also to the politics, or is it only to the politics, only to the... Uh, well, I would say only to this work, because there is a special, a special transition at the end of this work to the politics, and then there is a new beginning made at the politics. Yes. Uh, but it's a, since the two works belong together, you can also say that it's really the beginning of this whole the dual enterprise, ethics and politics. But but I was thinking of your what you're saying about politicetis being a say a, the art of the teacher of legislators or something a like that. A kind of political inquiry. Yeah, uh, is is that uh, later on when in the sixth book when he exposes politike uh, alone, he seems to say that it's a part of prudence. Uh, would politicetis also be? A kind yeah. of prudence? Yeah, but as a second point, this is become, will become, yeah, first of all, we have to wait for book six, where he speaks about prudence and the relation of prudence and politics. And one which Aristotle does not develop there, as far as I remember at this moment, but which was developed by the scholars in the Middle Ages, was this difference that the teacher, the the teacher of political prudence is not as such a political man. I mean, he doesn't, for example, he does not, the political man also always has to consider the opposition and the present situation. The teacher of politics in general doesn't have to do that. There is no opposition in that way because if he, the scholars who contradict them, he contradict him are not an opposition in the political sense well, at least that's what we hope. Yeah? But, but it, isn't the teacher of, of uh, say, legislators in some sense uh, a political man? Let's say because he has to deal with particular legislators. Yeah, no, but he will deal, that is a very, move, a very difficult question. But as a teacher of legislators, he will establish the principles of the legislation, which would be rightly understood universally valid. Not universally valid in the sense in which Bentham would have been a teacher of legislators, but in the sense in which he would, that he would consider the alternative. Say, this is the most desirable, this is the second desirable, third desirable, and so on. And, uh, but this would be not deal with Athens or Sparta or Corinth, but with, uh, with aristocracy, democracy, oligarchy, and whatever, with kinds of regimes 
and it could in principle be nameless. There is an actual politician, of course, has himself a name, proper name, and it, um, belongs to a city with a proper name, and has to do with adversaries with proper name. This is so. In, in other words, what happens is this, this in between a strictly practical pursuit. A strictly practical pursuit is what Aristotle did in order to have the means of living for himself or his friend. That's practical. But when he reasons generally about how to get money, and then he, in that respect he is of course no longer a practical man. The economist, the, man, the teacher of management of the household, is not as such a manager of the household. Because it's not, not individual. Today it is, I mean, today we have at the other pole where the practical sciences have completely disappeared. May I mention this in passing? When we speak, we have today a distinction between the theoretical and the applied sciences. And the applied sciences are sciences which presuppose the pure or theoretical science. In Aristotle, the applied sciences play no role. But for him, what is the science of is the distinction between theoretical and practical science. And the practical sciences do not presuppose the theoretical science. How this is possible, we will try to see. There are also difficulties here, no doubt, but prima facie, this is simply true. Now, Mr. Peter. It would seem that the qualifications for the good or only appropriate student of Aristotle's ethics are conjoined in old men, since they have had the experience and they are also by nature less may susceptible I, to the past. May I suggest a slight correction? Mature. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a problem there. If they are only but for old men, it would be of little use. And well, of little need. <laughs> that, that's just the question I wanted to ask, because it would seem that uh, as men become more receptive to the teaching, their ability to improve their actions with respect to justice and nobility has correspondingly decreased. Because you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Among other, other reasons. Yeah. And also that uh, their active lives are behind them to yeah. a large extent. No, no, but Therefore, I suggested that there is old by mature, and you will have what our success, and your objection will cease to be valid. Well, I'm not so sure, because in practice, one can't readily imagine a mature man who was busily engaged in practical activities, taking the time out to uh, read Aristotle. And that is not true. I, I have an empirical proof against it. There was a very remarkable man, a more than remarkable man in our age, Winston Churchill. And he was at a friend, Lord Birkenham. His name prior to his being raised in the village was Smith. I forgot his initials. And this uh, Lord Birkenham was a lawyer and, and a very witty man. Of which Churchill gives an example. And on one occasion or another, Churchill and the Birkenhead gave Churchill this book to read, of course, in English translation. And Churchill was already at that time in the 40s. Churchill read it and said, that is more or less as I always thought. He didn't think so. Churchill didn't say that he derived any benefit from it. That I uh, didn't say. But uh, I believe he was too busy uh, to write a uh, benefit from it. But at least he uh, so Here is that but, but made explicit what uh, uh, he and Bergnet and some other people felt was uh, a good man. But it's precisely the benefit that Aristotle was concerned with, not, not simply the sure, knowledge. Sure, that is true. But then why don't you take people who think there is, was an expression used which you surely have heard in Athens. People who mind their own business. Did you ever hear it? Now, by this way, understood people of independent means, unfortunately, 
that was missing. Will independent needs or wait friends of independent needs? This is more the same thing. And who, where, where, without political ambition, that was meaning, was the meaning of minding one's own. Because these people, of course, had plenty of time to go to the museum, whenever Alison gave lectures, and, or Plato gave lectures, and to listen to them. There's no difficulty in that. If you raise now the question whether such books are not wholly valueless, the question which in a way Machiavelli raised, you know, when he said he wanted to read the political science in accordance with how men actually did, i.e. not as perfect as And then, uh, of course, you could throw this uh, away as useless. But, but I believe we, you will get into a theoretical trouble at any rate. A theoretical, practical, probably not, given the, stand, uh, the state of the parties, scientific parties, I mean, now, uh, in the present day, uh, but you will get into theoretical trouble. At any rate, even if this other view, the Machiavellian view, were true, it would be absolutely necessary to understand the alternative. Otherwise, we simply are blind followers of Machiavelli, and we want to understand his reasoning, how, how to what extent is this right, and therefore we have to know the, the position which he rejects. That, that's, it seems to me that it's precisely our view is one of, of seeking knowledge, whereas if we believe Aristotle to a certain extent, that view is inimical to this. The point is, yes, you can say that. Indeed, we, that is a very good point. In other words, we, especially the younger ones among you, are in a situation in which you hear two kinds of silence. On the one side, there are those who repeat more or less well, but so well as Plato Aristotle. And then there are the others who repeat what, more or less what Thrasymachus, Caligus, and such people say. And therefore, you, uh, you cannot, or we cannot uh, say, oh, we are nice people, and we will simply uh, uh, only listen to nice men. We cannot do that. The power of the non-nice people, or as they are sometimes called the mad guys, is so strong that we have to really to take this position of the observer. That is true. Whether, but we must ne never forget that the primary <coughs> position is not that. And we must be careful to see what the advantages are that go with Aristotle. Now let us go on and we read to the very beginning of it. 95 page 14. We let us speak after having taken up the subject. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, and, yes? Uh, to resume. Uh, yeah. Inasmuch as all studies and undertakings are directed to the attainment of some good. Let us stop here. Now, Aristotle repeats here, as you see, the very beginning of the book, but simplifying it greatly, because he speaks now only of every knowledge and moral choice. He does not make this division into four, which he made at the very beginning of the book. We may use this occasion for noticing that in good writers, repetitions are, as a rule, never little. Little repetitions, but always non-little. At any rate, this uh, Aristotle continues, but he continues while repeating. And now let's begin where we began now and read a few more lines. Let us discuss what it is that we pronounce to be the aim of politics. That is, what is the highest of all the goods that action can achieve? As far as the name goes, we may almost say that the great majority of mankind are agreed about this. Let us stop here. It is settled that the human ability dealing with the highest good is a political one, political ability. But it deals only with the highest of the good things 
will be achieved by action. And here you see a distinction only between choice and knowledge. Aristotle takes now for granted that there is a single highest good, partly on the basis of the parallelism between the ends and the arts, you remember. And there is, this, there is a variety of ends, there is an infinite variety of ends. And there is an infinite variety of arts produced ends. Yet, among the arts, we find the hierarchy. And therefore, we have the right to assume a hierarchy also among the ends. Moreover, among the arts, we find one architectonic, architectonic art, one art ruling all others, the political art. And so, therefore, we are entitled to assume that there is a good thing which is a product of this political art. That was the previous idea. Now, what did you want to say? I want to ask him. Since uh, he said before that Bodeus is the only true student of, of politics, so he only talks to, the, to this Pudeo. Is it fair to say, on the other side, that he only talks about this Pudeo? In other words, that the hierarchy of goods can exist, the way he approaches it, can exist only if the men who seek goods are, in effect, sincere in seeking, in, in seeking the highest good. Does the classification work only with Pudeo? Not quite, but when someone has some coordination of the art of shipbuilding to the art of sailing, must be recognized by uh, the greatest dancer as well yes, yes, as that's by uh, the that's, 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 uh, that's another thing. Yeah. That's, that's a very simple example. What yeah. if we take something a little bit more complicated, like uh, all of the um, two men differing on a piece of uh, Legislation. One says the good is A, the other says, says the good is, uh, is something else, perhaps even not A. Fair to say that the goods are actually, actually both uh, have the highest good inherent in them, as, as Aristotle would say, if the men both don't sincerely aim. In other words, they both may be wrong, but they must aim at the highest one in order to be related to it. I'm sure I believe would not attach this importance to sincerity. Because sincerity uh, can go together with great light. With great blindness, yeah. And, and great obstinacy and so which would not. Sincerity is a simple term, but uh, the, 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 attitude was, uh, the, the attitude and the uh, content of this today was concerned. You know, they would agree in principle, surely, on all the uh, matters of principle. But since practical matters of, of this great variety, there are many cases where you, where decent men can disagree. Yes. And uh, that uh, is clear, that there must, ways and means must be found that this disagreement leads to a uh, 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 dissolution of the body politic. Uh, that is, of course, we're not saying. But uh, disagreements, especially in this special, concrete question, are uh, Coeval with political life of any complexity. Now let us uh, then continue. Very For both the multitude and persons of refinement speak of it as happiness and conceive the good, good life or doing well to be the same thing as being happy. Yeah. Now, neither do we repeat. We know only, we know that there is a highest good in this indirect way. Because there is a highest art, but we didn't see this highest good itself, only its object was so. But regarding this object, we have learned in the meantime, this consists of the noble and just things on the one hand, and the good things on the other, and there is great complexity there. So that is not very helpful. Now Aristotle says, proceeds, he makes a new beginning. And uh, as it were, he kept uh, a, a straw. There is a word. Regarding uh, which all men use for designating the highest thing. And this word is in Greek, eudaimonia. This is a point which is not negligible. 
but of course not criticizing because names may be used in equivocally. Equi equi the cleavage among them is that between the many and the men of refinement or grace, shall we And they also, all, but uh, there is a cleavage, eh, which is by no means, uh, but they all agree as to the name, and they agree moreover as to this, that you, Daimonia, having a good demon, or being guided by a good demon, is the same as doing well, in the ambiguity of doing well, you know, acting well, or in some sense, failing well, that is not therapy, and living well. There is no doubt that all men, regardless of that is, that there is no man in his senses who doesn't wish to live well, to, to wish to live well, to do well, and to be happy. But unfortunately, there is a great variety of opinions as to what happiness is, of which he speaks in the secret. No? But what constitutes happiness is a matter of dispute, and the popular account of of it is not the same as that given by the philosophers. Oh, no, not the wise men. Oh. Yeah, no, 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 they make it all too technical. Now he speaks of the wise men where he had spoken for before of the men of refinement or grace. And uh, the two terms are here synonymous, Jews, you know, the same thing. So, while all men agree as to the name of heaven, what is heaven? Uh, and there is here this profound disagreement between the many and the wise. Yes? Ordinary people identify it with some obvious and visible good, such as pleasure or wealth or honor. Some say one thing and some say another. Indeed, very often the same man says different things at different times. When he falls sick, he thinks health is happiness. When he is poor, wealth. At other times, feeling conscious of their own ignorance, Men admire those who propound something grand and above their heads. Yeah, very exactly. So opinions of the many. Well, you are all familiar with this view that the man thinks in one time, if I only got rid of this reward or whatever it may be, and that is the only thing of importance to me. And then after his well, he doesn't pay any attention to himself anymore. That is very clear. The last point may refer to something like initiations into the uh, receiving or other mysteries. You know, others have higher views and it's neither honor nor wealth nor health is a thing, but some grand things, high above them. Yes. And it has been held by some thinkers that beside the many good things we have mentioned, there exists another good that is good in itself and stands to all those goods as the cause of their being good. Yes, the reference in all the ability to Plato. Or let us say the Platonists. There is one good thing, which is the cause also of all these good things mentioned before, like health, wealth, and now Aristotle this is so example, but he gives us the opinions of the wise men. And he there appear two kinds of opinions, two faulty extremes, the view of the vulgar and the false view of a wise man. The, the right mean is not mentioned here because he must show a cause why neither of the two views, two possibilities, is sufficient. Yes. Uh, perhaps it would be a somewhat fruitless task to review all the different opinions that are held. It will suffice to examine those that are most widely held or that seem to have some argument in their favor. Then in practice this means, I mean this is of course an absolutely sound statement, you cannot discuss all of it, but in pra the practice of Aristotle it means that he will not try to refute Catechism or Cosimus for that matter. And this is of some importance. Yeah. All right, now go on. And we must not overlook the distinction between arguments that start from first principles and those that lead to first principles. It was a good well, problem. I do say, does he say first? Say principles. I mean, there are so many principles around nowadays that you must make this distinction. 
It was not so nice. Now let us first see up to the yes, next sentence. It was a good practice of Plato to raise this question and, into, and to inquire whether the right procedure was to start from or to lead up to the principles. As yeah, in the pr procedure in the previous method, uh, the way is, the way is to the principles or from them. Yes. As in a race course, one may run from the judges to the far end of the track or so the other way around. Yes. yes but now, Aristotle now gives the reason why one cannot give a reason for everything, he can say. And this is in the rest of this chapter. There are two ways in which we can think. From the principles, now that is called this descent, and up to the principles, that is called this ascent. And let us avoid these technical terms like induction, deduction, which do more harm than good. The question is, which way will Aristotle go in his ethics? From the principles down or up to the principles? And the, the distinction to which he refers here was made by Plato. It does not occur, as far as I know, in this form in the Platonic Dialogues but it must have been very common use of data in his conversations. Now go on. Now no doubt it is proper to start from the known, but the known has two meanings. What is known to us, which is one thing, and what is knowable in itself, which is another. Perhaps then, for us, at all events, it is proper to start from what is known to us. This is a bit of a joke. We, the humans, Perhaps should start from what is known to you. Here, more of the context. We must start either from what is known to us or from what is known simply. Absolutely. The preposition used here, according to it, seems to indicate that he will proceed by way of descent. He seems to replace principles by known, as though the things known. And drawing our attention to that there are two kinds of things known. Known to us or known in itself, meaning tacitly presupposed by us, but not yet understood, you're not yet realized. But starting from what is known to us would seem to lead to what is known by itself. Starting from what is known to us would then mean starting from the facts as distinguished from the principles or highest causes. And starting is, does Aristotle then say we should start from what is known to us in order to arrive eventually at the principles? Is this a procedure? Let us see That is why, in order to be a competent student of the right and the just, and, in, and in short, of the topics of politics in general, the pupil is bound to have been well trained in his habits. For the starting point, or first principle, is the fact that a thing is so. If this be satisfactorily ascertained, there will be no need also to know the reason why it is so, and the man of good moral training knows first principles already, already, and can ease, or can easily acquire them. Yeah. Uh, now, Aristotle seems here to say no. We do not start from facts in order to arrive eventually at the principle. For the fact, the fact, the H A T is principle itself. Hence, no need for the why, the that and why are the two alternatives. No need for the why. For no need for the principles in the sense of the term previously <coughs> used. For example, someone can say that the, 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 the in the forest, it is sweet and becoming to die for the fatherland is such, at least an example of such a fact. 
the well bred up man knows that. And there is no need for any reason. And he, he starting from such maxims, like that presented by the poet, and perhaps even honesty is the best policy, if you want. Such maxims which gradually build up in a man in the course of his education and his, and his experience, that is all what is needed. A man who sees the fact In other words, what I should simply say is this. A man who sees the fact, take for that the example from orders or whatever you want, a man who sees the fact is and or is not by this very fact in possession of the mind. One couldn't be more ambiguous. The well bred man surely knows that this or that is noble or just. But he does not know why they are, these things are just or noble. More precisely, even granting that he knows why they are just and noble, does he know that they are good? Because that was exactly the point of these bad guys, Simakos <coughs> and the others. And they said they are, of course, a noble and just thing, but they are no good. And the real question, the first question would be the noble and just things are good or not. The question is, will the well bred up young man, made for mature man, and learn it from Aristotle that they are good? At any rate, Aristotle addresses only decent people. That is made clear, I think, uh, more than before. People who admit that one ought to be decent, or that this is his good. Does Aristotle back the decisive question by not arguing this out here? Does he argue in a circle, in other words, presupposing decency and never go out of this charmed circle of decency? Perhaps this is necessary. And there is a simple reflection which can show the plausibility at least of this. A man who, re or young or old, who raises this question, which theoretically seems to be so plausible, why should I be decent, has already ceased to be decent. So that to raise this question is incompatible with this. He cannot have an author. There is at a certain place a jump from neutral, not neutral, neutrality, or non-decency, <coughs> decency, and a, a jump which, uh, without which, we will never enter this uh, dimension. The situation is a bit more complicated than that, but uh, um, still, uh, it's necessary to make this point. And now let us see the conclusion of this chapter. As for the person who neither knows nor can learn, let him hear the words of Hesiod. Best is the man who can himself advise. He too is good who hearkens to the wise. But who himself, being witless, will not heed another's wisdom, is worthless indeed. So there are three kinds of men. Those who know to their own power, and they are the best. And the second are, are those who listen to or obey to him who has spoken well. This would be the perfect gentleman, listening to Aristotle. And the third are the wholly useless fellows who don't know by themselves and don't listen to their betters. You, you, some of you will remember the three kinds of men in the Republic. Do you remember them? Well, can I not always make from time to time a little examination? These are the three kinds of men in the public. The guardians and the auxiliaries and the uh, working class. <laughs> More than makers are the Yes, that is the same distinction. The, the, the third class does not really listen in the way in which the auxiliaries are supposed to listen. Now, the class of those who listen to 
people who speak swear, these are the genuine. They know the noble and just things through hearing, through hearsay, and tradition. And this is not the highest form of knowledge. The highest form of knowledge is to know it through oneself. Now, that is really the beginning of the, the very beginning of the next chapter. But let us continue from this point where we digress. Yeah, so we learn here that this was a digression on excursions. Uh, this, uh, 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 and as appears from the secret, this remark about method, as people call it today, so to speak, about the way in which I was to speak, in which the reader must, the hearer must hear, this is an excursus. Uh, excursus is not necessarily something unimportant, but irrelevant. It can be very important. Aristotle has three such remarks about how to speak and how to hear in the first book. This is the central one, which we have just read. And as a rule, in authors like Aristotle, what is in the center is particularly important. So this is a very important excursus, but in a way, you, if someone in a hasty reader says, well, I don't wish to read it because only the excursus no harm, uh, I mean, uh, he will not be punished by any, by any legislator, that we can be sure. Yes. Now, we leave it at this point. I have a few minutes left. Uh, any questions? Objections? I have a, a great misgiving about Aristotle's procedure in, in uh, restricting the variety of moral opinions by uh, restricting himself to those who have, have experience and have some control over their passions. I, I don't really think that this is enough to, to get rid of the variety of moral opinions. I mean, even if you restrict yourself to say... All right, but, but still, um, now let us see, take a simple and extreme case. If a man is in a state of rage, and he has just heard something when he has what his other fellow has done something bad. And he is eager to kill them. Can you, is it such a, such a, a man so circumstanced in a position to listen to coolly, must you not produce first some form of violence and, and, uh, until he be able to listen to it? I, I agree with that. I think my question is, is a different question. It is, even if you disregard such people, and I think there are good reasons for doing so, isn't there still a great deal of disagreement among people who have experience and have some Yes, indeed. But by giving an example to make it a bit more There are some societies where the uh, parents are put to death when they reach uh, a certain age, when they're no longer useful. Uh, this is done, this is thought to be good, this is not thought to be wrong, even by the most experienced people. Well, Aristotle does not go to general questions of such uh, detail, because it is a detail. And you rightly imply it does not necessarily contradict the general notion which Aristotle would assume all societies have that one should honor all the laws because it is meant to save the troubles. And then the men who do it know the same will be done with them and them. To that extent, it is a moral You know, the moral thing should be one um, from which you, from whose validity you do not. Except yourself. Otherwise, it's sheer crookedness. I mean, only crooks do that. But if a man says, I think it is better to have the parents uh, put to sleep uh, than to have them go through all the miseries of old age, uh, and he says, Of course, I want to have a my children, and I urge them even to do it the same to me. Then it is at least respectable at, 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 at
Ja, then the question would simply be, uh, as it was not discussed, but uh, in, uh, we would, I believe I can say that uh, it would be in the spirit to say, what well, right, let us discuss it. Whether the two alternatives, alternatives with which we are familiar, that there will be no killing of innocent people under any circumstances, yeah? except accidentally as in air war. You see, if the bus come here all the time. But generally speaking, we uh, say no one should be killed innocently. The parents are innocent people, we assume. Whether this is not a sound principle, because uh, we have to go into details and discuss it practically, and not merely in general assertions. I believe that my conscience tells me about that. That indeed would not have any idea. To be free. And if one sees that, uh, 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 I think uh, uh, one would have to enter into the subject that we discussed. Because these people, however primitive, who have such practices, have reason sometimes disguised in the form of stories on this. Well, then it is our duty as scientific men to take away the disguise and say it should be non for the reason. And then contrast it with the reasoning underlying our practice. And that means, among other things, to make clear to ourselves why would do we object to such a practice, to the killing of the people. And then, of course, say, if I'm opposed to it, I'm speaking for myself, and I'm therefore disqualified, I'm perfectly willing to have any one of you take my seat and defend this position. And you defend it. In other words, there is no, I mean, all these questions are very complicated questions. But take an issue of perhaps much greater gravity within the Western tradition. In <coughs> and I'm thinking not of psychoanalysis, and I'm thinking of the Jews themselves. And so, uh, this is a very different question as indicated by the biblical example that the human race could not possibly have multiplied without incest at least to be part of the system. If there is descent from a, from a single human body. Very clear. And there are also some uh, novels which present this issue in a very powerful way, for example, I'm not very good at being nice. Um, this is not uh, the, the traditional, the followers of Aristotle, the traditional natural law teachers, to the extent to which they were not theologians, therefore said that these prohibitions against incest, at least between brothers and sisters, are of belong to positive law, not to natural One would not. Uh, so these questions were always known. And about, uh, for, up from a certain point, it becomes indeed a question of cross and points in all fields. But up to a certain point, it is a matter of reason, and we must not be lazy, but try to think about it, as you would do when confronted with a mathematical or other problem. What is in the mind of these people? who kill their own age parents, and what is in the mind of the people who say under no circumstances must this be done. There will be some reasons. And sometimes it takes great uh, trouble to disinter it, because the decisions were made very early, and what remained for the future was only the result of the reasoning. This way or that way, and the reasoning uh, has to be disinterred. That is our function which anthropologists, intelligent anthropologists, would have when they deal with this And not merely say, uh, you know, that there are such people who do such and other people who do other things. That we do. So, well, we need uh, seems that we have to know what the subject matter is, is first in order to say that we're going to make such and such changes. Well, do we not have to know what the subject matter is first 
under all conditions. This can hardly be avoided. I mean, there may be a circle, but it is not visible in this passage. It becomes visible later on. But then, in a passage we read last time, but not in the one which you have in mind. And it consists in this, that the goodness of decency is presupposed. You have, as it were, to leap into the region of decency. And there is no reasoning, no compelling reasoning, which can bring even an indecent man to make that leap. There are some reasonings which make it plausible, but the decisive thing is not achieved by that. I advise you perhaps, uh, advise you to read perhaps Book 7 of the Politics. There is a certain section, a very simple section, in which Aristotle speaks about the reasonableness or possibility of assuming the goodness of virtue and uh, of the various kinds of virtue in a section where he discusses happiness. You, uh, uh, that's a much more elementary and primitive discussion, but this has also some advantages. You might read that. Now, did you have the point? Oh, no. Yes. I still don't, haven't, don't remember your name, but I know who you are. I'd like to ask a question about uh, something we discussed last time. Yes. Um, And that was your elaboration of the ethics as a practical book or a theoretical book at one room. Yes. Theoretical practical book. And the question I have is why can't there be or why shouldn't there be a strictly theoretical science of politics? And by that I mean a science of, of, well, say Aristotle would agree with the definition that you have given in various places, that the philosopher seeks to know the whole. Now, why couldn't there be a science who seeks to know that part of the whole, which is political, by by answering the question, say, what is the whole or what is political, or defining the limits of the political, in a strictly theoretical way, and that would be practical only in a secondary or even in an accidental sense, in that the disknowledge of the limits of the political would be put to would, would be practical only accidentally. In other words, once you know what it is, then it could be applied, but that would not be its primary goal. Yes. Now, well, why does Aristotle not proceed in this way? I mean, was this wholly beyond his ken? This possibility? It seems not to have been because he was a student of Plato. And where do you find in Plato such a, a theoretical ethics or the sketch of it at least? Well, at least okay. something like the distinction between purely theoretical Yeah, that one could say. But more simply, in the Republic, when Plato discusses there the virtues. He speaks first of the soul and its parts, or of the city and its parts. That is fundamentally the same there. Now, and therefore, he is able to say there are only these four and no other virtues, because the soul has these three parts, and then there must, must be a virtue concerning the the soul as a whole, or the city as a whole, better be justice. Now, when Aristotle discusses the virtues, as you will see later on, and uh, um, already by the end of this book, he enumerates a number of virtues and never tries to deduce them, as Plato deduced them from the parts of the soul. So it is very easy to say, Aristotle, you just, that's quite reasonable what you say there, but which guarantee do you have that your list of virtues is complete? That, after all, is what we as theoretical men uh, would want. No answer. Take it or leave it. Or state it a bit more politely. Show me a virtue which I omitted. Or show me, a, 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 show me that I unreasonably introduced one human quality and called it a virtue. And then you would be hard put to it to uh, 
find any flaw in that. This, I think, is truly empirical. Looking around, seeing these kind of virtues, some are even nameless. That doesn't do any harm. But if the vice is named, then by implication, there is a virtue there, even if it is not named. So that's easy. Yes. But, I mean, I may run the risk of doing what, of asking that question you said that we shouldn't ask about. Oh, no, no, no that is good. But, no, uh, I did not mean it so literally. There may be some things in the, uh, some things in that list of virtues which shouldn't be, even according to Aristotle, included. That is to say, don't some of the moral virtues somehow appear as to be splendid vices? Say, from the point of view of the theoretical virtues, at least. Yeah, but when does he speak about the theoretical virtues in this book? I mean, he speak, speak, starts speaking about them in the sixth book. Yeah, but the, the full clarity about the relation of the moral and theoretical. Then, then. So, in other words, the bulk of the book is written without, of, without uh, articulating the highest human possibility. Needless to say that Aristotle could not forget that for one moment, but he thinks it is important that one should see the moral sphere as it presents itself if you are blissfully unaware of true bliss, of theoretical, <coughs> contemplative, speculative bliss. And why did he do that? Why did he abstract so that, so that the bulk of the work of the highest? Because it would naturally take away something of the grace and splendor of these virtues. Why does the most graceful part come at the end? Because it is of so little importance to most human beings. No, I would not see why it comes to you. Well, in the first place, it is an as well. It is a general procedure that uh, that you ascend from the more accessible to the less accessible, and uh, that such a thing, say like justice, and that this is a virtue and is very important, that is admitted by most people. And even by crooks, because there is also they have their way of justice among themselves, I was told. And so, I mean, one could only say they stop too early and draw the line at the wrong place. But they have some inkling that uh, there must be some proportion between risk and reward, for example, which is the major principle of justice. So this can be easily granted. But the theoretical life, in, in, we are, of course, spoiled in a way by a tradition of many centuries and take that for granted, perhaps, as though in modern times that was more and more questioned. But still, it is somewhere there in our background. But in the earlier times, that was it is so that a very small part of the city, very small part, and the if we disregard the common people, as Aristotle unfortunately does most of the time, and limit ourselves only to the gentlemen, even the gentlemen didn't know anything of philosophy to speak of. But think of Pericles' famous saying in the funeral speech, Philosophumen met oite layers. We philosophize with rape i.e. without abandoning ourselves to it. You see, that is, that is, of course, what Aristotle opposes. One should abandon oneself. Not all men, but not all men are fit for it. Anyway, this is um, an extreme possibility. Now, that something can be extreme, and yet the highest is, I suppose, known to students in Lermont, from the famous scene in the Cow Palace some years ago. <laughs> so I don't know if you have to lay at this point. And now, are you satisfied for the time being? <coughs> for the time being. Good. Um, it seems that Aristotle, you said that, that the, the intellectual work came last and the rest of the intellectual work was the more 
well, in a crude way, because he speaks really of the intellectual virtues in the, in the widest sense in Book 6. But the highest virtue, the highest perfection of man, the highest happiness, that becomes a theme only at the end of this verse. One question is that it would seem that perhaps, that from one point of view, at least from the point of view of those very men that he directs the book at primarily, especially in that section about moral virtue, he leaves out something which is most important to them in the way that, say, philosophy isn't. And this might be... Uh, what does he omit? Well, piety, for example. Yeah, all right. That is a very good point. Here you, here you have uh, made a point of great interest, because if we take an enumeration of the virtues as ordinarily understood by the Greeks of that time, and we can see this from Plato and Xenophon and other writers, piety would be one of these things. And it is absent from Aristotle's list. A serious objection. There is a, a very good, but we cannot... Uh, you have to go into the subject matter to see what Aristotle can do. I can give you an answer, a provisional answer. What most people understood by piety at the time was to pray and to sacrifice. Yeah. Read Plato's duty from. Now, for Aristotle, surely sacrifices had no importance. I mean, except as a civic affair, you know, that uh, rich people uh, put at the disposal of the community a couple of oxen, or whatever it may be, and it's a fine and uh, gracious festival. But uh, he did not believe for one moment that the gods were pleased by them, or that one could influence them. For Aristotle, piety, we can say, the truth of piety is knowledge of God. And this knowledge of God is what he calls theology or metaphysics, or what is was called by other people metaphysics. Therefore, Aristotle has a reasoning, but you have to disinterpret. And partly that reasoning you would find in that famous 12th book of the metaphysics, where he takes issue with the popular notion of gods and uh, presents his theology against that. That would be... Uh, would be the, uh, an important uh, part of the argument. In addition, he has in the ethics uh, something which uh, comes close to a discussion of piety, then the sense of shame at the end of Book 4. Of sense of shame, I do sacred reverence, or however you wish to translate it, that is in a way the core of piety. And Aristotle says, with an amazing uh, bluntness, it is not a virtue. He omits the aspect of reverence. He leaves it only a sense of shame, not to say bashfulness. And he says, well, that is a good quality in young people, because young people are bound to make mistakes, and then, of course, they should be ashamed of them rather than to be obstinate. But a mature gentleman does not make mistakes. He has nothing ever to repent. Here we are at the opposite pole of biblical morality, obviously. Uh, and I mean that uh, there is no man who does not sin. That is not, I sort of deny that. So now let us, is there any other question of a general kind? Yes. Uh, in the translations, it seems that both the word science and the word art is used to refer to politics. But I believe you suggested that we use the word to refer to Yes, well, he says politique, and that is an adjective, and therefore in need of a noun. The, well, if you wanted to say literally, you would have to say the political one. But which, what one? I mean, is this, is this an art or is this a science? And I believe the least dangerous and the least prejudging translation would be ability. And that is left open, is this, is this a science or is this an art or is this it neither? Which I would, uh, that I would uh, uh, say, I would then translate rather the political ability if the political one is too harsh as a translation, uh, then to say, then to make up Aristotle's mind for him which I think a translator should not do. What is Aristotle's distinction between art and science? 
book six, book six. Well, very, very generally, an art produces something. For example, a shoe, a statue, a drama. Whereas a science is not does not produce anything. It it only looks at and studies and follows. If the mathematician does not produce triangles or circles or something, but he <coughs> uh, and the ones which he produces on the blackboard are of course not the ones which he has in mind qua mathematician. That is very rough is it? And there is a third thing which Aristotle distinguished from the two of them, which he calls phronesis in Greek, P H R O N E S I S, and that is ordinarily translated by practical wisdom. It would be simpler to translate it by prudence. If prudence had not undergone such a depreciation that it means almost the same as rascality, for Aristotle, prudence is something very high and uh, in- inseparable <coughs> from moral virtue, uh, as he makes the also in Book 6. Now, and when he leaves it open, whether politics is an art or a science or maybe something third, what he is playing with is a possibility that politics might be neither a science or art but a form of prudence. And he develops that thought in Book 6. But we cannot always uh, run ahead. We must uh, proceed in a slightly uh, somewhat more orderly manner. But on the other hand, it would of course be very bad if, as Mr. Vedavan put it, I were acting like Trasimachus. I was forbidding to raise certain questions. I'm not forbidding any question. Uh, but I only say it is intelligible that some men would forbid some questions. Yeah? For example, the question, why this? It's intelligible whether I, I am in favor that it should be raised. But it is, of course, a very dangerous step because uh, that in uh, that moment I uh, joined the society association of uh, gangsters. Why should one be square? They put it in their elegant language. <laughs> Good. Good. Now let us proceed. Uh, well, I remind you briefly of the connection. He, Aristotle has found that there is at least one name used by all men for the high school. The name happens. But that is about all, because then the disagreement starts, and the chief cleavage is that between the many and the graceful or the fine ones. Later he calls, speaks even of the wise ones. And the many say uh, happiness consists in such things as uh, pleasure or wealth or honor. And even there is a greater variety. Sometimes we would say the same individual says, now wealth is the greatest good. And the next day he says, well, and because in the meantime he has, uh, is, has been restored to health and he forgets about how much is the need of it. Now this is one thing. And then there is another view, who, um, other view to which he alludes, in, in, I mean that some have thought that at the side of all these many things which are regarded as good by most people, there is one good, another one, by itself, which is even the cause of the goodness of all the other things. So honor, wealth, pleasure, etc. are good only by virtue of that good in itself. This is a reference to Plato, as we have seen. Now, he de- in the passage to which we turn now, he will refute these views, both the vulgar views and the Platonic. And now let's begin. 95b, 14. Yeah. But let us continue from this point where we like to progress. To judge from men's lives the not unreasonable conceptions of the good or happiness that seem to prevail that seem to prevail among them are the following. On the one hand, the many and the most vulgar identify it with pleasure and accordingly are content with the life of enjoyment. For there are three especially prominent 
prominent lives, the one just mentioned, the life of politics. And the life of politics. And the life of politics. And the third. And thirdly, the, the theoretical life. Yeah. The many then show themselves to be utterly slavish, slavish by preferring what is only a life for cattle. But they get a hearing for their view as reasonable because many persons of high position share the taste of Sardinopolis. And let us stop here, perhaps, for a moment. So there is a variety of opinions regarding happiness. It is limited now by a consideration not of the arts, as it was before, but of the ways of life, something very different from the arts. There are three most outstanding ways of life, and the most common view gains credence because some men of very high standing chose it, like Sadhana Nepal, of whom he speaks here. In other words, there would be no first moment, a first glance impression that pleasure would be the highest good because of the lowness of the people who say that, but for the fact that we find some men of high standing, rulers, emperors, kings, leaders, what have you, who by deed assert that pleasure is the highest good. But of course, that is almost a joke. The fact that there are men of high standing in this sense who take the most vulgar view does not make the most vulgar view more respectable in the eyes of men of judgment. If this view were correct, that pleasure is the objective of life, the highest objective, then a dog who has a good master uh, would be happier than most men, and which no sensible man would assert. Uh, the the, the Aristotle was not sentimental regarding dogs. But, of course, uh, no one dares to say that the, a merely brutish life would be a happier life. No one in his senses, it is. Now, let us go on. The graceful, on the other hand, and the practical, think it's honor. For this may be said to be the end of the life of politics. But it appears that uh, but it, I mean, honor appears more superficial, uh, or seems to be more superficial than that which we are seeking. For it appears to depend on those who confer it more than on him upon whom it is conferred. Whereas we suppose that, that the good things must be something proper to its possessor and not easily to be taken away from him. So, in other words, the first notion of happiness which Aristotle thinks is worth serious consideration, is that according to which honor is happiness. Honor is distinguished from bodily pleasure. Clearly, brutes are not concerned with honor. I mean, they are, I mean, I say it with all respect to uh, those of you who love dogs, maybe own dogs, but they want, they like to be petted and to be much made of, but it is not the same as honor. Honor cannot be happiness, since honor depends on the honoring man rather than the honored one. If uh, a man may deserve honor to the highest degree, but if no one honors him, he does not enjoy honor. This is not obvious. And now we guess somehow. We divine, as Aristotle says with, a, uh, with an expression, like very much by Plato, he divine, gave some inkling, that happiness is something which cannot be so easily taken away, and it depends on the happy man himself rather than on, on others, because if it were dependent, if happiness were dependent on others, and it, oh, the happiness would be the frailest thing in the world, much more frail than it is on any other hypothesis. So, let us go on. Yet, men's motive in pursuing honor 
Yeah, what Anasar, what he doesn't bring out is this furthermore. That is a favorite word with Anasar. Furthermore, in addition, besides, sometimes there's a N arguments without making them out of a systematic order of them. It's just a numerous. Yes, it were cases, look here. Someone says A is B. Anasar says, no. Look here, look here, look here. Look here, look here, and uh, there might be, and if someone says, oh, even there you would say, yes, why not? But Alistair doesn't think it necessary, or perhaps he has forgotten it, and thinks the other arguments which he had used are uh, sufficient. So in this sense, Alistair is, quote, unsystematic, and perhaps the most unsystematic of all philosophers, or as one could, as I would prefer to say, he is, Quote, empirical. He asks us to look around in all directions. Now, the second argument is then? At least they seek to be honored by the truth. No, no, before you omitted this. Furthermore, they seem to pursue honor so that they will trust that they themselves are good men. Yes, now go on. At least they seek to be honored by the truth, and by men who know them. And on and, the ground... And on the ground of virtue. It is, it is clear, therefore, that according to them... According to them, at any rate... At any rate, uh, virtue is greater. And one might perhaps accordingly suppose that virtue, rather than honor, is the end of the political life. Yes. Now, he also continues his argument against the assertion that the highest good is honor, because this would, of course, be particularly attractive to gentlemen, honor. And then, therefore, it is necessary to make this clear, but one cannot leave it at that. The concern with honor, Aristotle says, is in the service of one's concern with one's virtue. If a man is truly ambitious, truly concerned with recognition. And so he wants to be recognized for his genuine merits and not for, for, for qualities which he doesn't have, for actions which he has not done. Otherwise, he would be a ridiculous boaster. So that, therefore, not honor, but virtue would be happiness. Or more precisely, virtue would be the end of the political life, as distinguished from the third one, which he had mentioned, namely the theoretical life. This inadequacy of honor, that it necessarily points away from itself to virtue, this is, this is part of the criticism of Rasimakos and Caliclus. Out of it. Yes. In this light, then, how would you interpret the last sentence in Book One, where it talks about happiness being something that is in itself to be honored? Yeah, but that is that that is Timion. That here honor has a different meaning. Yes. Has a different meaning, and and has almost the same meaning as divine. And that, but we cannot take this up now. But uh, I only mentioned this, that it was not conflict, uh, a conflict with this here, that honor is a very dubious, I mean, it, it is, of course, highly desirable, but if it is true honor, and true honor means that one deserves it, and not that one has a kind of clientele, uh, who, which, uh, like that of Mr. Pelvis also, that is, of course, something which some people regard as honor to be mentioned all the time in, in columns, you know, or in newspapers. But that is not because in the moment the man is dead or has lost his ability to charm such large masses of men, he will be completely forgotten, like a beachcomber and, and of no interest. The genuine honor presupposes that one deserves the honor, and therefore the ground of honor is 
the, the, the service. Virtue. Yes. But even virtue appears to be a more incomplete end, since it appears possible to possess it while you are asleep, or without putting it into practice throughout the whole of your life, and also for the virtuous man to suffer the greatest misery and misfortune, and no one would pronounce a man living a life of misery to be happy, unless for the sake of maintaining a paradox. Yes. That's easy, sir. Yet Aristotle goes on and says, well, now we seem to have reached the end. Happiness is virtue. But unfortunately, difficulties arise even here. A, a virtue is inadequate for two reasons. First, a man could have a given virtue without ever exercising it. For example, if he's always asleep, then he cannot exercise any virtue. Well, to, or to take an Aristotelian example, a man may have a true habit of munificence, but if he is poor, he cannot be munificent. I mean, if he, uh, it's, it's absolutely not given to him. That's one point. And secondly, the man possessing virtue may live in the greatest misery, uh, i.e., in the greatest unhappiness. How can you call such a man happy? Now, these are not the last words of Aristotle on this subject, but this is only meant to show in a provisional way that there is a deeper question here uh, into which we must enter. So, we learn, however, one thing perhaps provisionally, or by intimation. Happiness has something to do with the exercise of virtue and not with virtue as a mere habit, which as such may be dormant. And this, the fact that happiness is in the exercise, consists in the exercise of virtue, excludes that one lives in the greatest misery. You, if you exercise your virtues, you cannot live in the greatest misery. If you are completely poor, if you are completely paralyzed bodily, and you cannot exercise, or if you are insane, you cannot exercise. Therefore, a certain amount of external goods, equipment is a good translation for the word Aristotle uses, surely gear, is necessary for being virtuous. It's a harsh judgment, but I think you will understand it in certain circles, in, as a matter of fact, in quite numerous circles, this is a view throughout the centuries. That it is not the highest view of human perfection, Aristotle does not deny. But the question is, what is that which is higher than the virtue which you cannot have except if you are healthy and well, and uh, of good parentage and so on? And the answer is theoretical virtue. In, in other words, where the Bible puts love, Aristotle puts theory, but Bible and Aristotle agree that moral virtue as such, however important it is, cannot have raised the highest claim. And coming back for one moment to an earlier question of Mr. Wettergreen, why Aristotle does not speak, uh, speaks throughout the book, or almost throughout the book, of moral virtue and not of that highest. Well, I will use a similar. The moon and things which appear particularly beautifully in moonlight would never reveal their beauty and their splendor in the light of the sun. Therefore, I shall keep the sun in its state after, before rising or after setting, so that this moon landscape of moral virtue, it gets all the attention and all the respect which it deserves. Makes sense. Does this make sense? Good. Now, so that is understood, alludes here already, that happiness consists in the exercise of virtue and therefore presupposes equipment. But it is interesting that Aristotle does not say it here. He prepares, he, first of all, he wants to 
to shake us out of our complacency by indicating to us that there are great difficulties. And then only after we have become aware of the difficulties will we appreciate the answer. Yes. No? But we need not pursue this subject since it has been sufficiently treated in the ordinary discussion. But the third type of life is the theoretical, which we shall make in the sequel later on. You know, which, which we shall uh, consider in the sequel, yeah. So the only, uh, only the theoretical life seems to survive the first critical survey of the pleasure, bodily pleasure, honor, and virtue. But again, this is not said by Aristotle. It is only an, a prelude, as it were, for one must have good ears to hear what will come later. It's not stated. Yes. But the materialistic life? No, the money making. Money making. Life is uh, something forced, and clearly uh, wealth is not the good we are in search for, for it is only useful and means to something else. On this score, indeed, one might conceive the ends before mentioned to have a better claim, for they are enjoyed for their own sake. Left for their own sake. But even they do not really seem to be... Uh, so desired good. However, many arguments have been laid down in regard to them, so we may dismiss them. Yeah. So that is the end of this provisional discussion of the common views. Now what he says here yeah, is a kind of appendix about <coughs> the money-making. And he rejects it as violent. Violent means here against nature. There is something unnatural in making money one's happiness. A man who makes pleasure his happiness or honor is more reasonable than the man who makes money his happiness. Because money is, or wealth in general, is only a, evidently a means for the good life and cannot be under any circumstances, even in the most superficial consideration, be regarded as the end. <coughs> well, you can see it more simply, I believe, when you look at a miser. And when you take a man of ambition, even of not of the highest kind, there is a certain uh, attractiveness about that. But the miser, is, there is something unnatural about him, who heaps treasures upon treasures and never uses them. Yes. How are we to regard the sequence of this discussion? First he drops back. He first he starts with pleasure, then he goes, ascends to honor, and then to the life of contemplation, but it seems to me... That virtue in between, don't forget that. Yes, virtue, and then contemplation, and then he goes back to... Money making, which yeah, that is a kind of appendix, that's it. There's a kind of appendix. Someone might, might say, after all, he had spoken before, at the very beginning of the world, of wealth as one of these goods. And someone might say, well, why do you, did you not say a word about wealth as the highest good? And then he says, well, that is so patently absurd, therefore I did not speak about it. So this is the first provisional discussion of the commonly accepted notions of the good of happiness. And Aristotle turns now the next to a discussion of um, the alternative view. The alternative view, namely that good is something radically different from all these goods, and it is an absolute good as we can provisionally say. And that is the doctrine of Plato. Plato's doctrine of the idea of the good, of which others, we know of it, of the Platonic doctrine, of, of, from uh, the few passages in Book 6 and 7 of the Republic. Aristotle had, of course, opportunities to talk to Plato, and Plato seems to have given some lectures on the good lectures, which have, and Plato uh, did not write them down, they have not been preserved. But surely Aristotle had access to information 
uh, which we necessarily lack. But before we do that, before we turn to Aristotle's critique of Plato's notion of the idea of the good, we have to consider for one moment that Platonic doctrine of which the doctrine of the idea of the good is the peak. Very simply stated, Plato teaches that there are self-subsisting ideas and they form a kind of order. And at the top of it, ruling all, is the idea of the good. So if we do not have some understanding of what ideas in the Platonic sense are, we will be unable to understand what the idea of the good is, and therefore we will be unable to understand Aristotle's criticism. Now, I will try to make things as simple for you as I can, and I take here a passage from Sir David Ross's Plato's Theory of Ideas and the Retrospect, where he summarizes the argument, page 225 following. Now, well, I have to read to you a page simply. The essence of the theory of the idea of ideas lay in the conscious recognition of the fact that there is a class of entities for which the best name is probably universals that are entirely different from sensible things. Any use of language involves a recognition either conscious or unconscious, of the fact that there are such entities. For every word used, every, except proper names, every abstract noun, every general noun, every adjective, every verb, every pronoun and every preposition, preposition is a name for something of which there are or may be instances. The first step towards the conscious recognition of this class of entities was, if we may believe Aristotle, taken by Socrates, when he concentrated on the search for definitions. To ask for the meaning of a general word was a step from the mere use of such a word towards the recognition of universals as a distinct class of entities. But Socrates seems to have been interested in the defining of one thing at a time and not to have seen the general significance of what he was doing. Plato did see that what was common to all searches for definitions was the assumptions that there are such things as universals. He saw, too, that the objective difference between universals and particulars answers to the subjective difference between science and sense perception. In other words, science deals with universals and sense perception deals with particulars. The senses present to us a world of particular events in which qualities are present almost inex ex inextricably conjoined and confused. If we were le left to the senses, Alone, we should never be able to disentangle those qualities and reach a clear understanding of the structure of the world. But in reason, we have a faculty by which we can grasp universals in their pure form and to some extent see the relations that necessarily exist between these universals. The best example we have of this power is to be found in mathematics. And Plato was the first thinker who clearly saw this. When we say that two and two make four, we are implying not that we have often experienced instances in which this is so, and never found an instance to the contrary, but that we perceive that from the nature of the system of numbers, this must be so. And what is true of two and two make four is true of the most advanced mathematical propositions. In mathematics, Plato saw the clearest example 
of the mind's power of perceiving relations between universals. And that is why in the Republic it makes mathematics the necessary introduction to philosophy. But it was for him only the introduction. He envisaged the possibility of our similarly perceiving necessary relation between other universals than those treated of by mathematics. And in the Phaedo he gives us one, and in the Sophists, in the sophists another modest installment of such insight. In the main, this is still an unfulfilled aspiration. But we owe it to Plato that we have the aspiration at all. He expressed sometimes the aspiration too sanguinely, as when in the Republic he speaks of deducing the whole nature of the system of ideas from a single, unhypothetical first principle. He means by that the idea of the good, in that he was mistaken, and so on. Do you understand that? What is the universe? Give, a, give a, one of you, give me an example. Or a particular, then we will... Yes. The idea is the chair. Chair. Okay. Yeah. Well, let us say a chair. Or a table, because it's in front of it. A table. And a table is this particular table. And then Plato says, but when, I, when we are asked, what is that? Table. But we say this in N cases, in a way even of this here, and, and of many other things of this kind, that shows that table means not merely this table here, but any table. It applies to all tables. It is a universal. And these universals were, uh, in a way, discovered by Socrates as such, so that it's made clear what men always did in all times and places, because there is always language. And language consists to cons consider part of non-proper names. Because when we say, uh, for example, Tom Ingerman, I don't see him here, that, oh, he's sitting somewhere, Tom Ingerman, then this is this individual. Even if there are 35 men of the same name, in a big, some big city, it would still be not a universal, but a proper name. Or LBJ, this individual. Good. Now, what, what does this mean? This is surely a great question, this universal. There was a famous uh, controversy in the Middle Ages, the so-called controversy about the universals. But, what, uh, what does this mean? After all, we are not logicians here. We are political scientists, and it must mean something for us when Plato presents this doctrine in their political work, like the Republic. So we must try... I will first try to show why Sir David's view is, I think, ultimately impossible. For, I mean, for the following reason. If he were correct, that Plato meant by ideas, universals, then there would be ideas of everything of which we have a term, a word, that is not a proper name. So there would be, for example, and, and the ideas are going to Plato eternal. There would therefore be an eternal idea of the vice president of the farm laborers. Naturally. That's not a proper name. And it's applied to N people uh, who are vice presidents of farm labor. Mm. And why, sh what is, uh, what is, uh, and Plato said not only there are such universes, he said they are self-subsisting. There is a self-subsisting idea of the vice president of the labor, farm labor union. Why should there be? What's the need of it? This is not an absolutely ridiculous duplication of what is. In a way, that is what Aristotle means, but we have to go a bit further in order to understand that. Now, what did Plato have in mind when, according to the tradition, deviating from Socrates, he said 
the ideas are self-subsisting and cannot possibly be sensible things. Now, there are two kinds of phenomena of which he certainly thought. And the first is mathematics, as David says. For example, a circle of which the mathematician speaks, or a triangle, is never the circle drawn on the blackboard. Because what you draw the blackboard is, is not a triangle, it's a very absurd, complicated curve, and only because we uh, say for our purposes, we regard it as a triangle. These are not lines, these are uh, spaces, the sides of a triangle at the table. So the, but the mathematical things as meant in mathematical discourse are radically different from all sensible things. We must use the mind's eye, as he says, from the bodily eye, in order to see triangle, circle, number seven, or whatever it may be. But here you, there is a certain difficulty. In mathematics, you can have, for example, if you take a certain kind of, of triangle, you can have a large number of triangles with the same angles and the same sides. There's no difficulty in that. And this is somehow what, in Plato's eyes, speaks against the ultimate importance of mathematics as these the mathematical objects can be indefinitely multiplied. I mean, not that you can uh, go on with numbers, that's all right. You don't multiply by saying 4,912, 4,913, because it's always a different number. But you can add up 4,912 and 4,912, another 4,912. So there are two of these ideal things. And that is something uh, which um, uh, led Plato to go beyond that. Now, where did Plato find some evidence for the view that there are such sub subsistent things? And a very old and respectable answer, which is good enough as far as it goes, says in the moral phenomena, say justice. We know of just men. We know of just laws. We know of just institutions. But a little bit reflection will suffice in all cases that no human being, no law, no institution is perfectly just. If the term justice or just is not to be wholly meaningless, there must be justice beyond every just phenomenon which we can see. So, and in the light of which idea, we can diagnose any human beings, any law, any institution, and see to what extent is it just, and to what extent it is not just. Good. Now, th this, this phenomenon seems to have been of the utmost importance for Sogers and Plato. But this does not yet suffice in the first place because it does not answer the question what is the relation between the mathematical objects and the moral objects, if I may call justice a moral object. There are also, after all, there are other things in the world apart from mathematical uh, things and the moral things. There are, for example, dogs and cats in the world. Now, what is then at the root of this doctrine of ideas? The simple root and not these twofold uh, mathematics, uh, mathematical things and ethical things where we do not see the unity. Now, the word most common used by Plato for ideas, ide in Greek, it can be translated, more, is frequently translated as correctly, the forms, the looks, the shapes, but also the kinds of things. And this is indeed the concern of Socrates, and in a, perhaps in a modified manner, we do not know enough to decide that question, of Plato. Let me try to explain that. I begin from difficulties which we all experience today. 
today when we hear of social science, especially of scientific procedure, scientific statements and so on, it is always understood that the man in the street, say the voter, for example, does not make his decision on the basis of scientific reasoning. There is such a thing as pre-scientific thought. And this distinction is absolutely indispensable and universally admitted. Pre-scientific thought. For example, if I know uh, in my poor way that there are uh, presidential elections every fourth year, that's not scientific knowledge. I just uh, found this by reading uh, the newspapers and perhaps even the text of the U.S. Constitution. But there is nothing scientific about this knowledge. And no social scientist, however sophisticated he may be, does not know this fact of the, uh, that there are presidential elections every fourth year in any way better than the simplest man in the street. Yes, well, the question is this, the controversy is this. Is it not the ideal goal of science, or more particularly social science, to get rid of all pre-scientific knowledge. In other words, people admit, of course, that we are bound by, uh, we have to start always from pre-scientific knowledge, but some people have the notion what social science does is to transform this pre-scientific knowledge into scientific knowledge. And only by virtue of this transformation Will our pre-scientific knowledge, will we arrive at genuine knowledge? Pre-scientific knowledge being something like folklore, an expression used by uh, some representatives of this view. Now, I would like to make clear to you, by a simple example, that this is an absolutely fantastic goal. Let us assume that you are sociologists. I wish to go out of our sacred precincts. And someone, uh, your professor, would tell you to make some field study and find out, say, uh, uh, alcoholism or other things which sociologists are concerned. He should ask people about their opinion. Now, and he will give you the most precise uh, suggestions. But one thing he will not tell you how to tell a human being from a non-human being. He takes it for granted that you know that. And if you would not know that, you would be wholly unfit to be a student of sociology or of social science, or political science, or of any other science. Now, how do you know how to tell a human being from a non-human being? Where did you learn it? In high school? No. <laughs> in, in grammar school? No. But you just grew up with it. You can't know a day, uh, say, the precise day where you use for the first time the word human being with some understanding that you cannot call this a human being or a dog a human being, an only a human being. And if you try to find out what do you mean by a human being, you will get into great troubles. And no lesser man than Plato proposed, on one occasion at least, that what we mean by human being is, if spelled out, nothing but a non-feathered biped. <laughs> you know, uh, feathered bipeds we all know, but a man is a biped without feathers. And uh, this is uh, not uh, quite sufficient, as uh, we all can see. Now, here we have a simple example that there is all this pre-scientific knowledge presupposed by social science. And this pre-scientific knowledge is never transformed into scientific knowledge in, the pro in social science itself. Now, this presupposition of all possible science is, and this kind of presupposition, is the theme of Sogades and Plato and Aristotle. Now, to make this a bit more clear, let us consider not just modern social science, but the classic Greek alternative to Socratic, Platonic, Aristotelian philosophy. 
And the greatest and most best known alternative of that is atomism, ancient atomism. Now, what is the situation here? According to atomism, all things consist of atoms, of various sizes and shapes. So to understand a cat, a dog, a lion, a man, is to know of which atoms or kind of atoms is composed. And the, as it were, if you know a, a, a compound consisting of so and so many atoms of this kind, of this shape, so and so many atoms of the other shape, and so on, then you would know that the formula, I'm speaking already modern now, in a modern manner, that the formula for the dog, the other one is the formula for the cat, and so on. I believe you have no difficulty in following at this point. Now here, what is the, Plat the Socratic Platonic objection to this kind of procedure? Must I not know in advance what a cat, a lion, a man is before I can trace them to their atomic compositions? And must I not know in advance? Otherwise, I might investigate the atomic composition of a being which is neither a man, nor a cat, nor a lion. What kind of knowledge is that? This is a knowledge which we all have, and which we have by virtue of having grown up. An obvious and at the same time mysterious faculty. So Socrates asked, oh, and his followers asked for the what is of each kind of things. I didn't ask what is the what is of Ajibayanis, of ABJ, however you might think, but the word is of man, of cat, of table, of chair, what have you. And if we can uh, state the argument against, the simple argument against atomism or anything of this kind, would be to this effect. Atomism would reduce the essential differences to differences of size or shape of atoms. But the essential difference, they are the point. Let me take an example from political science. There are people who try to present the issue between liberal democracy and its alternatives in the following manner. They say in both, form, in both systems, you find freedom. After all, and I think the Russian citizen, uh, even the Chinese citizen, has the freedom to walk in certain parts of the cities, freedom to speak, and some other freedoms, without any question. But on the other hand, there is always coercion, even in liberal democracies. People are arrested, and here as well as in Soviet Russia. So the ideal task would be to describe the liberal, liberal democracy on the one hand, and say communism on the other, by saying, what the percentage or range of percentages is of freedom and coercion, which makes a certain system liberal democratic and another communist. As a consequence, that, assuming that this could be done, it would reduce the essential difference to a quantitative difference. You have so and so many percent of freedom in this system and so, so many percent of uh, of coercion in the one system and so, so many percents of freedom and coercion in the other. You would lose the essential difference. You see perhaps from this example that this is not merely an academic question, but has to do with the crucial question which which all human beings are concerned, the difference between the essential differences, or as one could also say, see principles of importance. Now, the implication of this view, then, that there are essential differences, and the essential differences are that thing which counts above everything else. This view implies that the whole consists of kinds of beings, not of kinds of atoms. There may be atoms, but this is 
long question. But the kinds of beings, men, dog, cats, what have you, to understand the whole is, or is above all, to understand the kinds of things in their order. For example, to know that a plant is lower than a, a, um, an animal, and that a dumb animal is lower than man, to mention only the most obvious examples. Philosophy is here not so much cosmogony, an explanation of how the whole cosmos came into being, say, out of atoms and the void, but cosmology, to present the logos of the cosmos, of the finished, completed cosmos. You can easily see how very important for this whole approach was the emergence of evolutionism in the 19th century. Because if one would translate a Darwin style, the origin of the species, into Greek, I think the most reasonable translation, although not the most literal one, would be Genesis ton idon, the coming to being of these forms, of the ide ideas. And then you see, where is a contemplate to the ideas, cannot come into being and cannot perish. But the question, nevertheless, in spite of the tremendous importance of which the evolution the hypothesis has for all human thought, at least in the case of man, and what is, what is the essential difference between man and the other beings, is as urgent as it always has been. And this question cannot be disposed of by any discoveries of ever more intermediate forms between some non-men and men, because at a certain moment, the quantitative difference between this and the size of the brain, or whatever it is, turns into the qualitative difference that you have now a being which can speak, coherently talk. Now, when people talk today about uh, the human condition which has taken the place of human nature, or the essence of man, or the nature of man. And then, of course, this is presupposes the nature of man, nevertheless, because the human condition is exactly the condition of a being which has the nature of man. Now, as for the difference between Plato and Aristotle. Aristotle, Plato says that these ideas of dogs, cats, justice, and so on and so on, are self-subsisting. Or, as he says in poetic language, they are self-subsisting in a super-heavenly place. The gods are in heaven. But beyond heaven, there is, are still more remote and more grand places. And there the ideas Dwell. And uh, things here, the sensible things, the dogs, cats, lions, and human beings we only see, are only by virtue of these ideas dwelling in the super and heavenly place. Now, to repeat what I said before, the evidence which Plato has, you can make more clear to yourself uh, by thinking of the example of justice. Plato asserts, and that is implied in the doctrine of ideas, no human being, no law, no institution can be unqualifiedly just as a consequence because it is a particular thing. Aristotle is not so demanding, and Aristotle is perfectly satisfied that there are many people who are just, perhaps not too many, but quite a few. And laws can be just, institutions can be just. I will state the difference between Plato and Aristotle as follows, and from an Aristotelian point of view. From Plato is compelled to say the true dog, the dog in itself, 
the dog dwelling in the heavenly, super heavenly place doesn't run around, doesn't eat food, dog food or others, does not generate dogs, but is wholly unchangeable. And Aristotle says that's nonsense. The true dog is of course a dog which runs around and uh, barks and does all the other things which dogs do. Aristotle, here be in many other cases, common sense itself against his less commonsensical great teacher. But what would Plato, would be Plato be reduced to silence by this powerful argument? No, for the following reason. A true dog. What does it mean? From Aristotle's point of view, which is, I think, also our ordinary point of view. When a farmer, let me say, or a sheriff, says, bring me a dog, and the fellow brings him a puppy, then he would say, did I tell you to bring a puppy? No, he would bring a dog. Or if he brings a very sick old dog about to expire, he say, this is a dog, it's a sick dog, an old dog. So the dog, without qualifications, like too young to be a dog or too old to be a dog, is a true dog. That would be a dog of, uh, in, the, in, his maturity, in its maturity and healthy, a normal dog. Normal, not in the sense of statistical average, but where the word norm still means norm. Normal uh, is still derived from norm. It's a, it's a true dog, and that is a being which can, by itself, live as a dog and do the doggish things. Good. And that here Plato comes in and says, well, one of the doggish things of the utmost importance is the generation of new dogs. Now, if you look at this here dog, it will always be invariably either a male or female dog, and neither of which is competent to generate by itself another dog. And therefore, if you want to see the true dog, the perfect dog, you will not find it in any individual. Now apply this to the human race. Let us assume that men like Socrates are the most perfect human beings, and, and, and a wonderful character, in addition, he generated children. He didn't write books, but still, that is perhaps more important than he generated children. And uh, bore his uh, Xantippe with all uh, dignity and propriety. And you know the other qualities, so that's uh, good. But he, is he a perfect human being? Would Socrates be possible if there were not people who were paving roads, building temples, and uh, making shoes. So he didn't make his shoes. When, and the few occasions when he needed them, he had to have bought them. So that no human being is self-sufficient. And in other words, a great jump now, the whole human race is the whole human kind the whole human species is the perfect man. And here there is a kind of, one can understand here why the idos, the term for idea for form, means at the same time, of course, literally to say it, the species. That is Plato's point against Aristotle. And uh, now this complete thing uh, it's sufficient for all purposes of the species, you will not find in any individual. And you have to go beyond it, either to the idea of dog, the dogness, or, uh, which is, or to the whole species. But you cannot go to the whole species if you don't know what it makes a being a member of the species. And that means something beyond every individual, 
and comprising all of them. So this much about the background of this great struggle between Plato and Aristotle, of which we find, uh, which shows in all, on various levels in Aristotle's criticism of Plato, not only in the theoretical works, but also in the political works. Uh, uh, the critique of Plato's Republican laws in the second book of the politics, and here the critique of Plato's doctrine of the idea of the good in our Nicomachean ethics. And we will turn to that next time. And, uh, yes. Oh, well, that is the intention that he make with this version along, but he surely takes it for the Yes. On the other hand, a limit has to be assumed in these relationships. For if the list be extended to one's ancestors and descendants and to the friends of one's friends, it will go on ad infinitum. But this is a point which must be considered later on. We take a self-sufficient thing to mean a thing which merely standing by itself alone renders life desirable and lacking in nothing, and such a thing we deem happiness to be. Moreover, we think happiness the most desirable of all good things without being itself reckoned as one among the rest. For if it were so reckoned, it is clear that we should consider it more desirable when even the smallest of other good things were combined with it since this addition would result in a larger total of good, and of two goods, the greater is always the more desirable. Yeah, now let us stop here. You see here this brief discussion, how far do you extend that? I mean, that it is clear that if you are happy for yourself, but your nearest and dearest are very miserable, your happiness will not be complete. But how far do you extend your nearest and dearest? Must cousins also come in like brothers and sisters? And if cousins, also cousins of the second degree? And where do you stop? No universal answer is possible. That is a simple illustration of the inexactness, of the lack of exactness in moral matters. In some cases, a very closely knit family the cousins even count as much as brothers and sisters, and in other cases, perhaps not even all brothers and sisters are important for assessing one's own happiness. The question which Aristotle raises here by implication, which we read, is this. Will happiness be increased by intelligence and virtue? Or does happiness necessarily include intelligence and happiness? And Aristotle's general answer, as you will see soon, is the latter. So there cannot be happiness here and the virtues there, but the virtues are, as it were, the core of happiness. So this question he um, uh, tries to answer, and that is his final answer to the question of what happiness is, that uh, comes in the next passage, of which we might perhaps read the beginning. Happiness, therefore, being found to be something final and self-sufficient, is the end at which all actions aim. Yeah, is the end of the practicable goods, yeah. would be perhaps more precise. Yes? To say, however, that the supreme good is happiness will probably appear a truism. <laughs> We still require a more explicit account of what constitutes happiness. Perhaps then we may arrive at this by ascertaining what is man's function. Yes, well, let us say work, because the word function is not so grossly misused. And let us leave the simple word, word which I saw usually, the work of man. What is the work of man? Yes. For the goodness or efficiency of a flute player, or sculptor, or craftsman of any sort, and in general of anybody who has some work or business to perform, is thought to reside in that function. And that's work. I doubt that work. And similarly, it may be held that the good of man resides in the work of man. Yeah. If he has and it is the, 
So Aristotle tries now to reach a solution to the question of what happiness is. Now, happiness is a good state of man, and not only a good state, but the best state of man. And now the, uh, the question, Aristotle raises here the question, where is goodness located altogether? And he takes first the example of the arts or artisans. For example, say a carpenter. How do we distinguish a good carpenter from a bad or indifferent carpenter? By looking at the tables which the two carpenters produce, at the work. Now, let us try this with man. Is there not also a specific work of man as man by which we can distinguish between the good man and the bad man? Now, we must here uh, note that uh, therefore they translated by function. And the Greek word work, and I believe also the English word work, leaves it open whether the work is something outside self-subsisting after it has been completed, like the table or the shoe, or where the work is an action. Can one not say it? So, uh, therefore, Aristotle, is there a work of man as men, a specific work of man? If that is so, then human goodness, and in particular the highest form of goodness, happiness, will consist in a specific work. And if you do not like the word work, say activity. But the Greek word ergon comprises both. The work in the sense of the, like shoe, or the activity. And that Aristotle tries now to find in the sequel the answer to this question. But the general answer is this, that man specific uh, work, his specific activity, his rationality, and therefore the goodness of man will consist in the goodness of his rationality, i.e. if he uses his reason for destroying his reason, say, by becoming alcoholic, then he is a bad man. But if he cultivates his reason, and makes the most of it, and the best of it, then he's a good man. And there are certain minor, uh, important distinctions, but secondary distinctions, into which I do not have to go now. So the answer which Aristotle arrives at, in a few more steps, which we will we'll consider next time, is this. Happiness consists in virtuous or excellent activity but specifically human activity. A man may be an excellent tightrope dancer, but this does not make him an excellent man, because tightrope dancing is not the activity characteristic of men. Men may, maybe only men can tightrope dance, I do not have no opinion on this matter, but it is surely not the activity characteristic of men. To be an excellent man means to be able to do the work of man in an reasoning in an excellent manner. And if this is so, we already include that the excellent man must have some means, because he must means outside of his good intentions. He must be, for example, if he were completely paralyzed, could not even speak, then he cannot do the works of men. He is an unfortunate man, a proper object of compassion, but he cannot be an excellent man. How can we know how we would act if we were not paralyzed? And also, if it is true that there are certain activities of men which require a modicum of wealth, uh, as uh, was the case in prior to the age of affluence, 
event where we'll be quite a few human beings who will be unable to do the work of men lacking the means of support. Very unfortunate, but Arabic still implies it cannot be changed. The main point is this. I speaking of virtuous activity, Aristotle includes the external means of conditions of happiness in his definition of happiness. And therefore these poses of the difficulty which he had made with which he had confronted us shortly before. At the end of this section, which began which we just began, there is again a discussion of what they call method, meaning what is the degree of exactness to be expected in such matters, modern matters. There are altogether three discussions. We, that it will be the third. We will come to that next time. Now we make here, here a stop. Is there any question we, uh, we would raise? Yes. Mr. Kuda. When Aristotle says that the truth is to be preferred to one's friends, does this apply only to those who discuss ethics, or does it also apply to gentlemen simply? Yeah, but as Aristotle means it here, it applies, it does not apply to non-philosophers. If it means it, even understood in a different sense, for example, must a friend be a witness before court against his friend and say the truth rather than save his friend? That, uh, I suppose, he would say in this case, unless it is a terribly tyrannical regime, he would have to say the truth, because he's under oath after all. But uh, as he means it, here the question arises only for philosophers, because the truth is theoretical or speculative truth. And in that sense, again, we see the difference between the man who addresses the audience and the nature of the audience itself, because certainly the audience itself would be more inclined to prefer their friends to the truth. As a general rule. Yeah, the, the, you could almost say that is the definition of the non philosopher. Now, any other point? Could yeah. I ask you a question yes. about what you said last time? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, that would be a very uh, bureaucratic procedure. <laughs> I think in today's meeting, only today's subjects would be discussed. Yes. Uh, I didn't quite understand what you said about Plato's view of mathematical objects. Said that they were ultimately not ideas for him. They're not ideas, but they are, uh, because the idea of the dog, hmm, or of justice for that matter, has one and only one idea of the dog, and only one idea of justice, one idea of man. But if you take five, yes, yeah, number five, there are many five. I can easily prove it to you. Five plus five. The first five is not the second five. You can invert the order, you, but still there are two, the main two five. You cannot make additions of ideas, but you can make and must make idea, additions of numbers, and for that matter also of magnitudes, of course. You can add one triangle to another. One circle to another, and so. But couldn't you say that each of those fives or each of those triangles are are individual fives? Yeah, then you would have to say uh, there is an idea of the triangle or the idea of five higher than the fives which occur in operation. Yeah. There was uh, there were people who understood Plato they exist in Plato teaching called of ideal numbers. And some people understood ideal numbers to be this idea of five in contradistinction to the fives of straight lines, circles, and so on. But I do not, believe, I do not think that they are right. Aristotle's testimony is quite clear that Plato did not admit any ideas of numbers. The ideas are intellectual or noetic. Not sensible. Did I say ideas? Yeah, no, I want to say the numbers or other mathematical things 
are not sensible but no ethic intellectual because you can never see you can never see a straight line you can never draw a straight line so it is smudged somehow the line of which the geometer talks is not the line which we see at the table or which it draws at the table and this is the same is true of ideas all justice we find in the world in men or in actions or in institutions is imperfect as imperfect as the straight line drawn on the table and therefore they point to something which can no longer be seen with the bodily eye as only with the eyes of the mind and these are the noetic things and the noetic things consist of these two branches the mathematical things and the ideas and i think the reason why this is uh, the, the simplest sign of the difference between the ideas and the mathematical things is the multiplicity of the noetic things in mathematics you see in the case of dogs in trade multiplicity of dogs one idea of dog but the, the multiplicity is the multiplicity of dogs we see sensible dogs sensible not in the sense of house dog but in the sense of being visible to the eyes we do now the move this so merry come to order now aristotle starts from the premise that the highest and complete good both highest and complete is happiness as appears from what he says about the subject there was universal agreement as to the soundness of the starting point only there were great disagreements as to the meaning of happiness but that happiness should be the starting point that was universally admitted now this starting point is this notion is still intelligible I mention only one example the declaration of independence the right to the pursuit of happiness uh, but nevertheless the word happiness as we use it now it does not have the fullness which the greek word eudaimon has as a greek word we can say safely stands in meaning between happiness and blessed and we sometimes it is wiser to think of bliss than of happiness when reading the remarks of aristotle aristotle starts then from the fact that all men and therefore in particular all the good men strive for happiness his concern with happiness is in a way prior to his concern with virtue virtue proves to be the core of happiness as the first step is happiness now in modern times this starting point has become questionable i mentioned last time hobbes i remind you of the main point hobbes denies that there is a highest good the felicity of this life what aristotle understands by happiness consists not in the repose of a mind satisfied Felicity, as the old moral philosophers understood it, is a condition in which men's desires are at an end, because man has reached the highest and supreme good. And Hobbes says such a condition is impossible. Therefore, the felicity of which we can dream is a continual progress of the desire. In the final conclusion human life is characterized by a perpetual and restless desire of power after power that ceases only in death now of course the question is whether aristotle understood by happiness a condition in which men's desires are at an end does a happy man not need food drink sleep etc 
and therefore I have desires for food, drink, and sleep. So Alistair surely does not mean that a happy man's desires are at an end in the way in which Hobbes understood it. But one could perhaps say the happy man needs these things as replenishments. It is not meant as a progress if he eats again the next day. He doesn't want to have ever more food, ever more drink, or ever better food and better drink, and so on. And furthermore, is felicity in the Aristotelian sense, does it consist in the repose of a mind satisfied? Well, a mind satisfied, yes. But repose is somewhat misleading. Because happiness, as Aristotle understands it, consists in activity. And we will see that soon. The much more important was the criticism uh, of the notion of happiness by Kant. According to Kant, happiness is the sum of satisfaction of all our inclinations. And therefore, happiness is an undetermined concept these inclinations differing from individual to individual and within the individual from time to time. It is, in other words, an ideal of the imagination, not of reason. And therefore, it cannot be the principle of morality. The principle of morality, according to Kant, is duty or respect for the moral law, not happiness. The principle of morality, as Kant understands it, cannot be taken from the nature of man, whereas happiness is a human goal. Because the principle of morality must apply even to beings higher than man, especially to God, because if we have different moral standards, as it were, for God, as we have for man, then a moral chaos would follow. And secondly, if the moral standard is taken from man's nature, man's goodness, man's moral possibilities might be limited by his nature. This is the thought of, with which I'm sure you all are familiar in applications. For example, if equal rights are denied to the fairer sex, on the ground that the natural differences are so important that men should have a higher status than women. And then the question arises, what do we know about the possibilities of the female sex since they have never been since the sex has never been given a fair chance to rise to its highest possibilities. The consequence in Kant is that what is morally demanded, does not require a proof of possibility. We do not have to go into the question what the um, differences between men, men and women, for example, morally are. For Kant, that follows from his moral principle, which implies that what we are obliged to do, morally obliged to do, we can do. Thou canst because thou oughtst. And therefore there is no need of a proof of the possibility of what is morally demanded. So at any rate, happiness loses the central status in moral philosophy through Kant. But uh, nevertheless, the tradition which put morality at the basis of moral philosophy continued. I refer to the right of happiness as to the pursuit of happiness in the declaration of independence. I may mention here in passing that this notion of the right to the pursuit of happiness is not, as one student of the declaration of independence has said, a product of the frontier, and the frontier mentality. Chinard, a Frenchman, mentions the fact that in the French declaration of the rights of man, the right the pursuit of happiness is not mentioned because the French are much too sophisticated or cynical to believe in such a thing. But the young American nation in the frontier, they still believe in heaven. That's sheer nonsense, of course. 
is the right to the pursuit of happiness was to my, best of my knowledge stated for the first time by a German philosopher, Christian of the 18th century, Christian Wolf, in his natural right. And what he understood by the right of happiness is indicated by these two examples. That man has no natural right to vindicate the glory of God. So in other words, if a man commits a blasphemy, man does not have a natural right to kill or silence or whatever the blasphemer. But on the other hand, man has a natural right to cosmetics, to adorn his body. In brief, the notion of the right of happiness emerges originally rather in a continental Rococo context than in the context of the American frontier. After, after Wolf and the notion of happiness plays a great role of a central role in utilitarianism, the happiness of the greatest number. And this leads me to a relatively late stage in the tradition of happiness, and that is Nietzsche. Nietzsche said occasionally, or had, had someone say occasionally, I do not strive for happiness, but for my work. And in the movements which are now quite, at present quite powerful, called existentialism, this critique of happiness is taken for granted, perhaps not even mentioned anymore, that happiness is not, uh, is understood that happiness is not the ultimate aim of man. I would like to illustrate Nietzsche's critique of happiness by a remark occurring in the, near the beginning of his Zarathustra. Now, Zarathustra had addressed the multitude and spoken to them of the overman or superman. And there was no reaction, no understanding. They laughed about him. And then he said, let me then address their pride. Let me speak to them of what is most contemptible. But that is the last man. The time has come for man to set himself a goal. The time has come for man to plant the seed of his highest hope. His soil is still rich enough. But one day this soil will be poor and domesticated, and no tall tree will be able to grow in it. Alas, the time is coming when man will no longer shoot the arrow of his longing beyond man, and the string of his bow will have forgotten how to whirl. I say unto you, one must still have chaos in oneself, to be able to give birth to a dancing star. I say unto you, you still have chaos in yourselves. Alas, the time is coming when man will no longer give birth to a star. Alas, the time of the most despicable man is coming. He that is no longer able to despise himself. Behold, I show you the last man. What is love? What is creation? What is longing? What is a star? Thus asks the last man, and he blinks. The earth has become small, and on it hops the last man who makes everything small. His race is as ineradicable as a flea beetle. The last man lives longest. We have invented happiness, says the last man and they blink. They have left the regions where it was hard to live, for one needs warmth. One still loves one's neighbor and rubs against him, for one needs warmth. Becoming sick and harboring suspicion are sinful to them. One proceeds carefully. A fool, whoever still stumbles over stones or human beings, a little poison now and then, that makes for agreeable dreams, and much poison in the end for an agreeable death. One still works, for work is a form of entertainment, but one is careful lest the entertainment be too harrowing. 
one no longer becomes poor or rich. Both require too much exertion. Who still wants to rule? Who obey? Both require too much exertion. No shepherd and one herd. Everybody wants the same. Everybody is the same. Whoever feels different goes voluntarily into a madhouse. Formerly all the world was mad, say the most refined, and they blink. One is clever and knows everything that has ever happened, so there is no end of derision. One still quarrels, but one is soon reconciled, else it might spoil the digestion. One has one's little pleasure for the day and one's little pleasure for the night. But one has a regard for health. We have invented happiness, say the last men, and they blink. So here happiness appears as the ideal of the last and the most despicable men. And at the other, other pole, there is something which Nietzsche calls creativity, creation. And in its highest form, this overman, the superman. I have been asked today before class by one of you, what is underlying Nietzsche's notion of the overman and superman? I mean, this is not just a crazy notion. Well, for Nietzsche, the situation of man is this. Up to his time, or shortly before, or say up to the French Revolution, men were always guided by the notion of something superhuman, something to which man as man had to look up. This superhuman was called in the most powerful tradition, God. And now that is the premise of Saratoga, of the book Saratoga, quote, God is dead, unquote. The consequence is that man has no longer something to look up to, and therefore the last man. The complete decay of human greatness, of the possibility of human greatness. And therefore man himself must strive to become superhuman. That is the meaning of superman. Man must take the place of God, and not by simply denying this superhuman, but by overcoming man himself, by becoming, in a way, a divine being. Does this is of any use to you, Mr. West? What are your difficulties? I mean, I can, I can understand that as, as a sort of goal for a person but as a, as a possibility, as a human possibility, in fact, it still uh, it seems to be what strikes one as implausible. A man who is, who is more than a man. Yeah, well, Nietzsche did not mean that there should be a new species which could not breed with the human species. But he meant beings in the most important respect superior to human beings hitherto. There is a formula in another writing of Nietzsche where he says the overman or the superman is Caesar with the soul of Christ. Does he say anything? In other words, a coming together of the two great Western traditions, the biblical and the classical, Greco Roman on the highest level, but in a form which the synthesis of the Greek, of Jerusalem and Athens had never taken before. And such a demand is rooted in the view that anything short of that, any traditional idea, is discredited by the discrediting of the belief in superhuman beings, in the old-fashioned sense of the word, beings higher than beings who are not men, and are higher than men. So, after having reminded ourselves of the fact that the notion of happiness lacks today 
the self evidence which it had for Aristotle and for many, many centuries after Aristotle, we return to our discussion of happiness in Aristotle in the first book, 1097b28. That is a passage where Aristotle tries to give a precise determination of what happiness is by looking at the work of man. Mr. Pangel, come. We have a chair for you here. Well, you might perhaps read uh, the begin at the beginning of this section. Aristotle turns to the work of man on the ground that in the case of man as man, as well as of that of the various artisans, the good for which we are seeking, the highest good, is found in the work. But is there a work of man as man? A specific work of man? That is the question. Now read, please. To say, however, that the supreme good is happiness will probably appear a truism. We still require a more explicit account of what constitutes happiness. Perhaps then we may arrive at this by ascertaining what is man's work for the goodness or efficiency of a flute player or sculptor or craftsman of any sort, and in general of anybody who has some function or, or some work or business to perform, is thought to reside in that work. And similarly, it may be held that the good of man resides in the work of man if he has a work. So that is still a question, if he has a work, yes. Are we then to suppose that while the carpenter and the shoemaker have definite works or businesses belonging to them, man as such has none and is not designed by nature to fulfill any function? Yeah, more, precise, more simply, <laughs> but is by nature workless, lazy. Why could there not be a man by nature lazy? What does Aristotle mean by that? After all, we know so many human beings who are lazy. Maybe they are according to nature. Beachcombers, Tassaroni, or what have you. Now, what does Aristotle mean? He's sure that man is not by nature a lazy being. By nature means here if man is in good order or not to say at his best. And there is a specific view, and now he gives a more closer proof in the immediate seat. <clears throat> Must we not rather assume that just as the eye, the hand, the foot, and each of the various members of the body manifestly has a certain work of its own, so a human being also has a certain work over and above all the functions of his particular members? You know, he uses the example of the various parts of man, at least of the human body. For one, first he uses the example of the various arts. For the following reason, of the various arts one could say that they are of merely human origin. Man devised the art of shoemaking, of carpentering, and so on. And therefore they would not throw any light of, on nature. But when we look at the parts of the body and its natural parts, we see the eye works as a specific work, the work of seeing, the hand of clasping, and so on and so on. And then if all parts of man, of the human body in the first place, do reveal, uh, do show themselves to have a work, it is plausible to assume that man as a whole has such a work. That is the argument. With this passage, you might compare, if you have the time, with a section in the first book of Plato's Republic, 352d to 353e. Now, what then precisely can this work be? The mere act of living appears to be shared even by plants, whereas we are looking for the work peculiar to man. We must therefore set aside the vital activity of nutrition and growth. They are not specifically human, and therefore we cannot find in them the specifically human work, and therefore not the specifically human goodness of work, 
uh, and that specifically human goodness of work is specifically human virtue. Yes. Next in the scale will come some form of sentient life, but this too appears to be shared by horses, oxen, and animals in general. There remains, therefore, what may be called the practical life of the rational part of man. This part has two divisions. One, rational as obedient to principle, the other as possessing principle and exercising intelligence. Rational life, again, has two meanings. Let us assume that we are here concerned with the active exercise of the rational faculty, since this seems to be the more proper sense of the term. If then the function or the work of man is the active exercise of the soul's faculties in conformity with rational principle, or at all events not in dissociation from rational principle, and if we acknowledge the function of the work of an individual and of a good individual of the same class, for instance, a harper and a good harper, and so generally with all classes, to be generically the same, the qualification of the latter's superiority in excellence being added to the function in his case, I mean that if the work of a harper is to play the harp, that of a good harper is to play the harp well. If this is so, and if we declare that the work of man is a certain form of life, and define that form of life as the exercise of the soul's faculties and activities in association with rational principles, and say that the function of a good man is to perform these activities well and rightly. And if a function is well performed, when it is performed in accordance with its own proper excellence, from these premises it follows that the good of man is the active exercise of his soul's faculties in conformity with excellence or virtue, or if there be several human excellences or virtues, in conformity with the best and the most perfect among them. Yeah, now let us stop here for a moment. So the specific work of man must be the actuality. What he says, uh, what he does say, the actual exercise of rational activity. The word used by Aristotle is logos, which he translates by principle. Not the best translation. Uh, reason would be better. More literally, it would be speech or discourse. But discourse always presupposing thinking, reason. There is one remark which is perhaps at first glance not intelligible. And that is when he says that the work of this being and of this excellent being belong to the same genus. For example, the carpenter, the indifferent carpenter, and the good carpenter, their works belong to the same genus. And therefore, by knowing the one, we know in principle the other. And therefore, there is no vicious transition from fact to value. If you know what the work of a carpenter is, to make chairs, tables, and so on, then you know what the work of a good carpenter is. And to do, make these things, to make good chairs, good uh, tables, or whatever the case may be. The same would apply to man. If I know what the specific work of man is, the use of reason, then I know that the good man would be a man who uses reason well. Because all human activity, however low, and degraded and disgusting implies the use of reason. Man cannot help it, but he may use it ill, or he may use it indifferently. Now, this remark about the good and the indifferent belong to the same genus is underlying a passage in Bedford's Republic, which is best understood in the light of the Aristotelian passage we read. The passage is in the fourth book, 433a. Sugare says, What we laid down in the beginning as a universal requirement when we are founding our city, this, I think, 
or some kind of this. One could also say some genus of this is justice. For and we did lay down it was what we did lay down was that each man each one man must perform one service in the state for which his nature was best adopted. In other words, we laid down that everyone should do his job. That's justice. Justice is doing one's job or minding one's business, as one may also translate the Greek expression. But Socrates makes this crucial in, in the, um, qualification. This or some kind of this. The kind which he has in mind is, of course, to do one's job well. And that is, uh, justice means to do one's job well. Merely to do one's job indifferently, sloppily, or, or badly, that is not justice. This is the same thing which I saw as in mind here. So I made a slight mistake, which I will now correct, or some kind of it. The genus comprises both doing well and doing in general. And the genus contains beneath it various kinds. One kind is doing well, the other kind doing non-well, being ill or indifferently. Mr. Weber, I don't understand that no, here it is already encourages and already implied that it is good. But, uh, we're the no, no. Well, mm -hmm. the no, let us go step by step regarding the first example, college. The quality which does not yet imply goodness is behaving towards fear. Beh men always must behave towards fear because fears arise all the time from various uh, direction. And he can behave towards fears rightly, according to reason, or wrongly, not according to reason. So behaving towards fear is a genus consisting of the two species, one being behaving correctly and the other not behaving correctly. And courage would be the correct behavior towards you. I, I still don't understand because, for instance, behaving reasonably, I mean, if you how can you be behaving reasonably if you're not behaving reasonably well? Well, no, no. You behave reasonably? No, there isn't, well, that is a simple ambiguity of the word reasonably. Reasonably may mean, and what we ordinarily mean by it, is to use one's reason properly. But even if we do not use our reason properly, we act in an other sense of the word reasonably, reasonably. Because we are rational beings, we cannot help using our reason, even if we misuse it. We have it that we have a choice between using or misusing our reason. We do not have the choice of acting purely instinctively, except in the lower parts of our beings for which we have no responsibility. Yes. Does, does that mean that there is no essential difference between a uh, man who is able to use his reason well and just a normal man who can, can't reason too well? I mean, you know, just the average guy. Yeah, well, Aristotle is still speaking also of average guys. He's fine. Yes, I, know, but I mean, does that mean that there is no uh, essential difference between a philosopher and a. Uh, he, no, that is. We do not know of that at this stage of the argument. Yes, but well, we know that there are some men who uh, reason well and some men who just reason. Yeah, but what we, uh, here reasoning well, Aristotle thinks of the first place, the use of reason regarding conduct, for example, regarding fears, regarding desires, regarding money, and what have you. We mu you must not anticipate these things. Or, um, so are we to suppose that these classifications might not be valid uh, generally, but just in Oh, no, they would be. I mean, that is the point. They would have to be refined, probably, when we rise to a higher level. 
they would not simply disappear. In other words, uh, say, if you have on the simple moral level the extreme possibilities of the gentleman and the crook, the fact that the philosopher is not a gentleman doesn't mean that he is a crook. Although he might, in certain respects, deviate from the gentleman in a way which a crook would better understand than the gentleman. But for different reasons. <laughs> but for different reasons. But is there, well, then, on just on the, uh, is there an essential relationship between gentlemen and crooks? I mean, are, are gentlemen anyway essentially different from crooks? Yes, it's de most definitely. Otherwise, the moral distinctions wouldn't make sense. something more specific, because a man might be a murderer or at least uh, a killer without being a crook. Yeah? For example, so let us not uh, take too narrow a notion. And let us uh, perhaps, since we, I spoke of crook, let us remain on the same level of expression and speak of squares. Uh, we imply that there is an essential difference between squares and crooks. Now that this distinction is ordinarily used, not very thoughtfully, and not very precisely, and in other words, we do not look too much into the heart of the two kinds of people where we might discover in the heart of the crook something, a pearl, and in the heart of a square, a hard stone, you know, and that might happen. But we cannot do this all the time. And if you think especially of the questions with which we are confronted in legal matters, where rather crude decisions must be made without indefinite appeals, which would ruin the legislative jurisdiction completely, and therefore, these crude distinctions are meaningful and necessary. That is the point which, which from which, which Aristotle takes for granted. And the inexactness which goes with it, of which he has spoken, is that we have to accept that. Otherwise, we cannot live. Yes? But the others also. An oak is radically different from a birch or what, what have you that he does not deny. He only says specifically human cannot possibly lie in what he shares with the plant, and specifically human cannot possibly lie what he shares with the, in what he shares with the brutes, because he is not a plant. And he is not a brute. He is the only animal who possesses speech or reason. I mean, uh, you're saying that what is specifically human uh, can't be shared. But isn't he there assuming that if there is something that is specifically human... He assumes that. Yeah. Then how can he to say that, well, uh, there is something specifically human? How can he even try to assume that without, trying, without also trying to show that perhaps plants and animals also have something? Well, do, do plants, did you ever see plants speak to each other? Did you ever see dogs speak to each other? You could say this only in a metaphoric way, that these dogs seem to communicate some, or ducks for that matter, seem to communicate some feelings to each other, but not speakingly. And however much one may admire some of the animals, say dogs, 
one cannot seriously maintain that they are, in, strictly speaking, intelligent beings. The popular phrase, dumb animals, or our dumb friends, testifies to the truth of what Aristotle says. And he's, he's assuming that under nature that, that man has something peculiar to him, where, yeah. where, where these other things under nature do not have something Yes, I mean, well, look around. Look at stories, the true stories, I mean, ever told of men or animals or brutes or plants. Where do you find uh, philosophy or science or religion, uh, etc., among brutes? Some people say that elephant, elephants are pious. But I believe that was a sentimental assertion of a, of a man who loved animals, or loved elephants. Well, I think it's that plants and animals have some, uh, you know, have some capability of rational um, thought or, or, or anything peculiar to them, in the same way that man has something peculiar to, to man, but rather that plants and animals could have something of a different nature peculiar to them. Yep. Or rather, there is an analogon of reason to some extent there, you can say. But an analogon of reason is not reason, strictly speaking, Mr. Corvida. We know that uh, the work of the carpenter is to make a chair and the work of the good carpenter is to make a good chair. Yes. The work of the harpist play, the work of the good harpist play well, and the work of man is to do virtue, the work of no, not virtue. The work of man is acting according to reason. Yeah, it's acting yeah. according to reason. Acting according to reason, and the best work of man is acting according to the highest reason. Now, by what, by what virtue, by what means does he think that we can know what the best chair is, what good pop playing is, what good painting is, and what good reason is? Now we're yeah. How, how do we judge among these things? Well, did, you, did you never in your life see a blunderer in carpenting oh, yes. who produced a chair on which you could not sit without falling down, yes. or a table which was bound to collapse and you put any weight on it? This is a plant. So you can see not great uh, experience of life is needed and uh, great intelligence in order to distinguish for sufficiently for practical purposes between a good carpenter and a poor carpenter. And the same applies to the other arts as well. In the case of physicians, it's a bit more complicated because a bedside manners um, could conceivably deceive us about the quality of the physician. But still, in the long run, uh, you can say if all people whose legs were straightened uh, by a surgeon and, uh, never had straight legs in the heavens all the time, you would say, well, I wouldn't go to him. Yeah. The, and so, and why not the same? Do we not distinguish um, between a, a men who act reasonably or sensibly? And those who do not act reasonably, men whose judgment we have found invariably sound, and others whose judgment we have found invariably unsound, that exists. Take the extreme case. This we, we do. And uh, if there is no universally valid yardstick <coughs> by which you can measure uh, sensibility, as you can measure temperature, that has to do with the, with the quality of moral matters in precision, in precision. Yes. But still, there is not complete chaos there. But this doesn't offend with any guide at all uh, by which we can judge between one who has something peculiar to him and another who has something peculiar to No, well, surely not in this stage. Surely, no, but uh, still... <coughs> Well, but we make distinctions, and we know them. For example, the men may be excellent as in an office as a subaltern man, and another man may act excellently as a president of the United States. You know this difference. And the, the, you know also the difficulty of judging in this 
case of the president, where it is much easier to reach agreement as to the subaltern officers in the in in Social Security Administration. So there is a, a kind of lower level where agreement is easily reached, just as, a, as regarding carpentering or shoemaking, and when the things become more demanding, then it becomes more difficult to judge. There is no, there, you know, there is no substitute ultimately for judgment. But judgment in certain dimensions is relatively easy and can conceivably be replaced by mechanical devices. And uh, in, in other spheres which are more important, <coughs> when it can never be replaced by mechanical devices. Well, when a carpenter is a bad carpenter, he nevertheless is a carpenter. Yes. When a harpist is a bad harpist, he nevertheless is a bad harpist, but a harpist. Now, what would Aristotle do with men who are not capable of reading? Do you mean moral, morals? No, uh, well, yes. No, yeah, well, what shall we do? I mean, they would not listen and would not read this book. And they, and they are generally out of circulation. You know, they have, they have no influence on human affairs. They are a great burden on the other members of their family. But are they uh, does Aristotle find man? So they are defective. They are radically, by nature, defective human beings, being so that they cannot even acquire virtue. He speaks of that way. We have to. That is also a fact which we have to acknowledge. And natural slaves? No, natural slaves would be wholly useless if they were insane. Natural slaves are only very dumb. <laughs> uh, you can uh, also understand by natural slave a man who has some reason, because otherwise he couldn't listen to the commands of his master. But uh, I mean, he can listen to more specific commands than a dog, whom you have trained. But he cannot take care of himself, and therefore, for example, my example is a fellow to whom you have to say you should now bring five tree trunks here. Five. One, two, three, four, five. That's not true. Yes. Um, what would Aristotle say about a man reasoning and consequently not accepting morality uh, to the effect that, for instance, like each man to reason sees that in different societies, more morals are different. And he sees moral, morality as a relative thing. So he said to himself, well, I can't accept this moral point because, well, say, for instance, in this other society, it isn't like this, and it's basically a relative thing, and I don't accept that. Yeah, well, Aristotle would then say either this is a case not for instruction, moral instruction, but either for correction by a non-instructional means, or else for a, a course in theoretical philosophy, by which he would be shown that the conclusion from the variety of customs to the non-unity of morality is not valid. Because the relativity, I mean, that for example, people have different usages regarding a great variety of things, does not follow that all the various customs are of equal value. Why could not be a single one of two or three or four of them, of these cultures, have the true morality where the others deviate from it to various degrees? What is, I mean, uh, uh, that was the way in which people looked at such matters in former times, and therefore they, the value. Well, this kind of uh, the facts, the variety of customs was always known. But men drew different conclusions from it in former times. Well, Aristotle, you can say, starts from what he sees around himself. And that is, of course, primarily Greek thing, so that is undeniable. But he did not view morality as a Greek privilege. He would only say the Greeks were particularly fortunate people. The climate was the right mean between too hot and too cold. So 
say like Central California, and uh, uh, or maybe even Southern California. <laughs> the Greeks had two things which he didn't find anywhere else. People living in cities and yet being politically free. In Babylon was also a city, but they were subject to a despotic ruler. And the same would be true of Persia, of uh, the Persian city. And the northern fellows in, in, in northern Greece and uh, the Balkan Peninsula, they uh, had political freedom in their way, but they were not city-fied, and that meant the same originally as civilized. They were not rustics. And uh, therefore, that was his, would have been his argument, that the Greeks, with all their great effects, which he saw very well, uh, were partly through merit, partly through good luck, in a better position to speak about this matter than other people. But he wouldn't deny that non-Greeks couldn't learn that. Only it is so uh, that would be a justification for the fact that he uh, said, uh, on the whole, what the Greek wise men say is taken more seriously by him than by other than wise men of other tribes. Mr. Feeling. I was wondering, uh, there are perhaps more than simply one specific difference between man and other animals or the plants, for example, perhaps his ability to produce representations of what he sees might be considered unique to man. Uh, the question would be whether that is not does not imply or is not based upon the well, that, that, discourse. That's the question. That's uh, the question. How Aristotle, uh, An analysis where well, the question is whether imitation, as he calls it, whether imitation and the sense in which the arts imitate do or does not presuppose reason. That would be his way of argument. Just as the other things meant, uh, was always known that laughing is a peculiarity of man. And now, uh, why did he not, why did Aristotle not call man the laughing animal and said, and said the rational animal? Because but he would say that laughing and weeping, these extreme things, presuppose a latitude of feelings, which is possible only on the ground of rationality. What? You can understand laughing on, as on the ground of rationality. You cannot understand rationality on the ground of laughing. Or to take another example, man is an uh, animal which possesses hands, as is two hands and two feet, as distinguished from four feet. Let us forget about the birds. And Aristotle is uh, con confronted with this question. Is man to be defined as a being with hands or as a being characterized by reason? He would say, I can understand the hands as belonging, essentially belonging to a rational being and not the other way now. The other way it would be a complicated and unnecessarily complicated attempt to uh, uh, make uh, things intelligible. So if someone were to say, as I believe some people have, that the man's talent for speech was the result of his imitative abilities, that is, that he somehow... Well, uh, linked up with it. Linked up with it. But, but if he were to say speech, we're, yeah. we're, we're resting on imitation rather than vice versa. No, he, he would, Aristotle would say that the other way around. If he were not a speaking animal, he could not make this distinction between the image and the imaged on which all imitation is based. But that, that, that it seems to me, requires a more detailed... Oh, sure. There's no nature. question. But Aristotle here can at any rate say he appeals to things generally granted, i.e. not universally granted. And we all understand them from our ordinary life. And that is sufficient, at least for the beginning. So, Aristotle asserts then that there is a specific work of man, and that is action with reason, or according to reason. And therefore, since there is a specific work of man, there is also a specific 
good work of man. And the good work is to use one's reason well in the various forms in which reason can be used. Aristotle alludes to these uh, differences by saying there may be mo more than one kind of human goodness, and then the highest kind would be then the ultimate authority. What that highest kind would be, he doesn't say here, but as we know from the end of this work, uh, it is uh, theoretical knowledge of philosophy. Now let us go on. Moreover, this activity must occupy a complete lifetime. For one swallow does not make a spring, nor does one fine day. And similarly, one day or a brief period of happiness does not make a man supremely blessed and happy. So a man who does the specific work of men well in a life of some length, let us say in a completed life, only is happiness. In other words, a child which has not been able to acquire this capacity, or young men or women dying prematurely, as we say, cannot have be properly called blessed or happy. Some lifespan is maturity is required. Only in this way can an individual show that he uh, possesses human excellence. Yes. Let this account, then, serve to describe the good in outline. For no doubt, the proper procedure is to begin by making a rough sketch and to fill it in afterwards. If a work has been well laid down in outline, to carry it on and complete it in detail may be supposed to be within the capacity <coughs> of anybody. And in this working out of detail, Time seems to be a good inventor, or all events a sister. This, indeed, is how advances in the arts have actually come about, since anyone can fill in the gaps. Yep, yep. So you see, Arthur says here now explicitly that what he, has, what he has given us is only a sketch, an outline. And to fill it out, he says, anybody is good enough for that which is, of course, a great compliment to us, mm -hmm. which we do not uh, probably deserve. But the sketch, he nevertheless says, is most important. As he says later on, in the, the beginning is the half of the whole. The remark about time, time is good, is a helper in this respect. There is, in the fourth book of his physics, where he uh, discusses time uh, thematically, Time is presented rather as bad, as a cause of forgetting and of decay. But what Aristotle and various kinds of conclusions were drawn from this remark on time. But what Aristotle has in mind is everything depends how time is used. If you use it well, it will be helpful to you. If you do not use it, it will bring about decay and degeneration. Yes. Um, how can, um, if, um, if, as uh, you mentioned earlier, the things like the uh, universe, the cosmos, and the species and things are um, eternal, um, how can then you say that something like time is good or bad? Or no, bad. I mean, some, somehow, uh, I mean, it doesn't really make any difference. No, yeah, well, I. Aristotle doesn't say that. I mean, but Aristotle seems to say it in his analysis of time in the physics. And therefore, I make this remark that our passage shows that this, Aristotle does not regard time as bad or the cause of that. No, but I mean, time somehow makes a difference. If you have things like decay and things, species don't, it doesn't remain the same thing, does it? Why not? I mean, every dog grows and decays, and all, uh, and that happens all the time. And yet this doesn't affect the species, because the eternity of the species means the non-eternity of the individuals. And non-eternity means mortality. Are, are we to assume then that, uh, that individual men are as insignificant as individual dogs? This does not follow, but it's mortal as dogs. No, but I mean, if, if we judge somehow the, uh, by the eternity of things and uh, by the species, whether men die or don't die or doesn't affect that, does that, does that men are somehow unimportant or insignificant, whether men die or In the 
light of what? In the light of what? I mean, in the light of a hu- of a, every human being, I suppose, has other human beings to whom he's attached, and their death will be very sad for him. That if some old man, especially, or even a young man, for that matter, at the other end of the world dies, it would be hypocrisy to shed tears about his death, would it not? You can't really be sad about that. If some man wholly unknown to you dies, I do not know what you mean. I just want to know whether um, whether individuals are uh, as significant in any way. Yeah, in what sense significant? What I mean, you right? are yourself very significant to yourself, I suppose. And to people, uh, and to your friends. But not all human beings can be significant to all human beings. Or can they? I think, well, um, from the standpoint of, say, I would, I would imagine, although I'm not sure, that from the standpoint of, let's say, Christian thought, they could be, each individual could be. Yeah, but is the term, is the usual, the word usually translated by neighbor, is this an, not an, an accident? In other words, can a man actively love people who, of whom he has never heard and whom he may never sees? It's a difficult question. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, for Aristotle, at any rate, there is no question here. Love of human beings in Greek philanthropia is not a virtue, according to the Greek philosophers. That's truly not based on Aristotle. That is a charming quality in most cases, but it is not a virtue. And what about you? Well, I would just Yeah, I know. It, it seems that perhaps the concept of God's love of all men in Christian thought does indicate something which all men are not capable of but must aspire to, that it is a quality that is not... Uh, yeah, but this is said of a superhuman, of God, of a superhuman being and not of man. Yeah. Well, a man can realize, realizing this, realizing the, uh, the common fatherhood of God, can, can theoretically know that every individual, uh, they can't actively love every individual, but they can theoretically know that every individual... Now, is the question is whether men confronted with any other man, regardless of ethnic origin, race, or what have you, whether man is not under certain obligations towards other human beings, whom he knows, whom he meets, whom he meets at least. But that is, Aristotle would say yes, would say yes, uh, does say yes. That's not a question. But that does not mean that he can actively love all human beings. That's beyond his power. But now, let us, uh, Mr. Angle, let us go on where we left off. We should therefore proceed in the same manner in other subjects also, and not allow side issues to outweigh the main task in hand. And that is the, so, in other words, the whole question which he has already taken up twice, or for the third time, concerning the exactness to be expected. Here he had used before the term exactness, opposed to a Catch to a general or abstract set. Abs- the exact means now the concrete and detailed elaboration. The abstract statement is to that extent inexact. That is also one meaning of exact in Aristotle. Now here this statement which we began to read is the third and final statement about how to speak on moral matters, or what kind of exactness to expect. Generally speaking, we see here that Aristotle's way of speaking and thinking in this work is more like that of the carpenter than like that of the geometer, mathematician. It is clear that the carpenter is satisfied with a, with a straight line, which is not literally and strictly speaking straight, but perfectly sufficient for his purpose. And the same applies uh, to moral matters and exactness in accordance with the nature of subject matter.
Well, this much he said by Aristotle about exactness. Now he has something to add to that. Nor again must we in all matters alike demand an explanation of the reason why things are what they are. In some cases, it is enough if the fact that they are so is satisfactorily established. This is the case with first principles. And the fact is the primary thing. It is a first principle. And principles are studied, some by induction, others by perception, and others by some form of habituation, and also others otherwise. So we must endeavor to arrive at the principles of each kind in their natural <coughs> manner, and must also be careful to define them correctly, since they are of great importance for the subsequent course of the inquiry. The beginning is admittedly more than half of the whole, and throws light at once on many of the questions under investigation. Yes. Now, after having spoken of the exactness to be expected, he comes to the question of the causes or principles. Now, only this question, not the question regarding exactness, was dealt with in the second and central statement in 1095A30 following. In the first statement, he had spoken only of exactness and not of principles. Here he speaks of both. In this, in this statement, there is no allusion to the fact, as there was in the second statement, that we might need knowledge of the why. Here he simply leaves it that that is enough. What he alludes to is this. It's a, a, a highest, the highest principle is the principle of contradiction. If you know that it is impossible to say at the same time a um, to say that that a is b and a is non b at the same time, that's perfectly sufficient. You don't need a why for that. The question is whether the same can be applied to morals, more specifically, whether it is good enough to say courage is a virtue. In physics, this is courage. And that's our starting point. Whether it doesn't make sense to say, why is courage a virtue? Or why is courage a good? The question which we have discussed earlier. Now, the principles may be found in various ways. By induction, he says, by sense perception, and by habituation. Thomas Aquinas gives these examples. That every number is odd or even can is found by induction. You look at every number which occurs to you and you see it is either odd or even. That every living thing needs nourishment is known by sense perception. And that lusts are diminished if we do not give in to them is known by habituation. For example, by ceasing to smoke. And that is Thomas' example of that. Now, let us begin with the next section. Accordingly, we must examine our first principle, not only as a logical conclusion deduced from certain premises, but also in the light of the current opinion on the subject. Yeah, that is a... What is a logical conclusion is distinguished from a conclusion which is not logical? I think it is a wholly redundant expression. A conclusion... I mean, it may be a wrong conclusion. But every conclusion is, of course, an act of our concluding faculty, i.e. logical. That's not an not essay. As I says, no, uh, we let us, in the preceding passage, he had inferred what happiness is by starting from principles that he had done. And by starting from the, such principles as every being has a specific work. And this work may be done by the individual well or not well. These were principles from which he started. And from, by starting from which he arrived at the conclusion that happiness consists in, acti in excellent activity according to reason. Now he will check the result by 
not my opinions, as he translate, uh, translates, but by what people say. People who have never taken the trouble of establishing definitely what happiness is, as others have done in the preceding chapter, nevertheless have opinions about happiness. And they speak about, and these opinions are available to everybody through what people say. And therefore, we must see what people say and whether this agrees with what Aristotle has established in a more exact manner. For Aristotle assumes, and that is a, which he will make, and this assumption he will, he will make clear later on, that what people say, it cannot be simply absurd. That may seem sound strange, because there is such a great variety of opinions, and some must certainly be wrong. Yet Aristotle has a certain respect for what people say, given some conditions. In other words, if people, uh, he will make clear later on, if they say it for a very long time, that means it cannot be a momentary fad or whim. That can be nonsense. Or if the men who say it are wise men, then it stands to reason that it cannot be simple nonsense. Now let us see what these sayings are. Now things good have been divided into three classes. External goods on the one hand, and good to the soul and to the body on the other. And of these three kinds of goods, those of the soul, we commonly pronounce good in the fullest sense and supreme. We pronounce. You see, Aristotle is one of the speakers. Aristotle in his capacity is a simple man, which he also is, apart from being a philosopher. Yes? But it is our actions and the soul's active exercise of its functions that we posit as being happy. Hence, so far as this opinion goes, and it is of long standing and generally accepted by philosophers, it supports the correctness of our definition of happiness. Yeah, now let us see. Now what are then these things said by human beings? First, the tripartition of the good things. Souls of the, the good things of the soul as the highest, and then those of the body, and then the external good. Now, actions, activities, belong to the soul and not to the body or to external things. Body does not properly act because the body doesn't choose and therefore it cannot act. The core of action, according to Aristotle, as we will make clear later on, is prefer preferring, choosing. And choosing is the, pre uh, the prerogative of the soul. Now, this opinion is old, of long standing, and if it had been a merely stupid view, then it would have been abandoned as long time ago, and accepted by the people who philosophers. Yes? What is this ground for this assumption of harmony between popular opinion, communist opinion, and yeah, well, under what condition does this make sense? This is a very relevant, pertinent question. No apology needed. Now, if it is true that man is a rational animal, and if reason is to some extent always active in men in general, to some extent, then the results of, so to speak, uncultivated reason, but still active reason, will not completely run counter to the results of the of a highly cultivated race. This, this assumption seems to, to be based on something beyond the scope of this treatise. No, well, what Aristotle does is this. You can also explain this for us. Someone presents a view which in this form was never presented before. And then, if he is not a fool who wants to be admired as an original man, you know, who said something unheard of, 
then he will say what I say is after all not so strange as it seems at first glance. What we all say, you all admit this and this and this, if you look at it more closely, implies what I said. Kant, when he brought, uh, uh, set forth his very original moral teaching, says, claims that he only elucidates, analyzes, brings to light what every human being, when he says this is right or this is wrong, always in play. Would there be, well, what, I mean, would, it, would the, um, say, what is, what is sometimes called Plato's taking refuge in speech, or in the fate of yeah. the second voyage, would the ground, would, would Aristotle's assumption be essentially the same? As there that? is something uh, very much platonic or Socratic in Aristotle, in Plato, Plato has this notion, as you know, stated in a somewhat uh, in an image, that man is the only being on earth who has seen the complete truth. And what for Plato means the same thing, the ideas prior to his birth. Man could not be man without a divination of the truth. And therefore, this divination of the truth shows itself in the opinions of men in general. And therefore, it is possible, according to Plato at any rate, by starting from any opinion, however crude and half-cooked, or whatever it may be, starting from it to and seeing its effects, and thus to be led to the full truth. Men, one can state it properly as far as, I mean, apart from people who want to be original or want to win an argument or try to defend a thesis, a, a particular thesis, as Aristotle called it, what people say, especially in their unguarded moments, about matters not directly connected with their, with their personal interests of the moment, is that this always contains sense. You have to, not theories. Theories are a particular matter. Theories can very well be. It's absolutely wrong. In your first lecture, you said that Aristotle leaves it open. Well, it seems to Aristotle that man is definitely not the highest thing in the universe. You said he seems to leave it open as to whether he is the way, uh, the key, the yes, I think he says so in a way. He says in one of his works that the soul, and he means here from the context, the human soul knows it's open to everything. I.e., the God, as Aristotle, in the sense of God, would not be perceive any beings lower than God. Man would perceive the divine as well as the human, as well as the subhuman. In this sense, man is a microcosm. Also, though Aristotle doesn't use the term, uh, he means that. Yes, yes. Is this connected with uh, what you said, uh, uh, the ethics may be Aristotle's most beautiful? No, that, that I would not say, but I think it is precisely because of its less technical character. It had something, it is least a book for classrooms, you know, it's, um, it's meant for the general educated reader. But it is also written in such a way that people who want to have more than the general educated reader wants will find it. Huh? This peculiar combination, I believe, Kajal's ethics. There is a physics or an evidence of that would not be for the general reader. Now, let us read the, where were we now? Let us read a bit more. Hmm? It also shows it to be right, merely in declaring the end to consist in actions or activities of some sort. For thus the end is included among goods of the soul and not among external goods. So in other words, one could say this. 
Some people say happiness consists in just living well, meaning an extraordinary dinner every night and uh, all other pleasures of life uh, at all times. And not, in other words, what you, what you get, what you receive, and not in actions and activities and actualizations. Aristotle says that this Aristotelian view agrees with what is said, uh, according to which the highest things are in the soul, in the soul, and do not belong to the external goods. And uh, that will become clearer from the immediate sequel. Yes? Again, our definition accords with the description of the happy man as one who lives well or does well, for it has virtually identified happiness with the form of the good life or doing well. Yeah, but especially, well, doing well it can, is, of course, ambiguous in, as in English and can mean, well, uh, being successful uh, whether you uh, have deserved it or not. But doing well can, in the Greek, also mean, in the Greek it truly means doing well, literally, acting well. So that happiness consists in acting well. This thing said so frequently is in accordance, confirms again Aristotle's definition. Yes. And moreover, all the various characteristics that are looked for in happiness are found to belong to the good as we define it. Some people think happiness is goodness or virtue, others prudence, others a form of wisdom, others again say it is all of these things, or one of them in combination with pleasure, or not without pleasure. Another school include external prosperity as a concomitant factor. Some of these views have been held by many people and from ancient times others by a few distinguished men, and neither class is likely to be altogether mistaken. The probability is that their beliefs are at least partly, or indeed mainly, correct. Now here he gives a reason for which uh, some of you have looked, why the opinions of long-standing, as well as the opinions of distinguished men, are not likely to be altogether wrong. Otherwise, he shows here many things said about the happiness, which are, seem to be mutually exclusive, because some people say happiness is identical with virtue, some people say happiness is identical with wisdom, and uh, some say it must be accompanied by pleasure, or at least not accompanied by pain. These are very different views and uh, seemingly mutually exclusive views. And Aristotle will now show that they are provided for and taken account of in his statement on happiness in the preceding chapter. Yes. Let us read one more passage. Yeah. Now, with those who pronounce happiness to be virtue or some particular virtue, our definition is in agreement, for activity in conformity with virtue involves virtue, but no doubt it makes a great difference whether we conceive the supreme good to depend on possessing virtue or on displaying it, on disposition, or on the manifestation of a disposition in action. For a man may possess the disposition without its producing any good result, as for instance when he is asleep or has ceased to function from some other cause. But virtue in active exercise cannot be inoperative. It will of necessity act, and act well. And just as at the Olympic Games the wreaths of victory are not bestowed upon the handsomest and strongest <laughs> persons present, but on men who enter for the competition, since it is among these that the winners are found, so it is those who act rightly who carry off the prizes and good things of life. Yeah. Now, the, the main point which he makes here, he agrees in a way with those who say happiness is virtue, but not entirely. 
he says they don't say, make sufficiently clear that it is an activity according to virtue and not merely the possession of virtue which may remain dormant. And he compares it to this difference to that between possession and use. The possession of a shoe of shoes and the use of shoes. And analogously, the possession of virtue in a dormant condition. Leave it at home as it were. And the use of it. And the, the latter alone is what Aristotle means and understands by virtue. The exercise of virtue. The Greek word is energia, from which the English word energy is ultimately derived. But the Greek word has nothing to do with energy in the modern sense. It means literally translated to be being at work. Being at work as distinguished from a mere potency or potentiality. Now, Aristotle takes in the secret that we cannot discuss today anymore. It takes up a subject which, of which he had not spoken in his own statement on happiness which is nevertheless very important. Many people say a happy man is a man who has pleasures or at least who doesn't live in pain all the time. Now, this subject not is considered apparently in the general definition. In the preceding chapter, the word pleasure didn't occur there at all. This he takes up in the sequel must we not give uh, assert that the happy man, apart from exercising the virtues, is also a, a man who, whose life is enjoyable. After all, you think of it that man would fulfill his duties very strictly and honestly, and yet at the same time be very miserable. And that would bring about that he is torn between two things, duty and pleasure. And what Aristotle will now show in his way is that this cannot be the case. That there is in happiness the three things which man desires, the good, the noble, and the pleasant are all three present. Or as we could say, to make this uh, distinction a bit more intelligible, the enjoyable, the resplendent, that's a noble, and the solid, rock-like, that's a good. They all three combined on the highest level possible for man, that is happens. And that he will show in the sequel. Can you this So now let us continue where we left off last time. Aristotle had answered the question of what happiness or the human good is. It is the being at work of the soul in the mode of excellence, of course, of the human soul. Now, after Aristotle had answered this question in by himself, he looks at what people generally say about happiness, because it is improbable that the meaning of happiness, the end of all men, has completely escaped the human race. And therefore, while the general views may be less neat, less exact, they yet must reflect the truth as stated by Aristotle. And we have read the larger part of this section, and we should continue now in 1099A, Seven, roughly, which we read already last time. I have already mentioned at the end of the last meeting that Aristotle takes now up a subject 
of which he had not spoken when presenting his definition of happiness. And that theme is pleasure. Now, will you begin to read again the few lines we read last time? And further, their life is essentially pleasant. For the feeling of pleasure is an experience of the soul, and a thing gives a man pleasure in regard to which he is described as fond of so-and-so. For instance, a horse gives pleasure to one fond of horses, a play to one fond of the theater, and similarly just actions are pleasant to the lover of justice, and acts conforming with virtue generally to the lover of virtue. Go on. Uh, but whereas for the many, pleasures are in conflict with one another, because they are not pleasant by nature, things pleasant by nature are pleasant to lovers of what is noble, and so always are actions in conformity with virtue, so that they are pleasant essentially, as well as pleasant to lovers of the noble. Therefore their life has no need of pleasure as a sort of ornamental appendage but contains its pleasure in itself. Yeah, let it stop here. So now Aristotle has now settled this question regarding the relation between happiness and pleasure. And the question is whether this settlement is sufficient or adequate. Aristotle says here, well, he makes a distinction between two kinds of pleasures. Pleasures or pleasant things which are by nature pleasant, intrinsically pleasant, and those which are not. Now it is clear that the man, the virtuous man, does not necessarily have more pleasures of the vulgar kind than the vicious man. But Aristotle contends the true pleasures, the pleasures according to nature, are a preserve of the virtuous man. And therefore, he alone has a truly pleasant life. But in other words, the pleasant life of gangsters is not truly pleasant. That is only a sham pleasure. That is what other sources implies. Only for the lovers of noble things are the things by nature pleasant, in fact, pleasant. Now, granted that truly virtuous men enjoy their virtuous activity, and that this enjoyment is the only true enjoyment, that is what Alistair presupposes here, does it follow from this that these activities are the only ones by nature enjoyable? Why should not... Uh, pleasant food, pleasant drink, and so on, be by nature enjoyable, for example. Now, let us see what conclusions are so from this. For there is the further consideration that the man who does not enjoy doing noble actions is not a good man. No one would call a man just if he did not like acting just, nor liberal if he did not like doing liberal things, and similarly with the other virtues. But if so... Actions in conformity with virtue must be essentially pleasant. So, so that make, in other words, that it makes sense that a man who doesn't enjoy noble actions is not a noble character. But there is the question is, are these enjoyments the highest enjoyments, or are they the only enjoyments by nature enjoyable? This is the question. In addition, there is a following difficulty. Let us take a man who denounces a friend who has become a traitor to the authorities. This is a just action, or maybe a just action. Is this an enjoyable action? Probably. So there will be at least some virtuous actions which are not enjoyable, where one can say this my damn duty to do it, but I hate it. I do not enjoy it. You see also that Aristotle has here made a qualification in the last sentence read by Mr. Bengel. If this is so, we have to uh, be watchful. Yes. But they are also, of course, both good and noble, and 
each in the highest degree if the good man judges them well, and his judgment is as we have said. It follows, therefore, that happiness is at once the best, the noblest, and the pleasantest of, of things. These qualities are not separated, as the inscription at Delos makes out. The noblest is the most just, and the best is to be healthy, but the most pleasant by nature is the attaining of what, one, of what someone loves. For the best activities possess them all, and it is the best activities, or one activity which is the best of all, in which, according to our definition, happiness consists. Yes. The virtuous activities are pleasant to the highest degree, and noble to the highest degree, and good to the highest degree. Or, as we may paraphrase it, and not to leave it as these terms which have been so frequently used and have become stale, the virtuous activities are the most enjoyable, the most resplendent, and the most solid. So all three considerations of preference lead us to one and the same end. And of course, this is only the proper judge of what is most enjoyable, and so on, is a serious man, to translate the Greek word uh, literally, which is one of the many terms also uses for the virtuous man. And serious man. An homme sérieux in France has adventures sometimes his meaning, a man whom one can take must take seriously. Now the question of course is here is a reference to these activities or one of them, let me the best of them, is what we say assert to be happiness. This is again a reference to a different to a distinction within the excellent activities, which will prove to be the distinction between moral actions and contemplative actions. And the question is whether Aristotle can make his assertion stick regarding moral virtues. Perhaps in the case of the moral virtues, the coincidence of the enjoyable, the resplendent, and the good is not as clear as in the case of contemplation. We have not yet sufficient evidence for that. At any rate, there is a perfect harmony regarding the preferences which we, may, we human beings have. They all coincide. Contrary to this inscription, where distinction is made between what is noble, and what is noble is it most just. This Solemn or solid or good is to be have good health. And obviously these are two very different things. And finally, the most pleasant is to get what one desires. Three entirely different things. And Aristotle says, no, if you think each of them through, then you will arrive at one and only one goal, the highest human activity. Now, let us continue then. Nevertheless, it is manifest that happiness also requires external goods in addition, as we said, for it is impossible, or at least not easy, to play a noble part unless furnished with the necessary equipment. For many noble actions require instruments for their performance in the shape of friends or wealth or political power. Also, there are certain external advantages, the lack of which sullies supreme felicity such as good birth, good children, and personal beauty. A man of very ugly appearance, or low birth, or alone in the world and childless, is not a happy man, and still less so, perhaps, is one who has children or friends that are worthless, or one who has had good ones, but lost them by death. As we said, therefore, happiness does seem to require the addition of external prosperity, and this is why some people identify it with good fortune, though some identify it with virtue. So in other words, this beautiful coincidence of the three considerations is not good enough, because in order to be happy, man does need external good. 
And these ex external goods are not necessarily given with the fact of virtue or virtuous intentions. And therefore, there is a, a difficulty again, not identical with the distinction between virtue and pleasure, but it is a distinction between virtue and the external goods and equipment, as Aristotle calls it, without which virtuous activity is not possible. And Aristotle goes here quite far, as you see. For example, that there is a minimum need for worldly goods necessary, for external goods necessary, in order to act virtuously. For example, the man who completely paralyzed in body and mind cannot possibly act virtuously, that we understand. But that the man also who is extremely ugly is by this way in bodily act, is by this very fact barred from being happy, seems to be and not to coincide with what we now hold. Although we, I think with a little effort we understand it. Because uh, we always see when we are confronted with extreme ugliness and our simple reaction to that, we are repelled. And of course we can control it as tolerably decent people, but that we have to control it to show that that is not exactly what we understand by a human affection. The other examples are perhaps less striking. Good. So the, the question is therefore, can the highest good, can happiness, consist in virtuous activity alone, if this is the case? The enjoyment of these good things is by nature good. But uh, pleasures deriving from noble actions are not sufficient for happiness. This much Aristotle made clear. Now, people have found a way out, as Aristotle indicates at the end of this passage. They say happiness is the same as having good luck. And, for example, to be wealthy and, and have good looks, these are gifts of fortune. But, of course, then you don't have virtue here. And the alternative view is virtue, and the happiness is virtue. But the fact that these views are radically distinguished from each other shows that the problem of happiness has not yet been solved. Although what Aristotle said in the preceding chapter, in his own name, will remain true with some qualification to, toward which Aristotle works his way. Now, is there any point you would like to raise here? Yes, Mr. Vedder. Why is there some evidence uh, in ways to say we used to prove our way our uh, means of taking advantage of the situation? Why doesn't it prove this way to prove the point? Yeah, but that is exactly the point. The cliche, chance, it cannot be handled. The simple and the uh, example which Aristotle gives, gives when he discusses chance thematically in the second book of the physics is this. You dig in your garden and then you find a treasure. Now, how can you, I mean, you can go treasure hunting, but then, of course, it is no longer a matter of chance if you find a treasure. But the point is that without intending it, you find it. A chance is that which is radically elusive and cannot be mastered. Then you, you mean to improve one's fortune. Well, there are some ways, for example, buy the right kind of stocks. But no one would say then that this is just... Uh, yeah, but the, but the point is then it is already uh, no longer mere chance. Two people meet by chance. That means they did not intend to meet. The one went downtown for this reason, the other for an entirely different reason, no agreement, whatever, and yet a race cost. Wholly unintended and unintendable. That is characteristic of chance. And therefore, um, 
uh, your objection uh, is not valid. So, well, but any truth can sort of survives in the sense that Aristotle attributes here this type of equipment that's necessary simply to chance. And one can argue that as far as at least the you know, money is concerned, that's not simply a result of chance. Yeah, but it is not strictly speaking chance. Does he ascribe it to chance? Well, I thought that's what that's what you said that these things would be result only in chance. Against no, compare. I mean, they are not inherent in virtuous action. They're conditions. These conditions are chance enters somehow, but they are not simply because man has some influence on, on uh, some of these. For example, on um, on his work, and men are, some men are very clever, and others are less clever in get in acquiring money. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So the, uh, a man can't be called happy merely because he says he feels happy. He wouldn't call sure. it a man who no. says he's happy. happy. But because sometimes people say it without believing it themselves. Also, what if they believe it? But what reason does he give us? In the case of somebody who actually believes he's happy, feels happy, dances around and everything else, uh, what reason does he give for calling a man unhappy who says he's perfectly happy? Uh, Plato does the same thing, although he uses slightly different terms, but he gives what appears to be a more satisfying reason. Mm -hmm. There are certain parts of the soul and certain parts of the soul here are fostered by this, they are not fostered by that, and so on and so forth. Understood, as you say, but still, I think your question is is a necessary one because our word happiness in present day meaning is not identical with the meaning of the Greek word. Sometimes we would not hesitate, for instance, to call children happy, even puppies happy, and Aristotle would flatly deny that. Now, one can perhaps state it as follows, is trying to translate what they imply into our language. A, a happy man is a satisfied man, yes. But a, mor a moron may be perfectly satisfied. You know, sometimes they smile all the day, they are perfectly satisfied. And Alistair says no one in his senses would call him happy. Why? Because by happiness we understand such a satisfaction as is enviable in the view of a sensible man. So an enviable satisfaction. This is happiness. And this cannot be only in a non-literary sense can we say we envy animals, drama animals. We don't wish to be animals. We only have to think it through. It may seem to be very attractive to be a puppy and have a wonderful master. But you have the trouble is that you do not have any control if that master dies or gets ill and what kind, whether you will be sent to the pond or God knows what. So you only have to think it through and it proves to be an unwise proposition to be a puppy. And the same applies to other countries. So, and uh, as regarding a child, but I suddenly make this clear, uh, a child is at best happy by promise, and only a kind of sentimentality to which we modern men are very much given would induce us to say, or oh, children, the beauty, the beauty of childhood, you know, with all the promises, and they don't, do not yet know how few of them will be kept. So this is largely based on evolution. So let us take a somewhat more manly and sober view of the situation, and then we will find happiness only among adult people uh, who fulfill the decisive condition that they are doers of noble things. But this seems to be begging the question a little bit. If happiness is such satisfaction as is enviable by the Pudeos, yeah. It appears that that only transposes the question to what is his uh, uh, Yeah. What is the nature of his Yeah, but 
This is a man who, do we not avoid this struggle by saying that the Spudaios is a man whose soul is at work in the mode of excellence? This also said before. No doubt about it, but we are speaking of happiness which is enviable by a sensible man. Now, a sensible man would not envy kings as kings, or for that matter, presidents, because of the, there are also quite a few things in the president's life, as you will surely have seen from the daily papers, which are not enviable. Enormous responsibility. Yes. Ultimately, yes. Yes, yes. Aristotle is not, quote, an individualist, unquote, in the sense in which you mean. And I would say as long as people talked of virtue, people were not individualists in that sense. There is one and only one ultimate standard of human excellence and individuality does not affect it. That it may be, say, the virtue of X will be maybe colored by his physiopsychic or psychophysiological make. That is true. But this is uninteresting. The interesting thing for him is to be an excellent man. Whether Pericles' excellence differs from that of uh, Aristides, that is a secondary question. The main point is that they are excellent men. And if they may be different, one may be more excellent than the other, then it becomes interesting because the difference of degrees, but not the individuality as individuality. Because they, uh, they simply assume that we all are individuals by nature. And uh, what our education or formation consists in our assimilating ourselves to one and the same standard. What does it mean, the formula, to assimilate oneself to God? If that is the most important thing, obviously the individuality, is, the preservation of individuality, is a strictly tertiary of consideration. That is so. Yes. Well, that would be the matter of a special discipline to which he refers, called economics, the management of the household, or the acquisition of wealth. Yes, but political economy, as we call it, um, plays a very subordinate role in, in, in Aristotle, as in classical thought altogether. So this would not, uh, and, and he would simply say, well, the, the experienced statesmen will know how to raise revenue and how to spend, uh, to spend it for the, to the greatest benefit of the community and so. This is a very special consideration to which I still has not given much, uh, much praise in his will. And then from the same point of view, one, one could say this, that since, from Aristotle's point of view, the mo point of view, the most decent way of earning a livelihood is by husbandry, 
then Aristotle should teach the gentleman how to farm and how to raise cattle, which uh, Aristotle never did. It so happens that Xenophon, who belonged to the, to the same world, uh, did write a treatise on gentlemanship, which contains a section on how to farm. For example, whether must cast seed evenly and not unevenly. You know, but it is no longer explained uh, how you can learn that. It's only to, uh, you are only told you must learn that. Mr. Feeling? I'm, I'm struck by the difficulty, or at least apparent difficulty, by the distinction between what is pleasant by nature and what is not. So, yeah. And Aristotle seems to imply here that, that most men are not truly engaged in pleasurable activities because their activities are not pleasant by nature. Yes, it seems to be the case. Now, the question is, how would one know what is pleasant by nature? That is to say, there are certain things that seem clearly natural in their pleasantness, but which are the cause of all sorts of disruption in that uh, they're not profitable from yeah, but the uh, engaged part. Aristotle has devoted a considerable part of the ethics to pleasure, the end of Book 7 and the first part of Book 10. And here he only is leading up to a proposition which saves perfectly his previous definition of happiness and the coincidence of these three considerations, the good, the noble, and the pleasant. And now, this would be not a nice thing to do if Aristotle said, well, now the problem of happiness is solved. But he goes on for four or five pages in taking up the same question again, because what he seems to have solved in the form of the question of the relation of the noble and the blessed comes back in the form of the question of the relation of the intrinsically virtuous actions and the extrinsic conditions of virtuous actions, the equipment. So, so in other words... Carries the discussion to a slightly Different place, one that's more amenable to. Why is it more amenable? Well, if, if one considers the pleasant simply, I mean, it's, it's true a certain amount of equipment is required to, to engage in pleasant activities, but it's not clear that that equipment is synonymous or as extensive as the equipment necessary for virtuous activities. It, it seems to me that it's easier for a man to indulge himself than it, in terms of equipment than it is for him to be virtuous. Yeah, but is the same not true if we take the ordinary understanding of pleasure? Is it not easier to enjoy pleasures indiscriminately than to make an effort in the highest direction? Is not true? Well, that's true, too. But once we grant him equipment necessary for virtue, at that point we assume that, that the pleasure inherent in virtuous activity is higher for better order according to the nature of the soul. Yeah, but still, it does it not detract from the self-sufficiency of happiness if happiness depends on something outside of happiness proper. This is that may let us now see, let us see whether also uh, answers, has answered your difficulty when we have arrived at the end of the discussion on happiness. Now, will you go on? No, they, they read the last sentence of the preceding section again. The, the, otherwise, you will not understand the transition. And this is why some people identify it with good fortune, though some identify it with virtue. It never happens. Yes. It is this that gives rise to the question whether it is a thing that can be learned or acquired by training or cultivated in some other manner or whether it is bestowed by some divine dispensation, or even by fortune. Fortune is the same as chance. Yes. Now, if anything that men have is a gift of the gods, it is reasonable to suppose that happiness is divinely given. Indeed, of all, men, of all man's possessions, it is most likely to be so, inasmuch as it is the best of them all. Yeah, now, I'll start 
raises the question regarding happiness in the most radical form. Happiness is the highest human good. But is it not so high because it is so high? Can it be in any way of human origin? Is it not more reasonable to say it has been given by the gods? Or perhaps it is, it is merely by chance, as a thought which occurred to us in a different context a short while ago. Yes? This subject, however, may perhaps more properly belong to another branch of study. So you know, the question belongs to another consideration. To which, co what consideration would this be? Knowledge. Yes. We see here again that Aristotle presupposes that ethics must not be based on either physics or metaphysics. Yet that uh, is important. But still, is the question which he had just raised not of the greatest relevance for ethics, how do we become happy? Therefore, now go on. Still, even if happiness is not sent us from heaven, but is won by virtue and by some kind of study or practice, it seems to be one of the most divine things that exist, for the prize and end of goodness must clearly be supremely good. It must be something divine and blissful. Yeah. Happiness belongs at any rate, regardless of whether it is sent by the gods or not, to the most divine things. For even if it is a consequence of human action, it differs essentially from these actions, because it is the prize given for them, and not the actions themselves. Divine does not necessarily mean merely or caused by the gods, it may also mean resembling the god or the divine. And this quality, happiness, has in contradistinction to the virtuous actions. Yes. And also, on our view, it will admit of being widely diffused, since it can be attained through some process of study or effort by all persons whose capacity for virtue has not been stunted or made. Meaning, if virtue has its root in man and not in a divine gift or, or happiness, then all men, in principle, can become happy. Some exceptions are to be made. Some men are by nature truncated, say, a moronic men, and they can therefore not become happy. If not, if it were not accessible to most men or to all normal men, it would be a, it could be a privilege of the few elect, elected by the gods. That is the alternative. But even if it is, not all men, literally speaking, can acquire it because some are by nature truncated. Yes. Again. No, but here's the one on the second Are there not differences amongst non so called normal men? Are not some normal men more men than others? Can all therefore can all normal men be happy in the same way? Yeah, that is a long question. According to what Aristotle says here, rather at the beginning of the work, happiness and virtue is open to all men who are not by nature truncated, because happy, virtue is a perfection of the nature of men. All men, I mean, that is metaphoric language when we say some men are more truly men than others. Aristotle, we had a passage where Aristotle referred to that. All, when he criticized Plato's idea of the good, all men are equally human beings, just as all all dogs are equally dogs, all cats are equally dogs, cats. But some may be, have greater disposition toward virtue than others. That's what you mean. Uh, not really. Uh, that's even a little bit more than that. And some men are not only more disposed to be virtuous, but are also stronger, more intelligent, more... 
Yes, sure. Well, no one... Truly, they more truly approach. Well, they have a greater, uh, a greater prospect to be good men, and even good men in the highest sense. Aristotle does not deny. To that extent, the utterance here is somewhat misleading. But the question, the, the question that, that that leads to is, can all men be happy in the same way? Can all normal men be happy in the same way? No, for Aristotle, the, well, in one sense, uh, the question is correct because there are two levels of happiness, generally speaking. The level of moral virtue and the level of the contempl contemplative virtue. But apart from that, some men reach either of these levels or both levels more perfectly than others, and there are no different kinds of happiness apart from these two kinds. Uh -huh. One last question. How would you differentiate what Aristotle says in the following sentence from Leibniz's idea that this is the first of all possible world? I believe Aristotle would have agreed with that. Leibniz was indeed the first, as far as I know, who made the assertion that this the world is the best of all possible worlds. And by the way, from Leibniz's assertion comes the expression optimism. Optimism is originally the view of Leibniz. He said the world is the best of all possible worlds. But Aristotle never said it, but I think it is always implied. Did he mean anything Yeah, well, in Leibniz there are many implications uh, and polemical considerations which are absent from Aristotle. For instance, Leibniz is con compelled to show that even original sin and uh, eternal damnation, things which for Aristotle didn't exist, do not do away with the bestness of the world. And Leibniz, one of Leibniz's argument is that after all, uh, of the original sin took place on the, on the earth. And the earth is a very infinitesimal part of the universe. And so these defects of life on Earth may even be may even contribute to the overall beauty of the universe because it is only such a small part. To repeat, Aristotle doesn't say the world is the best possible world, but I think he would have agreed to that if he if Leibniz had asked him. But the question would never arise for Aristotle for the following reason. Because Leibniz asserts that the world is the best possible world because he assumes that the world has been created by God. And then the question arises, why did God create the world as it is and not in any other way? And then Leibniz's answer is, he preferred this world to all other possible worlds because it was the, is the best possible world. Now, for Aristotle, the question doesn't arise because there is no creation. This is probably the simplest reason. Good. Now, Aristotle, you see, have seen here, makes a distinction between learning and diligence, as we can say. Learning or uh, diligence or, or training. He leaves this open at this time how far learning on the one hand and practice on the other goes into the coming to being of virtue or happiness. Now, will we, shall we go on here? Again, if it is better to be happy as a result of one's own exertion than by the gift of chance, it is reasonable to suppose that this is how happiness is won. If things according to nature have a natural tendency to be ordered in the noblest way, and the same is true of the products of art and of causation of any kind, and especially the highest. Whereas that the greatest and noblest of all things should be left to fortune would be too contrary to the fitness of things. Yeah, would be uh, too short. So happiness can not come to men by chance. Given the high rank of happiness and the low rank of chance, what we get by chance proper, 
okay, are only external goods and not the most important ones. Uh, to re I repeat again, the clearest example of chance given by Aristotle is you dig in your garden and you find a treasure. There is no, no connection. If happiness came through chance, it would not have any connection with virtue. Differently said, a chance is disorderly, random. Nature and art are orderly, and happiness and virtue have more to do with, chance, with nature and art than with chance. In this passage which we just read, you find the Aristotelian equivalent to the best of all possible worlds. I mean, the world may have all kinds of defects, but it is not so stupidly contrived as some people seem to think. That's what the least one would have to say, as the conveys here. Oh. Yeah, it's most beautiful. Uh, is this just asserted here, or does he take up this question in other words? In the metaphysics, he takes it up in a way, or in the physics. In the physics book, too, he has a discussion of the alternative view, let me atomism. The world has come into being out of the aimless and meaningless meetings of atoms. And for Aristotle, this means that the world is a product of chance. And Aristotle tries to show that it is impossible that a whole can be of a chance character. Chance by chance event, we mean always an event occurring within a whole which does not have chance color. So chance presupposes a non-chancy world. And that is a point which she makes there in, in book two. Yes. Now? Light is also thrown on the question by our definition of happiness, which says that it is a certain kind of activity of the soul according to virtue. Whereas the remaining good things are either merely indispensable conditions of happiness or are of the nature of auxiliary means and useful instrumentally. No, that happiness is no, does not come by chance, follows directly from the logos, as Aristotle calls it, and what he translates from the definition of happiness. But this is at the preceding chapter. And the reason is this, the, the soul of which a certain kind of activity, a big kind of being at work is happiness, the soul is by nature. And therewith, the possibility of the virtue of the soul. Every natural being has the possibility of being perfect in its way, or imperfect. The actualization of this possibility, perfection, must follow that possibility, must be adapted to that possibility. Furthermore, the other good things without which there cannot be happiness are in a non-arbitrary relation to happiness that we need external goods, say, some, some belt, belt and so on. This is not a matter of chance. It is, you cannot replace these by other good things which do not, are not suitable as conditions of happiness. So there is here order, intelligible order, and not chance. They do depend on chance to some extent, but they are not the core of happiness. That is the point which Aristotle will repeat time and again. Yes? This conclusion, moreover, agrees with what we laid down at the outset. For we stated that the supreme good was the end of political science, but the principal care of this science is to produce a certain character in the citizens, namely, to make them good and capable of performing noble actions. Yeah, and doers of noble deeds. The view that happiness does not come through chance is confirmed also by the fact that 
happiness, the highest end, belongs to an art, and the political art. And art and chance are mutually exclusive. And here, in passing, Alison makes this remark, which he will re repeat in a modified manner shortly thereafter. Uh, what is politics about? A contemporary political scientist has said, who gets what when? Alison has a somewhat different view. Politics is concerned with making the citizens men of a certain kind, a certain quality, namely good and doers of noble deeds. And we all have to make up our minds sooner or later whether we will side with Aristotle or with Lassler in this as well as in some other matter. Yes? We have good reasons, therefore, for not speaking of an ox or horse or any other animal as being happy, because none of these is able to participate in noble activity. No, well, in, in the being at work of this kind, he refers to what he has said in the definition. Yes. For this cause also, children cannot be happy, for they are not old enough to be capable of noble acts. When children are spoken of as happy, it is in complement to their promise for the future. Happiness, as we said, requires both complete goodness and a complete lifetime. For many reverses and vicissitudes of all sorts occur in the course of life, and it is possible that the most prosperous man may encounter great disasters in his declining years, as the story is told of Priam in the epic. But no one calls a man happy who meets with such misfortunes and comes to a miserable end. So, yeah, this is, here also comes up again with the difficulty regarding happiness. Let us assume that Priam was a man of an excellent human being. And then, through the fault of his good-for-nothing son, Paris, Troy is eventually destroyed. And Priam is killed, and he knows that his wife and all his children, sons will be killed, and all his daughters will be sold into slavery. Now... Is this not obviously misery? Surely no one could call this excellent man in this condition a happy man. So happiness seems to depend very much. Happiness seems to become endangered by misfortunes of a certain size. One, one must be an adult human being in order to be happy. One can state what Aristotle means also as follows. If any being could be happy by divine allotment, a horse could be made happy. In other words, there would be a, a completely topsy-turvy world. Happiness depends undoubtedly on external goods. No one would call Priam happy. Yes? Uh, well, well couldn't, one, couldn't one argue that if Priam had been the most excellent of men, he would not have been a king in the first place and therefore would not have been subject to the kind of unhappinesses that he was, this may sound silly, but juxtapose it, for example, to the case of Socrates. Now, supposing uh, Van Phippe had been, oh, I don't know, take, taken off and sold into slavery. Yeah, I see. And uh, leaving aside for the moment uh, things which amuse us about his Van Pippi, but let's, uh, let's suppose, oh, at any rate, Van Pippi <laughs> being all sold to slavery. Now, this would have been a misfortune for Socrates, but it, at the same time, it would not it would not have borne directly on his happiness or unhappiness as an excellent yeah, man. It, you cannot, I mean, the fact that when you read the stories about Van Pippi, you regard her as an old battle axe. <laughs> uh, does not prove that Sovereigns did not love her. Yes. So the ancients were rather delicate in these matters, and uh, we don't know. She must have had some qualities, otherwise Sovereigns would not have married. And the quality cannot have been wealth. <laughs> uh, uh, that is also clear. So <laughs> she must have had some, what they call, personal qualities. 
<laughs> but still, why, in general, why do you say that a king is unhappy is more bearable than somebody else? I didn't mean to say that, that, that the misery of the king is more bearable than the, than the, uh, than the, the misery of Socrates. It's just that it will, it will, it will, no, it's just the other way around. It's, the king, just by nature of his being a king, is more concerned, I suppose, with, with what you would call the tertiary objects than is, uh, than is Socrates or a philosopher, or Aristotle for that matter. So he's more exposed. Pardon? The king is more exposed That's to the vicissitudes. And what is more, his, his uh, focus is at, a, well, is at a lower level. Yes, but still, we must not, I believe you take it, the fate of crime too lightly. And Aristotle finds, I think, a somewhat more subtle solution in the sequel. Let me now add only one point. This peak, as it were, when he quotes his epigram and asserts that there is a perfect coincidence of the best, the noblest, and the most pleasant. There is a perfect harmony. And this is easily called today optimism in a slightly different sense. And I also have two sanguine view of the human condition. Now, this you must not believe for one moment. I read to you only one passage. The investigation of the... That is at the beginning of Book 2 of the Metaphysics. It, the investigation of the truth is in one way hard, in another easy. An indication of this is found in the fact that no one is able to attain the truth adequately. The difficulties are of two kinds. The cause of the present difficulty is not in the facts, but in us. For as the eyes of bats are to the blaze of day, so is the reason in our soul to the things which are by nature most evident of all. This is the human condition. Man's highest happiness consists in knowing the truth. But we are by nature as able to see the truth as the eyes of birds are fit to see the place of the day. So uh, there cannot be any question of Aristotle having been unduly sanguine regarding the human condition. Yes. Now we go then over to the next one. He also begins the solution of the problem in the next chapter. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's whether or not something is a misfortune determined by the man to whom the uh, misfortune occurred, or did there tell us that there are certain things which are always misfortunate? They are th they insisted, in other words, that is not a matter of mere whim. Otherwise, a man who has lost an envelope on which he made a few notes of no importance, whatever, he might become very disturbed. I have seen such people, unhappy, that, but only he himself would regard him as uh, unhappy. No, but the things which Aristotle mentions, loss of children, loss of friends, loss of good reputation, loss of all wealthy, uh, all means of support, these are terrible things. Think of one well-known example, if Priam doesn't mean so much to you. Think of Job. The fate of Job is an, an epitome of misery. The next, I mean, this, and this is not arbitrary. I mean, there, there are all human beings, except perhaps some inmates of lunatic asylums, would agree that this is great misery. All the children died, all his fortune lost, and um, he is sick in body. Yes? But could not a, a truly good man, a truly virtuous man, not be sorrowful at perhaps the loss of his reputation. It is, yeah, sure, that is true. Alistair, you are on the right way. Alistair will say it in his way. 
and I think he remains a bit closer to what one can expect of normal human beings. I mean, it's of course, some wise men, the Stoics especially, have said that these are no goods at all, these external goods. And one can be happy in under torture, in terms of this kind. But this will not impress much the large majority of men, because they are understandably more attached to their children, to their friends, to their means of support, to their reputation, than these extreme stages are. And we must, uh, I still wish it's not to make extreme demands on them. Now let us then continue where it is off. For it is believed that some evil and also some good can befall the dead, just as much as they can happen to the living without their being aware of it. For instance, honors and disgraces, and the prosperity and misfortunes of their children and their descendants in general. And we will stop here. The difficulty regarding happiness comes out most clearly in the saying of Solon, the Athenian legislator, that no one is to be praised happy before his death. As long as we live, our happiness is in danger. Now, this saying is not quite clear, and therefore Aristotle uh, mentions this ambiguity. It could mean, can only the dead be called happy? And this Aristotle rejects uh, on the ground that we understand by happiness activity, being at work which is not possible for the dead. But Solon doesn't mean that only the dead can be happy. He means that only the dead are no longer exposed to the vicissitudes of fortune. Yet, nevertheless, these vicissitudes still affect them, even if they are not aware of them. And Aristotle ex explains this by an example taken from the living. For example, a living man may lose his children without knowing it. But everyone who knows of the loss of his children will say he is in, a man in misery, although he still <coughs> believes to have the children and believes to be happy. Therefore, the consciousness of happiness or unhappiness is not the sole consideration why we call men happy or unhappy. Now, that is, how does he go on? But here, too, there is a difficulty. For suppose a man to have lived in a perfect happiness until old age, and to have come to a correspondingly happy end, he may still have many vicissitudes befall his descendants some of whom may be good and meet with the fortune they deserve, and others the opposite. And moreover, these descendants may clearly stand in every possible degree of remoteness from the ancestors in question. In other words, grand-grandchildren, grand-grandchildren, and so on. Yes. Now, it would be a strange thing if the dead man also were to change with the fortunes of his family and were to become a happy man at one time and then miserable at another. Yet, on the other hand, it would also be strange if ancestors were not affected at all, even over a limited period, by the fortunes of their descendants. Yes, but the difficulty is this then. Either the happy man is like a chameleon, and his happiness changes into unhappiness and vice versa all the time, or the dead man is thought to be altogether indifferent to the fate of his children and other descendants. Both alternatives are unbearable, and therefore he returns to the earlier difficulty. He will soon find the solution. And do you see the point? It will become clearer from what he says, and therefore I suggest we read a bit, read a, a section. Yes. But let us go back to our former difficulty, for perhaps it will throw light on the question we are now examining. If we are to look to the end and congratulate a man when dead, 
not as actually being blessed, but because he has been blessed in the past. Surely it is strange that the actual time when a man is happy, that fact cannot be truly predicated of him, because we are unwilling to call the living happy, owing to the, vicis to the vicissitudes of fortune, and owing to our conception of happiness as something permanent and not readily subject to change, whereas the wheel of fortune often turns full circle in the same person's exist experience. For it is clear that if we are to be guided by fortune, we shall often have to call the same man first happy and then miserable. We shall make out the happy man to be a sort of chameleon or a house built on the sand. But perhaps it is quite wrong to be guided in our judgment by the changes of fortune, since true prosperity and adversity do not depend on fortune's favors, although, as we said, our life does require these in addition. But it is the active exercise of our faculties in conformity with virtue that causes happiness, and the opposite activities its opposite. And the difficulty just discussed is a further confirmation of our definition, since none of man's functions possess the quality of permanence so fully as the activities in conformity with virtue. They appear to be more lasting even than our knowledge of particular sciences. And among these activities themselves, those which are the highest in the scale of values are the more lasting, because they most fully and continuously occupy the lives of the supremely happy. For this appears to be the reason why we do not forget them. The happy man, therefore, will possess the element of stability in question, and will remain happy all his life, since he will be always, or at least most often, employed in doing and contemplating the things according to virtue. And he will bear changes of fortune most nobly, and with perfect propriety in every way, being as he is, good in very truth, and four square without reproach. So let us stop here. So our answer is certain here, that is the line of the argument from now on. Happiness consists not merely in virtuous activity, but also in the equipment that it goes in. But the core of happiness is the virtuous action, not the things dependent on chance. He contrasts here the instability of fortune and misfortune with the stability of virtue, so it cannot easily be removed. On the contrary, the misfortune do not necessarily endanger happiness. For they give opportunities for acting nobly, and therefore uh, the case of virtue itself. What did you want to say? Isn't, uh, I'm just curious, uh, isn't this a rather uh, uh, strange uh, discussion for us to be uh, undertaking since, uh, if I remember correctly, in the other writings, he doesn't even consider the possibility of, or doesn't consider it very likely that uh, like there's an afterlife or something after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this is not a theoretical book. This is not a book on the soul, the anima, or what have you. But this is a book addressed to gentlemen, not theoretical men. And these gentlemen, who say the least, do not know whether there will not be a life after that. We, you have a good example of that at the beginning of Plato's Republic. Old Kefalos, you remember him? He is, he, his worry is that he doesn't know will there not be punishments after that. And Socrates does not try to tell him there are no such things. Aristotle leaves this question here open. And he gives a reason for it a little bit later, namely, for a simple human being, and I think we all are somewhere simple human beings, the thought that someone to whom we were dear in his life will no longer in any way whatsoever be concerned with us. Think of a, a child of 14 who loses his mother. 
the thought is unthinkable that where there should have been the utmost concern, there will be complete indifference. Is it not more philanthropic, not more humane to assume that this concern will continue beyond the death of the departed human being? This is what I said. Uh, in this way, he enters into, into this way of thinking. In, 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 th in this spirit, he enters into this way of thinking. And without going into the... Th then he would have to open up a terrific theoretical issue. Think of the demonstrations of the immortality of the soul given by Plato. What kind of an argument would this be? It's wholly unfit for the, for the ethics. Couldn't he just uh, not talk about it at all, though, as another alternative? I mean, that's rather than... Yeah, but the question came up very naturally because there is a question of happiness. Uh, happiness seems to be very frail, and this frailness was recognized by Solon in his saying, no one can be praised happy while he is alive. And therefore the whole question of happiness, of how happiness is affected by what happens to a man's nearest and dearest after his death, comes up quite naturally. Aristotle moves on a variety of levels and he leads us up from one level to another. We are still at the beginning. Yes? But the accidents of fortune are many and vary in degree of magnitude. And although small pieces of good luck, as also of misfortune, clearly do not change the whole course of life, yet great and repeated successes will render life more blissful, since both of their own nature they help to embellish it, and also they can be nobly and virtuously utilized. While great and frequent reverses can crush and mar bliss, for they cause pain, and they hinder many activities. Yet, nevertheless, even in adversity, nobility shines through when a man endures repeated and severe misfortune with patience, not owing to the insensibility, but from nobility and greatness of soul. And if, as we said, a man's life is determined by his activity, none of the blessed can ever become miserable. For he will never do hateful or base actions, since we hold that the truly good and wise man will bear all kinds of fortune in a seemly way, and will always act in the noblest manner that the circumstances allow, even as a good general makes the most effective use of the forces at his disposal, and a good shoemaker makes the finest shoe possible out of the leather supplied him, and so on and all... If the general has a very poor army and there is no time for training them properly, yet his excellence will show in the use he makes of this very poor army. The same is true of the shoemaker who has very poor material for making shoes. And now Aristotle applies this to the virtuous man. He, if he is haunted by all kinds of misery, he can't make a big show, a great show, but he can nevertheless, with this very poor material at his disposal, show a uh, lead a life much more noble than the, uh, that of an other man who has the same kinds of misfortune and lacks nobility. And even then, the uh, man lacking nobility who has great good fortune, great good fortune. Yes. And this being so, the happy man can never become miserable, though it is true he will not be supremely blessed if he encounters the misfortunes of a prior. Nor yet assuredly will he be variable and liable to change, for he will not be dislodged from his happiness easily, nor by ordinary misfortunes, but only by severe and frequent disasters. Nor will he recover from such disasters and become happy again quickly, but only, if at all, after a long term of years in which he has had time to compass great and noble things. So in other words, one presents the matter somewhat rhetorically. 
If you have a, a noble character like Prime or Job, he may be stricken with all kinds of misfortune. He will never be a contemptible wretch. He will never be a wretch. You cannot say he is happy if he is stricken this way. Here you have a beautiful example, incidentally, of the inexactness of Aristotle's ethics. How to draw the line here? And yet, in a given case, men of judgment, who have to be men of experience, will draw the line properly when confronted with this particular case and say, this is a man who is happy or who is not a contemporary wretch and another man who is it. Mr. Schutzke? Well, the analogy to the arts, the general who has a bad army or the shoemaker who has bad leather, would suggest that as soon as the virtuous man did have the proper materials, you know, as soon as his luck changed, he would, he would then be able to, to live the same life that he did before. Yes. Yeah. But, but Aristotle says that the recovery would be slow. And not, it would seem that the recovery would be immediate if he still had the the virtue within him and no, all but the, the sufferings, I just want to think of the sufferings. How will long will it take until he has the wounds have healed? But for the other side of the matter, if you think only of loss of wealth, the virtuous man who has lost all his wealth cannot be munificent after having lost his wealth. But after he has recovered it, he will be munificent again. Now, Aristotle would say, if he is a virtuous man, he will not regain his wealth in a very short time. Because then, uh, pun? Well, that depends. I mean, maybe the yeah, well, man they were, the in the classics were rather distrustful. And they, uh, as Plato puts it somewhere, he says, when he says, if you use only just means for getting rich, and another man uses both just and unjust means, the latter will be to become twice as rich and twice as fast rich uh, as the so I was wondering if that statement didn't somehow imply that the bad fortune that this man has suffered eventually will, will affect him in terms of his virtuous activity as well. In other words, that being a poor man, he may get out of the habit of extreme justice because of his needs of the situation. And then once he is then more comfortable again, he may still have a, a turn of mind that leads him to the certain sorts of cunning that he wouldn't have practiced before. Yes, so certain kinds of sorts of cunning with respect to money that wouldn't, you know, that wouldn't have exactly. I don't believe that. No, Alison, I believe, has, has in mind the long healing of the wounds and the, the think of the loss of, loss of children and of good children that this with a, a certain depression or sadness which uh, does not which uh, disables to do as many noble deeds as he otherwise could I think otherwise it doesn't make sense for us Mr. If this is if that is, has been discussed by the ancient cases, whether in order to to win a battle, say in a just war, to make it, such things, wide lies, perhaps even including the word of a gentleman, and I have never heard that, uh, are not permissible and compatible with being a gentleman. But how, how would that? I mean, Aristotle would seem good. Well, Aristotle was 
blissfully unaware of all feudal notions of points of honor. And therefore there was no... The Greek said, I mean... No, no, no. It did not have the feudal notion. Uh, that was observed very nicely by some modern commentators and more than commentators that when there was a council of war during the Persian Wars and Themistocles had one proposal regarding the naval battle <coughs> and this, the Spartan commander, I forgot his name, Eurybiades, had another notion, and the Spartan became very angry and used his whip to whip the mistress. And the mistress said, whip me, but listen to me. Patax on men, aqua death. Now, and these modern commentators observe that this is wholly unthinkable in modern times where there would be a duel first. You know, at this, at this point on earth, uh, it simply uh, didn't exist and wouldn't have had the situation. Nor for Aristotle, of course. But that seems to apply, I mean... Therefore, also on the word of a gentleman, wouldn't mean more than on my word. <laughs> <laughs> that seems to apply, though, I mean, that, there, that the resolution of, of being a gentleman, that is a private man on the one hand, and being a public man on the other, uh, is made here... cheats in order to win a battle in a just war is not blameworthy. I mean, there, there is no, there, there was never any quarrel uh, on the part of men like uh, Aristotle about that. But in a certain sense, I mean, he's not completely blameless. Oh, yes, he is. It is. I mean, if inexperienced people think he is a liar, and then uh, they have to go up and learn that this is not a lie, at least in the sense of a claim where they action. Yes? Sir, I'd like to ask another question about Priam. You made the point a minute ago that uh, this, was a, this was a perfect example of uh, Aristotle's ambiguity, that uh, it was possible to uh, not be happy, but at the same time not to be a wretch either. So we have King Priam, who is not happy, but he is not a wretch either, yes. which is a sort of a, a way of stating that he is happy without knowing it, although happiness not ex, not ex No, no, without knowing it. He is not happy because he, he has suffered these terrible misfortunes. Think only of what happened to Hector. Yes. So he is not happy, and it would be somehow an insult to common sense to say Priam is happy, as the Stoics would have said. But the Stoics were extremists, and one cannot trust in this matter. <laughs> and, uh, but on the other hand, to say he is a contemptible wretch, I add the adjective to make it somewhat more forceful. It's absurd seeing uh, the nobility with, and the seemliness which he observed even in these terrible situations. Yes, but we're talking about nobility. And, and the virtue that is displayed as being a, you know, as being a concomitant of happiness or, or the one being concomitant of the other. So, by it, maybe I, all I wanted to get was perhaps an, an expansion of, of uh, the kind of happiness as Solon understood it to, to uh, maybe another kind of happiness the way Aristotle is taking it to be. I, I'm, uh, I think what Aristotle understands by happiness is not far-fetched. The trouble is only that precisely because he remains loyal to the ordinary understanding of happiness, he gets into these conceptual difficulties. Our ordinary concept of happiness 
it's exposed to this difficulties. It, I mean, the, on the one hand, we cannot, we, uh, it makes sense to say, we are compelled to say that the core of happiness is virtuous activity. I mean, we cannot envy a sensible man, an absolutely abominable, vicious fellow who has external force. That goes without saying. Now, but if we see now this virtuous man, perhaps be, because of his very virtue, think of Glaucon's argument, exposed to all kinds of misery, including a torture and what have you. Well, what shall we say in that case? Do we cease to respect him deeply for this reason? Because he is has come into this misfortune? No. But on the other hand, we cannot say that he is as happy as he was uh, before. And I think Aristotle has provided for this state of affairs by his general remarks about the lack of exactness in his study. There is no simple formula possible. A happiness equal to doing of noble deeds or exercise of virtue, yeah, that is true. But, 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 nothing we can do changes that because it has not been brought in by a mistake of Aristotle's reasoning. But this is the character of human life. And where is it written that human life should be susceptible of, very, uh, of being formulated in simple formula. That is a uh, hope of some of our more naive fellow human beings, but not has not any ground in facts. I think we have to leave it here. We will, if possible, finish it under uh, the reading of the first book next time. I remember there were two of you who promised, I go not on the word of a gentleman, that they would hand in their papers today. Oh, here's one. And do you have another? Do you have it also? Very good. Right. Some of you would write a paper due next Monday on the first book, which, I mean, I would expect more from these papers then from the first papers, which, uh, because we, after all, devoted some time to reading the first book, and that should show somehow. At least that is my one hope or wish, at least. Now, who is willing to volunteer for that task? Your name? So, Mr. Zarenko. Odu. First book of the Edith. Now, there is, of course, no divine or human law demanding that there must be two and not one, nor three or four papers. So if there are more volunteers for next Monday, that's all right with me. Good. And first, I would say a few words about the two papers I received last time. First, Mr. Allen, a few points. Closely related to this is the relationship of virtue and vice. Paren, non-virtue, with a question mark. Mr. Allen, why did you hesitate to speak of vice and call it only non-virtue? I, I didn't hesitate. I could use that as a virtue. So the other one, which is that, that seems to be only two things positive virtue and two vices. Still, that would be vice, because non-virtue, for example, a stone also is non-virtue. That wouldn't, you should not hesitate. Yes, you said rightly that being just depends not on doing just acts, but on doing just acts as a just man would do them. But you did not explain what this means. What does it mean? What it means is that
Yeah, but now, how it does it look? It is in the case of the just man. I mean, the case of, in other words, someone who speaks correct English is not necessarily a good grammarian, or for that matter, any grammarian. But how does it apply in the case of the just man? Well, it applies in the case of the just man because it's So even if a man does always just acts, But more simply, if he does the just acts for the sake of their justice, then he is a just man. But if he does it out of fear of punishment, he is not a just man. Go ahead. All right. And there are certain vaguenesses also, which was to say on page 5. Will you pass on this to Mr. Allen? Mr. Fawcett, paper, also a few points. A somewhat paradoxical situation results. The legislator exists for the sake of the good, but the good exists for the sake of the legislator. Can you explain that? Well, I got a hunch you pick me up on that. <laughs> <laughs> I swear that is not a very polite expression. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, no, no, no. I did not mean it as a reprimand. <laughs> <laughs> I only tried to check on my I knowledge tried to of the. I clarify that a little further on when uh, I, I stated that. The, legis the legislative function, as it appears in that last chapter, well, as it, well, as it, as it appears throughout uh, the work that I've read so far, yeah. is a, of, a, of a largely mechanical nature, so that the function of the legislator is to legislate. That is, his, that is his bent. He keeps in mind the just object or the, or the object of justice. Nonetheless, his immediate attention is to the business of legislating, and he receives his guidance. From the teachings, or the teachings or instruction, what is the science which in turn is informed by philosophers? But the point is, is that his life is the legislative life, and to that to that end, you might say the good serves as a means, so that in a sense, his legislative life is is a, is a function of uh, you might say the good. The good exists for the sake of his legislative. Which no. Is not denied, which is not to deny, however, that he keeps in mind the good uh, as, you might say, a final end. You've got, I, I, I didn't uh, make that clear. No, you did not. I mean, I would say that's wrong, what you say. There's one more point. Yeah. Oh, no, that's all. And now let us turn to where we left off. Aristotle is discussing here, in the chapter we are now reading, the saying of Solon that no one can be praised happy before his end, before his death. And this is a consequence of the fact that the relation between happiness and, human, and excellent human activity is not clear. Habit, the core of happiness, is excellent human activity. But happiness requires, in addition, something else, what Aristotle calls equipment. Or to take another case which is not necessary, which is not immediately related, equipment is, are things which are required for doing excellent things. For some, you must be in a reasonable state of health, of body and mind, to do excellent actions. But you do not have to be very handsome in order to do that. Now, why should extreme ugliness prevent a man from becoming happy? That is not so clear. That is, non-ugliness doesn't seem to be a necessary condition, necessary instrument for acting nobly. And yet it is so, according to our assertion. Now, so there is an excess of happiness beyond nobility of actions. Another illustration, uh, the most, most simple illustration, is the fate of Priam or of John. Uh, assumedly, 
a man of excellent character who suffers the greatest miseries which a human being can suffer. Is he still happy in this miserable, sta miserable state? The mere fact that we call him miserable seems to show that he cannot be happy. But Aristotle asserts, Aristotle's way out is the core of happiness is nobility of action. And he would presumably say that this man of extreme ugliness and repulsiveness, the way in which he bears that and does not become resentful and is not molded, as it were, in his whole being by this misfortune, that is a matter in which his nobility of character can show. So that it remains with the core of happiness is nobility of action, yes, but, and if Aristotle, if one is dissatisfied with it, Aristotle would probably say, well, give me a better formula. And if the Stoics, for example, uh, had this formula, these other things don't count. They are not even good things. They are only preferable, as they call them, but which they are not to be called good in any strict sense. This led to the famous Stoic paradoxes, which are, whereas Aristotle's view is precisely not paradoxical, but sticks to what we all would ordinarily admit, and that is not unimportant if we want to understand human things and human affairs. Now, I think we should continue at 1100A14. What then does prevent us from calling happy the man who acts according? Should I find it for you? Eleven hundred A. What then prevents us from pronouncing half that man happy who realizes complete goodness in action and is adequately furnished with external goods, not for any casual period, but throughout a complete lifetime in the same manner? Or should we add that he must also be destined to go on living in the same manner and to die accordingly, because the future is hidden from us, and we conceive happiness as an end, something utterly and absolutely final and complete? In other words, if you take him only as he is now and do not consider his future fate and eventually his end in terms of his death, and what happens in Britain, you take to narrow your happiness. Yes. If this is so, we shall pronounce those of the living who possess and are destined to go on possessing the good things we have specified to be supremely blessed, though on the human scale of bliss. So much for a discussion of these things. Yeah. So, let's clear. There we can call living men, men while they are still alive, happy or blessed, but with the qualification, blessed as human beings can be blessed with this big question mark. What will happen to them in the future, which we do yet do not know? Yes. That the happiness of the dead is not influenced at all by the fortunes of their descendants and their friends in general seems too heartless a doctrine and contrary to accepted beliefs. Yeah, uh, to, to the opinions, he says, simply, to the opinions. The fate of the descendants and of the friends must be considered important in judging the happiness of a man, even after the man is already dead. The alternative would be heartless, as he translates, loveless, as would be perhaps be a better translation, and in addition is... Uh, runs counter to the opinions. The opinions, the two reasons go together. The accepted opinions are inspired by the opposite of lovelessness. Men's desire for love, for being loved, for attachment, forms the opinions which are generally accepted, and that is the rationale. Do you want to say something? Yes, I just wanted to ask whether there's a, a textual reason for saying that that sentence refers only to men who are already dead. 
seems that it, it could refer to a man who was alive, too, if you're saying that about him. Yeah, that goes without saying, that if a man is alive and he has born before, prior, these things happen to his life. There is no explicit reference here. But when he says the fates of the descendants of veteran first not only to the children and grandchildren, but also beyond, say great-grandchildren, many people who don't see them, their own great-grandchildren, and still there's the next generation. I think he means that. Yes? But the accidents of life are many and diverse, and vary in the degree in which they affect us. To distinguish between them in detail would clearly be a long and indeed endless undertaking, and a general treatment in outline may perhaps be enough. Even our own misfortunes, then, though in some cases they exercise considerable weight and influence upon the course of our lives, in other cases seem comparatively unimportant. And the same is true of the misfortunes of our friends of all degrees. Also, it makes a great difference whether those who are connected with any occurrences are alive or dead, much more so than it does in a tragedy whether the crimes and horrors are supposed to have, been, to have taken place beforehand or are enacted on the stage. We ought, therefore, to take this difference also into account, and still more, perhaps, the doubt that exists whether the dead really participate in good or evil at all, for the above considerations seem to show that even if any good or evil does penetrate to them, the effect is only small and trifling, either intrinsically or in relation to them, or if not trifling, at all events not of such magnitude and time as to make the unhappy happy or to rob the happy of their blessedness. It does then appear that the dead are influenced in some measure by the good fortune of their friends, and likewise by their misfortune, but that the effect is not of such a kind or degree as to render the happy unhappy, or vice versa. Yeah, and that's a quite complicated statement. Now, in two cases, in A35 and in B6, Alistair doesn't use the ordinary word for the dead, but somewhat more solemn word, kekme cottage derived from the Greek word kamno, kamno, which means to be tired, to be ill, and then also to have, and in the perfect is here, to have become tired, and then finally the dead. I would translate it by departed in order to mean the, indicate the reverential element which this word here has. So, Aristotle compares here the terrible things which happened to a man after death, i.e. which happened to his descendants and friends, and the terrible things which happened during one's lifetime, to the difference between the terrible things which are merely told in the prologue of a drama, a tragedy, and the things which happen on the stage. Now, of course, we are more affected by what we see on the stage than by what, say, a messenger or someone else tells in a poem. And we are, the dead, the departed, are less affected by the misfortune of their descendants and of their friends than they would have been if they were still alive. What Aristotle is imp implies is they are so far away, a, a kind of weak rumor which reaches them and therefore cannot deeply affect them. And they are preoccupied with other things. And also it takes a kind of long time until the rumor reaches them. And uh, we know perhaps from our experience if we hear of a friend whom we have not seen for a very long time, that he died some years ago, that is a slight difference than when we hear he died just now. So this is not in, not simply superstition, what Aristotle gives us here, but these are very human observations. So the main point is this, 
one's happiness is not seriously influenced by what happens to one's nearest and dearest after one's death. It has a certain influence, but not very great. So whether Anastasia believed that there is such a life after death in which one can become aware of the fate of one's nearest and dearest, yeah, that it's hard to decide on this passage, but he only says that's enough for the present purpose. Uh, granting that this is the case, we can disregard it in our discussion of happiness. Here we are then, in a way, at the end of, of the discussion of happiness, with one limitation, we will see that soon. And we can say, every normal man of good family who is not repulsively ugly, and of course not mor moronic, uh, can become happy. That seems to be the net result. There is a certain awkwardness in this result, because as we have seen on an earlier occasion, in 1099b18-20, to 20, that the uh, highest good uh, must be available for all those who are not truncated with regard to virtue and must be available to them through some learning or teaching and assiduity. Clearly, a man truncated, quite a few people are not truncated and yet are poor or have other, lack other equipment so that they cannot be perfectly happy. Now, Regarding the discussion in this chapter, I might uh, refer to Thomas Aquinas' commentary, which shows here clearly the difference between Thomas and Aristotle. Thomas argues on the basis of the principle accepted by Aristotle that a natural desire cannot be vain, i.e. a natural desire must be fulfilled. And this leads Thomas, given the fact that the natural desire for happiness is not fully fulfilled, not unqualifiedly fulfilled, to the conclusion that our natural desire for happiness points to a bliss in another life. That is surely not what Aristotle suggests. What, how would Aristotle argue against Thomas? Mm -hmm. Such an argument seems to abstract from chance. Um, yeah, but a natural desire is a desire which which is fulfilled. You mean it is fulfilled according to Aristotle in most cases, not in all cases. It's not fulfilled for something. Someone fulfills all the requirements, but yet doesn't achieve happiness. It's not a kind of fortune. Yeah. Well, and Thomas would, of course, say there is no chance in this sense but providence. And therefore, that would be the difference. That's one way of saying it. Yes? Yes, you would say that. The principle, but what is the principle implied? Aristotle would say natural, every natural desire, and no natural desire is in vain, but a desire for what is intrinsically impossible is not natural, but it proceeds from certain questionable opinion, and is not a natural desire. Yes, uh, that he seems to say. You want to say something? Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, but the question, yeah, but the, if you put it only this way, that he doesn't know, he's as blessed as human beings. But this might lead to the view that there is another form of bliss. What I mean to say is that wouldn't quite as projected that he could be perfectly happy. Yeah, sure he would say, but he would say nevertheless, it makes sense to speak of the felicity of this life. And uh, that's the term which he uses all the time in this, in his commentary on the first book of that. It makes sense and it's even necessary to think of practical questions, the greatest happiness of the greatest number, an expression which makes some sense, doesn't it? I mean, whether it is uh, sound, it's political principle, is another matter, but it makes some sense. Therefore, we must have, make allowance for a limited and qualified kind of happiness. That's no difficulty. Yes. Aristotle would merely say that uh, he's not talking, I'm not talking at all about uh, any happiness other than the happiness that can be achieved by man, here and now. Yeah. So I'm not talking about the happiness of the dead. Yeah, but see the question, yeah, but he does, he does, he does, does he not bring uh, it up? But only, uh, only insofar as it is connected with the happiness that they achieved, that they achieved on earth. He's, he's very careful, so it appears, not to go beyond that. They're not talking about whether the, what the, the dead are happy or how the dead are happy as dead men. The dead are made more happy or less happy a little bit by not what happens to them in the afterlife, but what happens to their ancestors, uh, to their uh, descendants on earth. Yes, still, so, but, so, but how, far, how is their happiness affected? But by what happens to their descendants on earth. So the happiness after death is being considered. And I think Aristotle could not well avoid that because we limit our, you said Aristotle is only concerned with the happiness which can be achieved by human action. But Aristotle has shown that this happiness which can be achieved by human action depends on so many things which man cannot himself procure for himself. No question. But yet Thomas would, would do something entirely different. He would say that the happiness of man after death depends not so much on what he did in life yes, sure. and what his ancestors did, but what on what happens to him after he dies. On what happens no, to it, him after he dies. Well, in, uh, to some extent, I believe it, have, it depends a bit on what he did in his life. Yeah, someone. I mean, someone, not completely, because the Rich. divine grace comes in. But still, it is, I think, of some... But let us assume he never repented his evil deeds. Uh, then uh, one is, is a fair assumption that his post, his life after that, will not be too happy. Yeah. Uh, yet, uh, yet, isn't there a difference, or, or perhaps this isn't significant, between Aristotle's discussion of happiness of the dead, and not only Thomas's, but also Plato's. And Plato discusses what, what happens to a man in the afterlife in terms of what actually happens to him in the afterlife, not in terms of what happens on earth and how he's affected by it. Aristotle doesn't appear to discuss the fate of the soul no, no. in the afterlife. But still, but his discussion implies some thought about it. Yes. Because uh, the dead, I mean, uh, if the dead were absolutely dead, yeah, yeah. then uh, the question couldn't arise. But this view that the dead are absolutely dead is a loveless view with a view to their nearest and dearest. Because the thought that someone who has been greatly concerned with will now be completely indifferent to your fate is hard to bear. The love is a hard thought, harsh thought, a loveless thought. It may be the true thought, but this is not the only consideration in human matters whether it is true or not. Yes? I don't understand exactly the argument that uh, Mr. Redigan was making about uh, chance. I don't, in other words, it seems to me that uh, uh, that the very fact that a natural desire for happiness can be interrupted by such a thing as chance implies the conclusion that Aristotle, I mean, that Aquinas makes. I mean, that, it's 
a despicable or contemptible wretch. And that is where as one would do that of someone who is say justly condemned to death, if I may use an example no longer fit, but as people say in the 17th, 18th century, you would see the matter. Well, yes. in a certain sense, though, the phenomena of non-happy people is more widespread in the sense, I would assume that the argument would be that people have an, a, or at least good, or some of them have a natural inclination towards a contemplation or a, towards that type of happiness which comes from contemplation, and yet no one can ever fully achieve that type of happiness. And I would assume yeah, sure. that Aquinas is a quite, I mean, Aquinas' argument comes on that level, not on the level of whether it's an accident that uh, physical attributes. Yeah, but Anastasia grants that. Answer grants that, that we have, I read to you, I think, last time, a passage from the, from the metaphysics where Aristotle compares us to bats, bats in their relation to the light. So that is our relation to the truth. And yet, Aristotle would say, what else can you reasonably expect? You cannot define happiness by our desires or wishes. We can only define our happiness with a view to what is humanly possible. In, in this sense then, though, isn't Aristotle himself a, I don't know what the correct word, but he, at least he's, he's, a, he's different than his Plato, I would assume, in the sense that uh, the, 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 if not in some way the platonic conception of the good life or the, ha the happy man connected with the desire for a good, which is in a certain sense incommensurable with the average man, or perhaps all men, uh, you... You know, but the, that is very hard, you see, because Plato did not write a treatise, as Aristotle did, and one would have to go into the whole dialogue, and that is always a long question. At the face of it, Plato seems to teach the immortality of the individual soul, especially in the Phaedo, that is of course true. But what that means can only be established by a Close side of the dialogue. Sister and when the president of the students' union, I forgot your name. <laughs> My question is, uh, was partly answered by uh, the last one, but it seemed that when you were offering Mr. Watson to be hungry, you shifted the ground to the argument to be at the right, rather than answering the question as to natural relation, but I think you answered that part. Uh, you know, he, don't, he, he is compelled to take this up because there is a certain complication regarding happiness. This complication uh, uh, caused Solon to say, no one is to be praised happy before his death. And then the issue of death and after death comes in in this manner. And so it does, and doesn't wish to shift it. Well, the question, why is it good that these desires, whether they are natural or not, cannot be fulfilled? Is that part of ethics? Part of the study of ethics? Yeah, uh, sure, after we must know the human good. Is this not true? If, we, if what is good for man is man. And then, of course, we have also to know negatively such notions of the human good as are not reasonable, because otherwise they might uh, obfuscate our both our thoughts and our actions. So, the strictly speaking, that would be question for the science of that. Um, yeah, but it, well, it cannot be the theme. That is a somewhat complicated relation. I will now state it in, in an assertoric or dogmatic manner. There is it, we must make a difference between the de jure and de facto situation. You will know this distinction from international law. I don't know if you explain that. Now, de jure, Ethics is completely independent of physics or metaphysics. Man has certain natural inclinations and which culminate in this the desire for happiness. And since this is the naturalness of the inclinations means in the case of man that man is aware of these objectives. And he has also an awareness of them, of the order of rank between them, so that to be uh, have a well-shaped soul 
it's more important than the agriculture is a body that is also known to all people of any delicacy. So we have the, we know the ends of human life. And therefore use within these limits then we find the proper means to these ends and that there is an indefinite variety there. And what you should do in Alaska or farmer north in order to be happy or on the equator will be greatly different. Yeah? And uh, that applies not only regarding uh, air conditioning and such things, but it has also to do with some other things. Good. Now, so we don't need any, any further knowledge, uh, except that supplied by our common sense, as we say. Yet, there are at all times false opinions regarding the good human life. At all times. Think today of communism, as an example. And these of false opinions make impossible commonsensical, sound, practically wise action. And therefore it is necessary for the teacher of ethics or politics to engage in a theoretical criticism of those theoretical opinions that endanger sound practice. So de facto, you can therefore say, ethics is in need of a theoretical defense of its basis. And this is implied by Aristotle, but it is not made the theme. Therefore, there is very little discussion of theoretical false opinions endangering practice. In a certain sense, it would be impossible to write uh, the ethics or at least the way Aristotle writes the ethics without having previously answered the matter. Uh, yes, then doubtless if Aristotle, that one can say it is the same Aristotle who writes the physics and the ethics and not only it so happens, but you see the same style of thinking, that, that's true. And the Aristotelian view that the true being by excellence is this here dog and not atoms, nor the four elements, nor the platonic ideas. This is the same spirit which animates his ethics, you know, this incarnation of common sense. But if it comes to, it, to evaluate common opinion, you have to have a, um, a metaphysical um, yeah, but that is not so. I mean, that is a very, we use the word metaphysical with great ease, and it is not an Aristotelian term. I mean, a, a certain book of Aristotle was called by its editors the metaphysics, and only because it took the place in the arrangement after the physics, which is a literalization of metaphysica. And that is the origin of our word. For Aristotle, there is a thing he calls the first philosophy. And that is, uh, uh, that is what he gives in his book called Metaphysics. But there is no... Uh, it is wiser to take the independence of the ethics seriously than to question it. We will come across passages where we see the limitations of this independence. But it is more important, at least for the understanding of the ethics as a whole, to see that this book is meant to be independent of any theoretical science. The theoretical science, the dependence on them becomes necessary in the first place because there are so many false theories around which obfuscate our natural understanding of the objects of, of human action. Yeah, precisely that natural under, I guess that's a, precisely that natural understanding is is uh, is what somehow that only becomes significant to speak of a natural understanding, doesn't it? If you engaged in what first philosophy. Right? Yeah, not quite. Why should not just as dogs and cats and horses and birds 
have certain desires peculiar to them, you know, and without being taught by anyone, natural. Why should not men also have some objectives peculiar to his nature, fitting his nature just as the objects of the desire of the horse are in agreement with his nature? Why should this not be so? Of course, there is this complication that man has an awareness of them as objectives, which the dogs, cats, and so on do not have. Yes, that is certainly true. This means that there is an essential difference between man and non-man, a difference which Aristotle brings out by saying man is the animal that possesses discourse or reason. But in spite of this enormous difference, this generality, nature, end, specific end, specific nature, directed towards specific end, is common to men and to all other living beings. There was someone else? Yes. Oh, quite a few. Yes. Uh, in, in the section of the past habits, there is a five process. Uh, it's a section on what? On the causes of happening. Yeah. He lays out five causes, leaving aside chance and uh, divine causes, which um, learning, habituation, and some kind of training. Yeah. Now, is that, is that some kind of training? Is that the same thing as skill? Yeah, but for example, it says <coughs> skill of riding, yeah? well, swimming. It seems, it seems like, for instance, in the case of courage, Courage could not depend on, say, how well a man could do a sword. No, no, therefore he calls, speaks of habituation in that case, and not of practice. Mm -hmm. what, uh, of, uh, of, of ascesis in Greek. What, I don't, so I don't see... Yeah, when we, we come to, there is a long discussion of how virtue is acquired. Uh, let, that is not immediately pertinent to what we are discussing now. Yes? It seems odd for Aristotle to say that it would be unnatural to find enjoyment to desire happiness. I'm, I'm saying in a way, uh, if they seem to desire to be happy, they seem to be men. Pardon that? Did you not claim that Aristotle's reply to Aquinas' uh, objection would it be that it is unnatural to desire that which is impossible. Honest, I, well, I did not hear you, but what I said was this. It is not natural to desire the impossible. So, therefore, it's not natural for people who are uh, supposed to be ugly or not of uh, retreating to desire to be happy. They still desire to be happy. But the, the question is, no, well, the final solution of the difficulty comes eventually at the end. The most solid happiness and the true happiness is that of contemplative life. And there these uh, differences too are not so important. But they, they, are, they uh, cease to be important on, this, on that highest level. But, now, first but uh, the first sentence of the metaphysics, that all men desire by nature to know. That is a, a, a starting point for Aristotle's understanding of happiness, the eventual understanding, not the one with which he starts in the ethics. And from this it follows that men desire by nature, above all, the highest kind of knowledge. Because if you desire knowledge, then you can be, by you desire by implication that knowledge which is the most comprehensive and most fundamental of all knowledge, philosophy. That doesn't mean that all human beings in fact desire that knowledge, because there are so many obstructions and impediments to it that this can never fully develop in most cases. And yet, it is the highest human objective. Yes? But then what Aquinas can say about this is that there are many men who do not have the 
Я, я, что? Что? Yes, then that is true, and that is in a way at first sense a superior solution. But you get something, an equivalent of the difficulty in another uh, form, namely, then if then happiness after life, heaven or hell, and now the majority of men will not deserve heaven. She has the same difficulty then in for on other ground here too. So in other words, a solution according to which all men can be happy in the sense that they have a very high chance of becoming happy is too sanguine according to the uh, pre-modern view. And you know the view which prevailed in the last two centuries was or the last century, we should perhaps say, is since it's so, this is so, we must redefine happiness, though that it can be achieved by political communal action for everybody, and preferably even without the individual doing much about it, as a kind uh, due to political action only. And it is also, I believe, is not free of from difficulty. But at any rate, uh, Aristotle's uh, view, I mentioned this, I believe, on earlier occasion, Aristotle makes certain tacit assumptions, such as the scarcity of, of natural resources, which inevitably leads to the consequence that the human beings of independent means, I mean, not necessarily very wealthy, uh, will be always a minority. Or as the Bible puts it, the poor will always be with you. And they, according to Aristotle, are disqualified. But given his assumption, he acts reasonably. Now, we have learned that this assumption is wrong, that this economy of scarcity can be replaced by an economy of plenty. The difficulty is only that this solution leads to difficulties of its own. And I believe we cannot diagnose properly these difficulties besetting us today if we do not bust the case wide open and consider alternative views of human happiness like the view of Aristotle and its implications. In addition, our modern view, I mean, produced by people like Bacon and Descartes for the first time in the 17th century, are consciously directed against Aristotle, and in a, at least this sense, based on Aristotle. Because if you oppose something and your thought comes into being through the opposition to another position, you, your position is in, a, in an important sense based on that. I would love to continue that, but we have to read a bit more. Or is it very urgent? is a fact of original sin. Yeah, but there's another fact of incarnation. But still, but this is not, but is there not also a, a distinction between the elected and the damned? Is there not uh, some kind of predestination there? Yeah, but not naturally. No, no, surely not naturally, because the whole question is now on a supernatural basis. Therefore, you... The natural question is to dispose of all natural difficulties by transcending the natural towards the supernatural. But you get difficulties of their own there. That is all I said. Now, we must now turn to the next chapter, which concludes the discussion on happiness. 
the situation is this. Virtuous activity is the core of happiness. Happiness is in principle available through human causation. That is what, what we want. Then we are the producers of our own bliss and that is given to us. Wonderful. But, Alistair says, that is the beginning of the next chapter. Uh, are these questions being settled? You mean? Yeah. These questions being settled, let us consider whether happiness is one of the things we praise or rather one of those that we honor. For it is at all events clear that it is not a mere potentiality. You know, that is, um, yeah, or, or ability or so. But what we have to know about this distinction is only this. Abilities or potential, uh, what, uh, that are things which can be used well or ill, and therefore do not belong to the praiseworthy things, because what is, well, which, what can be misused is as such not praiseworthy. I would say the other things, the interesting things, are divided into things to deserving praise and things deserving reverence. I believe that is better than to translate it by honorable, because the praiseworthy and the honorable are the same. Deserving reverence, deserving to be revered. Now? Now it is seen that a thing which we praise is always praised because it has a certain quality and stands in a certain relation to something. For we praise just men and brave men, in fact, good men and virtue generally, because of their actions and works. And we praise the strong, the swift of foot, and the like on account of their possessing certain natural qualities and standing in a certain relation to something good and excellent. Yes, yeah, so praise refers to a man's having a certain quality, a certain quality, a good runner, a just man, they are all qualities. And with a view to, we have in mind that this is praiseworthy because it is productive of certain actions or works, swift running. Just actions, or whatever you have. So the implication already here is that the praiseworthy is lower than the the thing to be the things to be revered, because it is has this relativity, not in the sense in which the term is now used in relativism, but it has is relative to actions. It does not have this intrinsic superiority which the uh, other objects have. Yes. The point is also illustrated by our feeling about praises addressed to the gods. It is evidently ridiculous that the gods should be referred to our standard. And this is what praising them amounts to, since praise, as we said, involves a reference of its object to something else. You know, there is something. Praise is relative, I said, namely to human action. And Aristotle goes here so far to say if we praise the gods, and that does not correspond to our usage and understanding at all, if we praise the gods, we praise them with a view to us, to the benefit they give to us or the misfortunes they keep from us and so on. And therefore, one cannot praise the gods, strictly speaking. Is sense, yes. But if praise belongs to what is relative, it is clear that the best things merit not praise but something greater and better, as indeed is generally recognized since we speak of the gods as blessed and happy. And also blessed is the term that we apply to the most godlike men. And similarly with good things. No one praises happiness as one praises justice, but we call it a blessing, deeming it something higher and more divine than things we praise. There must then be something higher than praise or praiseworthy. And these are, according to the general notions, the gods. But closer to our object, 
which were on subject, happens in contradistinction to virtue or virtuous action. Happiness belongs to, to the same sphere to which the gods belong, and virtuous action does not. It is quite surprising, after we have heard hitherto, that virtue is the core of happiness. There is something in happiness which transcends virtue, that we have seen before. And Aristotle says that which transcends virtue is, in a way, in a way is my addition, is in a way higher than what we can possibly do. We can also say being revered are beings not for being of such and such a quality, such and such like. Honor father and mother. It is not said, honor thy father and thy mother if they are good. The meaning being, there is something in parenthood which deserves reverence independently of goodness and badness. Now, the same is true, of course, of the gods. The gods cannot be measured by the standards of human virtue, but as beings, not because of their qualities, they are to be revealed. Now, we have come to think of it. What Aristotle says is not so alien to what we mean. When we say, the word, we translate the Greek word eudaimonia by happiness, and this is, of course, uh, a word which we use very frequently, and therefore it has lost much of its force, of the force of the Greek word, eudaimonia, having a good demon. But we use in other words from time to time, more rarely perhaps, blessed, blessings. For example, we have many children and good children is a part of happiness, as Aristotle said. Well, we call it also sometimes a blessing, and then a very different connotation comes in, and then it seems to be so a blessing is something higher than what we can do for ourselves. This is the phenomenon to, Aristotle, to which Aristotle refers here. Yes? Indeed, it seems that Eudoxus took a good line in advocating the claims of pleasure to the prize of highest excellence, when he held that the fact that pleasure, though a good, is not praised, is an indication that it is superior to the things we praise, as God and the good are, because they are the standards to which everything else is referred. For praise belongs to virtue, since it is this that makes men capable of accomplishing noble deeds. So let me stop here for a moment. Now he refers to Eudoxus, a famous mathematician, of whom he speaks uh, later on. Eudoxus was a hedonist, an adherent of the view that the good is identical with the pleasant. Aristotle dis disagrees with Eudoxus, as appears later. But here he says only for illustrating, he uses Eudoxus' view only for illustrating what he means, not while he subscribes to Eudoxus altogether, the distinction between the praiseworthy and the things and the things deserving reverence can even be used for making a case in favor of pleasure, because pleasure has this peculiar character that you cannot, strictly speaking, produce it. Now, what Aristotle means by that uh, comes here. Can you quickly look up 1174b toward the end? But the pleasure perfects the activity, not as the fixed disposition does, by being already present in the agent, but as a supervening perfection, like the bloom of health in the young and vigorous. Yeah, a supervening perfection, something which is like the bloom. This bloom is not the same as health, and yet it is something very wonderful. That is a relation that is, in a way, Aristotle's last word on pleasure. Therefore, it is something, in this sense, one can say it is divine. It means so far as man 
cannot produce it, at least in the higher forms of passion. Now then there comes a brief digression which we read. While in comia are for deeds accomplished, whether of the body or of the soul. However, to develop this subject is perhaps rather the business of those who have made a study of encomia. Yeah, what he means is that are two kinds of speeches or, or writings. Praises, epinoi, that we know them especially in the form of eulogy, and another are encomia, the, the eulogies, the praises deal consist of an enumeration of his virtues. And the encomia consists in a description of his deeds. This was a distinction which Aristotle obviously accepted. So the supremacy of happiness in contradistinction to virtue and virtuous activity is maintained by Aristotle. Man owes the best not to himself. Although what he does is, in this, is the indispensable prerequisite of his receiving the best. Therefore, his virtue is the indispensable condition for happiness. Now, from this view, that man owes the best to himself, owes the best not to himself, it follows that the right posture toward the best and therefore toward life in general is gratitude, not self-reliance, and, no, and still less, a posture of demanding. Happiness is, in a way, as it was said before, although they are criticized by us, so God sent or God given. You know, the phrases are good in 1099b, 9 to 10. That is the end of the discussion of happiness. And if this is not elegant, as the mathematicians speak of elegant proofs, Aristotle had warned us in advance that we cannot expect this kind of elegance when we speak of human things, and especially of human happiness, which is a frail thing. And therefore we cannot speak about it without some hemming and hawing. And uh, this is not Aristotle's fault. It is the fault, if it can be said to be the fault, of the things themselves. And to be loyal to the things themselves, this was perhaps the ambition of Aristotle more than of anybody else. So, this is then the end of the discussion of happiness. And in a way, the end of Book One, because the chapter which follows is already the transition to Book Two or even to the whole rest of the world. Now, this is a good moment, perhaps, to give a brief survey of the plan of Book One up to this point, and which may be helpful also for reminding you of what we may have forgotten. Now, there is a first section going up to 1095 A13, where Aristotle speaks of the many ends of various kinds and the corresponding manyness of arts, leading up to the suggestion that there is a highest art, the political art, and therefore there is presumably also a highest end, the object of that highest art. And Aristotle concludes his discussion by a remark on the exactness to be expected in this investigation. The second section, up to 1095b13, the highest good, the highest end, is called by all men with the same name, and be happiness. Therefore, there is some agreement as to, among all men, that there is one and only one highest end, because it is no accident they use all the same name for it. In this brief section, he discusses also what kind of principle 
of the investigation we can reasonably expect. He does not speak there of exactness. The third section, leading up to 1297A14, deals with the various false opinions about happiness. A. Popular opinions. B. Opinions of wise men. In this case, only the opinions of a single wise man, namely Plato. The fourth section, 1097A15 to B21, Aristotle gives here some general determination of what happiness is. In the next section, the fifth section, 1097B22, 2098b8, he gives his definition of happiness, his logos on happiness, as he calls it. And this is concluded again by a reflection on both exactness and on the kind of principles with which we may have to be concerned. Then, in the sixth part, 1098b9 to 1099b9, Aristotle confronts his logos, his definition, with what is generally said about happiness. And here, the pleasant things come to the fore for the first time, and therewith the difficulties caused by the misfortunes of the good men. 7, 1099b10, 1101b9. Can any man be called happy while he is still alive? The solution of the difficulties, virtuous activity is the core of happiness, and therefore Priam can never have become a wretch. And then a kind of compensation for the seventh part in the eighth, 1101b10 to 1102a4, happiness belongs to a higher sphere than virtue and virtuous activity. And I think here you see it this way, the difficulties with which we are confronted, but I think the difficulties are not just due to Aristotle's special prejudices or preoccupations or what, but they lie in the subject matter, and they might, would come out in very different forms in a non-Aristotelian premises, but come out they would. Now, we should by all means read the next chapter, The Transition to the Secret, and I would like to say only one word about my present plan of how we shall proceed. I think we should read book two and the first half of book three because this is a general discussion of virtue. After all, we have to know what virtue is after we have heard so many good things about her. And then that we get a somewhat more exact or concrete notion of what Aristotle sense by virtue, we should read the section of, on the first virtue that he discusses, namely courage, and, two, and the, on the two virtues which Aristotle regards as particularly praiseworthy and high, what is called magnanimity, and the other is called justice. And so we have a, a magnanimity book discussed in book four, and the whole book five is devoted to justice. So that is the first half of the book. And we cross the bridge, uh, what we do afterward, when we have come to it. And uh, we should read, if possible, also book six and uh, sections of book ten. And it's generally my plan. Now, shall we then re re at least begin with the next chapter? But inasmuch as happiness is a certain activity of the soul in conformity with perfect virtue, it is necessary to examine virtue, for this will probably assist us in our investigation of happiness. So Aristotle returns here then to the as 
assertion that preponderates in his uh, presentation. The core of happiness is virtue, and therefore we must naturally investigate virtue above everything else. Yet, for the sake of better understanding of happiness, to this extent, the supremacy or primacy of happiness is preserved here. Do you want to say something? I wanted to know if there was a, a possibly just more, a political motive in that. Is is just to sort of assuage the sentiments of the uh, of the gentlemen who are reading that virtuous activity. Uh, there is enough of an ambiguity between the core of happiness being virtuous and virtuous activity, while at the same time happiness, in, in a kind of way, is, is superior to virtuous activity in the sense that it subsumes virtuous activity. So that virtue is, in a way, kind of kind of uh, shunted, almost uh, shunted into the background. Not quite. I mean, I believe that has to do with the substantive difficulties. And we do not have to try them, these difficulties, to the defects of the hearers. It has to do with the things you have in mind only with a view to the fact that, from Aristotle's ultimate point of view, the contemplative life is a happy life. And therefore, the questions as they arise on the level of moral virtue are not the final form in which the question of happiness poses itself to men. But it poses itself on the level of moral virtue to most men, and therefore it is very important to understand that, and especially politically. Yes? Is it reasonable to understand the relationship between virtue and true happiness in Aristotle as somewhat of a platonic relationship between, a platonic participation? Is it reasonable to understand it that way? You mean that the merely moral man, the perfect gentleman, uh, participates in the true happiness to some extent? Yes, that is all right. Now, can we understand it also on, on this way, on a slightly higher plane, that, the, 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 uh, that happiness being the supreme good, virtues being good, there is a relationship between the individual good and the, I won't say the idea of the good, but something like that, in much the same way that there is in Plato. In other words, does Aristotle really, really come back to this type of relationship? No. No. I mean, the ideas in the Platonic sense are out. There, there is an end of man, and a perfection of man. And this perfection is strictly understood one and the same for all men, although most men are paradoxically debarred from it. Yet all men must be judged in the light of that. I mean, there is, we need the unity of a standard, although we do not need necessarily a unity of the actual goal for all men. There may, be a, there may be a variety of goals, higher and lower, and it may be necessary because of the complications. And there are all kinds of activities which are needed in society, and some require more qualities of the mind and character than others. And that is so. And therefore, to expect the same, to demand, the same standard of excellence from all men is unreasonable. At this platonic end, I was studying here. Now, let us go on. Also, the true statesman seems to be one who has made a special study of goodness, since his aim is to make the citizens good and law-abiding men. As yeah, let, us stop, let us stop here. Uh, but the goodness uh, is a translation of the Greek word arete, which is ordinarily translated by virtue, and some people translate it now by excellence because they want to get rid of the unpleasant in the meanings of virtue. As a witty man has said, virtue, virtues in Latin, from, derived from vir, man, meant originally also by the Greeks, the manliness of men, and has now come to mean the chastity of women only.
-hmm. And that is a very narrow part of virtue. And therefore, people are dissatisfied with the term virtue. And, and so I warn you only that you don't think there is another term when it suddenly speaks of good. Yes. No, well, I think one should, especially if someone is, something is very unpopular for unreasonable reasons, then one should translate very literally and uh, not shirk the unpopularity. Yeah, but he does. He discusses this in the politics somewhere, not here. Perhaps you we take it up when we come to Aristotle's discussion of our virtue. Surely Aristotle does not say virtue is is knowledge or science. Now here at this point, he gives here a further reason why we should study what virtue is. The highest good is the object of the highest art. I mean, the political art. But the true political man wishes to make the citizens good and law-abiding. Now, what has law-abiding to do with good? A law-abiding man is a man who obeys the laws regardless of whether they are good and bad. That is a difficulty of which no one was more aware than Aristotle. But in the best case, what the law-abiding man really is meant to be is to obey good laws. Yes, now I read to you this remark about the desire of the true political man can be illustrated by a passage in Xenophon's Memorabilia, Book 3, Chapter 2. It is too long, it is a very charming chapter, and it's only one page long, so you should read it. I can read to you only the conclusion, the concluding remark. By these considerations on what constitutes the virtue of a good leader, uh, Socrates disregarded everything else and left only this much, that it is the function of the good leader to make happy those whom he leads. Now, Aristotle is very much concerned with happiness, as we have seen, but he does not say, interestingly enough, that it is the task of the true political man to make happy the citizens. He only says it is his task to make them good and obedient to the law. So. The distinction between happiness and virtue is here effective, although not explicitly stated. Happiness and virtue belong together. They are not simply identical, as we have seen before. Now, the next question then we are through. As examples, we have the lawgivers of Crete and Sparta and others, if there have ever been other such. Yes, you are... Amusement is not wholly unjustified. That is quite true. Now, here I read to you a brief remark from the seventh book of the Politics, 1333b5 following. Even the, the Greeks of the present day, even those Greeks of the present day, who are reputed to best governed, and the legislators who gave them their constitutions, do not appear to have framed their government with regard to the best end, or to have given them laws and education with a view to all the virtues, but in a vulgar spirit have fallen back on those which promise to be more useful and profitable. Many modern writers have taken a similar view. They commence the Spartan constitution and praise the legislator for making conquest and war his sole aim, and so on. That implies, and there is our other passage, that the Spartans and Cretans 
of whom he speaks here so highly and their legislators were not such wise legislators as they seem to be here. Uh, this difficulty was, of course, observed by the professional commentators, but they have a simple way out. This was written by Aristotle at a different time. That is invariable. And then they figure out when did he write the first book of the ethics and when did he write the seventh book of the politics. The book of the Anna Jäger on Aristotle is the most well-known document of this approach. You should perhaps read, if you have not done so before, uh, Ernest Barker's critique of Werner Jäger in the introduction to his translation of Aristotle's politics, where he tries to show on what slippery ground these hypotheses, hypotheses are based. The reason is very simple. Aristotle begins at the beginning. Now, at the beginning, it has to do with this gentleman as this brother gentleman who had pro-Spartan sympathies, as we know from Thucydides and so, you know. And he uh, sees no reason why he should question them. When they are more advanced in their training by Aristotle, he will tell them that Sparta and Crete are very far from being models of political perfection. I think I have to, we have to stop at this point. And next time, uh, we will continue then and begin with the second book.